Let us pray. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The psalmist went on to say, the heavens declared your glory, O God, and the firmament display your engineering works. We give you thanks for placing us humans on this marvelous spaceship called planet Earth. And more so for friends who have left their location on this spaceship to this location, which is arguably one of the most beautiful, called the Caribbean, and in particular, Jamaica. As the universities of Burnham and UTech collaborate on applied engineering, we pray for insight and common understanding that the train of thoughts will gain traction and momentum as we progress together in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wilson. All right, so next up we will be hearing from acting president of the University of Technology, uh, Jamaica, Professor Colin Giles. Um, no, I've known Professor Giles for many years. I'm a son of the soil. Um, I was born in Jamaica, although I currently reside in the UK. Um, and I attended UTEC some 22 years ago. So I'm aging rapidly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, so I'm a former student union president. I, I was in term from 1990 to 2000 and uh, was part of those who were here to witness the university transition to a chartered university back in 2000 with uh, Lord Bill Morris as the first chancellor. So it's uh, quite a pleasure to be here, to be part of this uh, inaugural event. And I have even much more pleasure to invite Professor Colin Giles to welcome you all to this event. Professor Giles. Thank you very much, Dr. Kevin Brown, our able master of ceremonies. And um, as Kevin would have indicated, it was really a pleasant surprise to link up with him again after many years. And I'm very happy for the strides that he has made as a son of the soil. You know, I remember back in, um, late 1990s, we had a very bright student sitting in one of my physics classes by the name of Kevin Brown. <laughs> Could hardly keep up with him. And so I'm not surprised that he's making the major contributions that he's making right now. Kevin, it's a pleasure seeing you again. Honorable Minister Audley Shaw, Minister of Transport and Mining, and representative of Honorable Senator Leslie Campbell, Minister of State, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, Mr. O'Neill Josephs, Head School of Engineering, UTEC Jamaica, visiting delegation from the University of Birmingham, Professor Clive Roberts, Head of School of Engineering, and other members of the team from the University of Birmingham. Members of academic staff and administrative staff. Members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, all. A pleasant good morning to you. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome everyone here today to this very momentous occasion, collaboration between our two universities, the University of Technology Jamaica and the University of Birmingham, which marks a significant moment 
in time in Jamaica's national development. With respect to advancement in modern railway engineering technology, as we were reminiscing not too long ago with members of the Birmingham delegation, it is very significant that Jamaica has been forefront in the development of the use of railway in this region. We have had railway long before many places in the United States. And therefore, it is very fitting that we are continuing to build on the legacy that we have had as pioneers in railway technology and to not be left behind as we seek to strengthen our capacity for the use of railway, which has turned out to be a major um, area of transportation technology being used in developed countries. And so it is quite fitting that as we seek to resuscitate our railway infrastructure, that we are partnering with arguably the best in the world, University of Birmingham, that has one of the largest contingents of research experts in the field of railway technology. And so we are very happy to be partnering in this way. And I believe it can only be a win-win arrangement, not only for both our institutions, but for Jamaica as well. As noted by our chairman, this symposium on railway technology stems from a partnership which has been forged with the University of Birmingham for technical cooperation on railway habilitation efforts in Jamaica. The broad scope of this collaboration has been outlined in a memorandum of understanding that will be signed later on in the program between both our institutions. UTEC Jamaica is pleased to be combining our expertise with railway engineering experts from the University of Birmingham. And UTEC Jamaica being the first national multidisciplinary university established first as the Jamaica Institute of Technology back in 1958, as we were preparing for independence, we have sought to prepare persons to fill the various needs for development in our society. And that's what we have been doing over the years. And so it is quite noteworthy that we have had remarkable success in this and have not only contributed to development in Jamaica, but further afield. And um, our eminent graduate, um, Dr. Kevin Brown, is one example of that. Because we have our graduates all over the world contributing, contributing to development. And so it's, this is in keeping with our motto to enhance development, not only in Jamaica, but within the wider Caribbean and further afield. And so, Against this tradition and background, we are excited about the scope of this partnership to provide innovation and sustainable solutions to Jamaica's thrust for railway technology development. Minister Shaw, we note your recent statements that the restoration of Jamaica's railway service will be one of the milestone projects undertaken by the government of Jamaica in recognition of the nation's 60th independence celebrations this year with plans for the railway system from Montego Bay to Kingston, which has been out of service since 1992. UTEC Jamaica is happy to be making a contribution to these railway restoration efforts in Jamaica through the partnership with the University of Birmingham. And this collaboration is in perfect alignment with our mission, which is to positively impact Jamaica and the wider Caribbean through high quality learning opportunities, research, and value-added solutions to government, industry, 
and communities. This partnership augurs well for providing hands-on practical learning experiences for our students who are engaged in all the disciplines of engineering and the built environment offered here at the University of Technology, Jamaica. It is an integral part of our training program to provide practical experience to our students. And this is one of the reasons why we are known for producing graduates who are work ready. Because a significant part of our training efforts is to expose our students to industry experiences so that when they graduate from here, they are not novices when they go into the workplace, but they are able to hit the ground running. And so our students will have the benefit of being able to learn and gain experience in railway technology from our partners from the University of Birmingham. I'm pleased also to note that equally exciting this week as part of our collaboration with the University of Birmingham is the arrival in Jamaica of the Birmingham 2022 Queen's Baton Relay, of which the University of Birmingham is an official partner. As the home of world-class athletes and forerunners in sports, UTEC Jamaica is pleased to be among the institutions and iconic parties that will receive the baton as it makes a strategic relay stop here on Saturday, April 16. In fact, I recall back in 2012, ahead of the monumental 2012 Olympics in London, we partnered with the University of Birmingham to host the Jamaican athletic team of which many of the persons who represented Jamaica on that team were here from UTEC, UTEC students. And we continue to take note of the fact that for a small institution, UTEC Jamaica has produced more world-beating athletes than many countries in the world. <laughs> And this has augured well for Jamaica, and we continue to make that contribution to national development. Let me take this opportunity to commend all persons drawn from academic and administrative leadership, led by Mr. O'Neill Josephs, head School of Engineering, and Mr. Paulton Gordon, Director of Community Services, and others across the university who have been actively engaged in pulling this productive partnership together with stakeholders at the University of Birmingham. I look forward to the advancement of this win-win partnership between our two universities over the long term with stakeholders in government and related agencies to enhance modern railway technology in Jamaica. I'm confident that this collaboration will serve to strengthen our respective missions. And in closing, I want to again warmly welcome all delegates and participants drawn from Jamaica and from the UK. I extend my best wishes for an enlightening and enjoyable symposium over the next two days. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Thank you, Professor Giles, um, for your welcome and remarks. I want to just uh, acknowledge that we've been joined by Honorable Senator Leslie Campbell, um, he arrived just in time because he will speak before Minister Audley Shaw just to follow protocol. Now, the, Senator Leslie Campbell is the Minister of State in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. He is responsible for the diaspora. So he's, he, I call him my minister because I am one of the millions who reside outside of the UK. Um, I sit on what's called the Global Jamaica Diaspora Council, which is chaired by Minister Campbell, and I lead on that council the Partnerships Working Group. And so this initiative is one of our flagship projects, and so it's uh, important that uh, Minister Leslie Campbell comes and also shares his remarks, because as many of you know, the diaspora, Jamaicans who live overseas, have and continue to support Jamaica in various ways, economically, socially, and otherwise. 
And so I'm, part, I'm pleased to be part of this project, and I'm happy to welcome Senator Leslie Campbell to the podium. I was arguing with him about money, <laughs> about funding for his institution, <laughs> uh, the PAAC. So um, I, I don't know if I made a good impression or otherwise. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> in fact, the, the uh, professor, they, they, they were caught earlier this morning. <laughs> a pair of scissors made away. Um, <clears throat> Honorable Lord Leshaw, uh, Minister of Transport and Mining, Professor Clive Roberts and um, Professor Giles, Dr. Marcelo Blumenfield, and I sincerely hope I got that right, um, Assistant Professor and Dr. Robin Coombs, Research Fellow, and uh, my diasporan, um, Dr. Kevin Brown, ladies and gentlemen, morning. Uh, it is my pleasure to join you this morning at this international symposium on railway engineering. And um, uh, when I spoke with uh, Dr. Kevin Brown last time, he, and I said, well, you come here to talk about um, engineering and railway engineering. Um, do you know um, David Waboso? Oh, yes. I know that. <laughs> I've heard of him. I said, well, you know, uh, when I go to the UK, you know where I stay. I stay at David's house. So he said, well, you know, we, we need to, uh, you make, make me a proper diasporan by linking me up with, with David Waboso. And I have, uh, I called David and he, uh, he's quite willing to, um, to engage in, in that regard. Um, <clears throat> it is my pleasure to join you this morning at this, uh, representing a partnership between the University of Technology and the University of Birmingham. I'm aware of the long-standing relationship between the University of Birmingham and universities here, and I'm pleased to witness firsthand the collaboration on this project. We believe that this relationship has been sustained and has been allowed to flourish by the significant number of students and staff of Jamaican heritage at the University of Birmingham. In fact, I should take this opportunity to thank the University of Birmingham for starting the first course in Patois in the United Kingdom. I thought somebody would laugh at me, you know. <laughs> the Brits here should say, you know, it is awfully wrong he got. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, the signing of this memorandum of understanding will solidify the arrangements <clears throat> and formally establish an international collaboration between the two institutions focused on the promotion of rail technology in Jamaica through academic and industrial capacity building and knowledge transfer. Through this memorandum of understanding, a new Jamaica Center of Rail Innovation will be founded to facilitate new training and research programs on a range of railway topics. I commend both universities for recognizing the intrinsic value of Jamaica's railway infrastructure to Jamaica's national development. This is clearly a project with multiple stakeholders playing critical roles <clears throat> for the successful implementation of this initiative and I would like to extend my hearty congratulations to Professor Clive Roberts, Head of School of Engineering, Dr. Marcella Blumfield, Assistant Professor, Dr. Robin Coombs, Research Fellow, and Dr. Kevin Brown, Team Lead, Global Jamaica Diaspora Council, for their role in advancing the development and the elaboration of this project. The Government of Jamaica has taken critical steps and implemented structures to further, for further engagement between the diaspora and Jamaica. The Global Jamaica Diaspora Council is one of those structures, and I'm pleased to see them in the midst of this activity. We welcome this activity, which exemplifies what we can achieve through partnership, and would like to congratulate the participants for this inspired example of public-private partnership, involving, as it does, the Jamaican private sector, members of academia, members of the diaspora, the Jamaican public, and ministries, departments, and agencies. 
This is indeed an opportune time to mention the hybrid staging of the Jamaica 60 Diaspora Conference, which will be staged uh, between the 14th and the 16th of June this year at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade under the theme Reigniting a Nation for Greatness, which is the product of partnerships. The conference will provide an ideal opportunity to further this type of dialogue among participants and perhaps forge new ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, it is evident to me that the diaspora and friends of Jamaica can play a significant role in advancing some of Jamaica's most critical infrastructure development. And I use this opportunity to thank this group for their collaboration on what is clearly a project of national significance. May God bless you all. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Leslie Campbell, Minister of State and the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, responsible for the diaspora. Thank you for your greetings and remarks. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's now time to hear from the Manayad, the Honorable Audley Shaw, Minister of Transport and Mining. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And despite your absence from Jamaica for a while, you, you still know my real name. Huh? <laughs> um, let me start by acknowledging not just our chairman, but of course the, the principal of this esteemed uh, university. And of course our visitors from overseas, led by Professor, is it Chin? Roberts. Um, from the University of Birmingham and his colleagues and uh, my colleague minister. Um, we don't have to mention the state part, right? <laughs> <laughs> but a distinguished attorney in his own right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the UTEC fraternity, members of the media, Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This is, for me, a very exciting opportunity because, you know, I, I'm not, I haven't reached the age of my good friend, former minister, member of parliament, Mike Henry, who is still in the house at 85 years old. I haven't reached his level of seniority yet, but I'm well on my way because this year I'll be 70 years old, this year. And, um, <laughs> and uh, the Prime Minister in January decided to give me this new and obviously very, very challenging portfolio. After he gave me four and two, six years as Minister of Finance and the Public Service, another five years in charge of industry, investment, commerce, agriculture, fisheries, what's that, seven subjects? And, and now transport and mining, nine subjects. <laughs> and um, so it is a real pleasure to be here because the railway service is one of the things that I have on 
my target list. The Jamaica Railway Service, which was established in Jamaica when, when is it? Um, 1845, right? And used to be used, of course, in the sugar cane industry. And then the bauxite people came along and they were using it as well. And they are still using it. And um, I find it a terrible disappointment that in an industry that is growing internationally, technology, the movement of people, the efficient movement of people, and the movement of cargo. And for 30 years, for 30 years, we have seen this industry close down the railway service. And I consider that, having been one of the first countries in the Western Hemisphere to have a railway service, to have it closed down for the past 30 years, well, you know, it's unacceptable. And God works in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. The Prime Minister has put me in this portfolio. And I'm going to tell Jamaica that we are going to restore the railway service in Jamaica. <laughs> I was born in Manchester. And my twin sister and I, yes, I'm, I'm a twin. Fortunately for my sister, we are not identical. <laughs> but my twin sister and I used to go down to the railway station with our mother at Kendall in Manchester. And we would take the train to Montego Bay. And we would spend the weekend at a convention, yes, a church convention, worshiping the Lord for the weekend, get back on the train, back to Kendall, and drive back up to Christiana. Wow. Wow. And 30 years now, we have seen the closure of the railway service in Jamaica. This is unacceptable. So let me go to the script now. <laughs> but I have to say, you know, that um, I've said to our chairman of this event today that it's really good, and we want to thank you for being a catalyst. You are a student at this university. You are now an eminent uh, worker and citizen of the United Kingdom. And you are now a part of this uh, a catalyst in bringing these distinguished uh, persons from the University of Birmingham and to look at the railway service. And you're looking at a, a, a preliminary project of restoring uh, a line in the corporate area on, for, for, for um, tourism and other purposes. And I want to let you also know that we are looking also at establishing a tourism line from Montego Bay to uh, Appleton Estates, right? We'll start, the first phase will start 
at Montpelier until we get access again to the area from Montpelier to Montego Bay because right now it is, there are squatters on it and lots of problems. But if we start, we will finish. And I really, I really want to thank you for your involvement and, and for this initiative this morning because you have come at a time when the revitalization of our railway is very, a, a very vital part of the improvement of our transportation system. The search for cost-effective air and land transport is on the rise. And at my ministry, we are in the process of looking at, for instance, um, electric and uh, biodiesel buses for public transport as a pilot project to ascertain these benefits. This naturally brings focus into the importance of a well-functioning railway market because in order for a country to maximize on productivity and economic activity, people and goods must be able to move in a, an affordable way. The different modes of transport show that necessity is a forceful driver for innovation and efficiency. The impact of the re-implementation of the railway service is a multi-sectoral, multi-dimensional need that will not only solve the problem of vehicular congestion, particularly in the more urban areas, it will also provide an economic inflow boosting the tourism product of the country. Can you imagine an asset like the railway system that we have had for so long and to watch that asset close for 30 years while it is, it is expanding globally in technology and otherwise, unacceptable, unacceptable. Our first operation began in 1845 under the Jamaica Railway Company, which was a private entity. Hmm, we might very well have to get back to a private entity to get it going again. After decades of changing hands between private and the public enterprise, the government became the sole proprietor in 1900. Initially used to transport goods and people, and of course, as I said, the sugarcane industry, the sugarcane, the discovery of the numerous bauxite deposits brought forth a need to transport bauxite extract from mines to plants as well. And discontinued in 1992, except for the use of bauxite companies, everything else has been discontinued. So what we have done, is we have started now this year, we have implemented from the former minister, Robert Montague, the commuter rail service operated by the JRC on two segments in St. Catherine, from Old Harbor and Spanish Town, we are transporting students who are on the PATH program. But now we want to expand that to other students who want to travel. And we want to expand it to parents who want to travel as well with their students. And that is just the beginning. As I said, the next phase is Montego Bay to Appleton. And I'm pleased to embrace your initiative, that your initiative will be part not only of that little two-mile section from downtown Kingston, but because of your knowledge and your technology, you are going to be able to assist us to restore the railway system 
Island Wide. ¿Ok? And people are worried about how this will be financed. I'm impressed at the fact that you already have the, the financing arrangements, in fact. And, I, and I, I just want to add one little one. That in order for us to, to maybe widen the project, to, to include Portmore and St. Catherine, which is highly populated, I just want to share with you um, a, a little secret that we have a bridge that needs to be repaired. So we <laughs> and we, need, we need to look at the technology that we need in order to repair that bridge that connects uh, St. Andrew, or you know, Kingston St. Andrew to St. Catherine. And that bridge has come under some stress. So to get the trains moving across that bridge, we got to fix that bridge, among other things. But it's such an absolute privilege. I have given my commitment as Minister of Transport and Mining that the rail service in Jamaica will remain a priority. And I, along with other stakeholders and my team at the Ministry and the Jamaica Railway Corporation, will work tirelessly to ensure the revival of the service is actualized. It will be by no means an easy feat, but as one great Jamaican once said, if she's amazing, she won't be easy. If she's easy, she won't be amazing. If she's worth it, you won't give up. If you give up, you're not worthy. And we're talking about the railway now, by the way. <laughs> I don't want to get into trouble. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a man to give up. So the reality is, major infrastructural work is, is needed island-wide in order to have the tracks repaired, in some instances replaced. There is the issue of relocating informal settlements, among others. But if we take it one leg at a time, one track at a time, it is achievable. The symposium and your part here is part of that restoration plan. The symposium that follows this opening ceremony will give rise to some interesting and worthwhile discussions which will surely be to the benefit of the industry. I'm excited at the prospects and I'm open to discussion from anyone who is interested in making this a reality. My most recent meeting with Dr. Brown and Mr. Neil Howard has certainly added to my determination that this can be done and must be done. We, are, we, are, we have a lot of work to do, but we are absolutely up to the task and stand ready at the discussion table to achieve this mutual goal. Ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to hearing of some of the outcomes, partnerships, and developments that will follow. It is indeed an exciting time to lead the transport ministry as we venture into a new era. And one of the things is the restoration of our railway service, not to where it was, but to higher levels of technology, to greater usage, even in the corporate area. It was our government of the Jamaica Labor Party in order to save the city of Kingston and St. Andrew that we created gullies throughout the city, concrete gullies to guide the water and save the city. Wow, and now every gully we see is a potential rail track above the gully. Think about that one. As I say, have a good day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much.
Okay. Well, thank you, Minister Audley Shaw. Um, a wide-ranging speech, um, but certainly a firm commitment from our minister that real, real, real in Jamaica will return. And um, a minister, that's a very firm commitment that we're going to hold you to. Um, I can see, I'm looking at the railway men and women inside here, and all, I can see some of them are smiling. <laughs> I, won't, I won't call any names, but I can see that there is some level of excitement, Minister, around your commitment. Um, you have a, a track record of delivering, Minister. This is probably going to be a big task, but you have broad shoulders and a wealth of experience to deliver it. So we want to thank you, Minister, for being here today. We really appreciate your presence and your support, and we look forward to working with you in the coming months and years. Um, Minister, we're, we're going to have the signing of the MOU, um, which we, we would appreciate you being here to witness, and then we will release you to your, your other government activities. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding between the University of Birmingham and the University of Technology, Jamaica. Um, that will be followed by further speeches and remarks but to allow the minister to, to leave, we're going to have the signing now. So I'd like to invite acting president of the University of Technology Jamaica, Professor Colin Giles, and Professor Clive Roberts to our signing table. Um, Professor Clive Roberts is head of school of engineering at Birmingham University. If we could invite Minister Shaw to stand and behind to witness the signing. Um, Minister, I know you're 70 years younger, so um, we'll invite you just to stand. Uh, okay. All right, so um, I don't know who signs first. Um, both of them sign together? Okay, so I'm told. If, if uh, members of the, are you guys, media, are you ready? We're good? Okay. Professors? Members of the media, are you, are you good? You want him to start? Okay. Oh. Oh, you, okay. Yes, sorry. All right, so we, we'll have the minister and the professors, and then I'll ask um, Mr. Josephs and Mr. Fulton and other members of the delegation to join in. Afterwards. <laughs> oh, you want a minister to hold it? Yes. Minister, they're saying that they want you to hold. Uh, yes, there you go. Okay, we're going to have another photo opportunity. Once you guys are happy, are you? Are we happy? Okay, so can I invite um, Mr. O'Neill Josephs, Mr. Fulton, um, Senator Leslie Campbell to have a, and all the delegates, um, Dr. Coombs, Dr. Blumenfield, for a, a wider, <laughs> um, if we can squeeze, maybe we might have to, O'Neill might have to push, squeeze down a bit. Minister, I okay, guess you're on this. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Are you leaving now, Minister? Take time. Take time. From Honorable Minister Shaw, that railway will return. 
He's also acknowledged that this agreement between the University of Birmingham and the University of Technology will facilitate his vision of the return of rail. So thank you all for being here. And, uh, and now we're going to get into further remarks. Um, you'll be hearing from me first up to speak about the wider social intervention community rail project. And then I will be inviting Mr. O'Neill Josephs, head of school of engineering, to also share his remarks on the MOU. That will be followed by um, a keynote speech by Professor Clive Roberts. And I'm really looking forward to that speech where he'll be talking around the topic of engineering, research, and innovation. So um, I hope you will stay with us. There'll be a coffee break straight after, followed by further speeches within the plenary session. And then we will have a lunch break. And you're all invited to lunch, right? Um, so that's going to be courtesy of um, the universities. I think, uh, acting president, you, you have to leave. So we wanted to thank Professor Giles for being with us uh, today, Professor. Thank you. And a small token from the University of Birmingham. OK. So I will, so let's get into it. Um, so I'll, I'll start. So if I could have my slides up. OK. So ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to give you a brief overview, very brief introduction to what we're calling the community rail, sorry, social intervention and community rail project. Um, this project underpins what you've just witnessed here today, uh, being a wider railway project that seeks to introduce or rehabilitate a section of the current railway network. Um, and so this relationship that we now have forged between the University of Birmingham and UTEC will be integral to that relationship um, and, the, and bringing this project to life. So the Jamaica Social Intervention and Community Rail Project, or the Culture Yard Line, is the brainchild of a British gentleman called Neil Howard. Neil has been a railway man in Britain for 44 years. And he's now retired. And in his retirement, he's decided that his goal while in his remaining days on this planet will be to help Jamaica rehabilitate its railway services. As you can see from the slide, Neil has vast experience in railway, um, having worked in multiple positions in uh, training engineering, in train engineering, sorry, the, the metro, the intercity operations. Um, he's also worked in various countries, including the Netherlands, Germany, Hungary, and so on. So Neil has been, this has been Neil's um, baby for the last 10 years. And I've just been fortunate to join him on this journey in my role on the Global Jamaica Diaspora Council. So my, my involvement is because of my uh, role, my membership on the Global Jamaica Diaspora Council. I lead the partnership working group where our remit is to develop partnerships between stakeholders and Jamaica. Um, so this project certainly fits within the scope of what we do and is one of our flagship projects. But as mentioned before, I'm a son of the soil, but I've lived in the UK for the past 22 years. I'm a graduate of UTEC a proud graduate, a former student union president. And so it brings me great joy to be part of this initiative where UTEC is at the forefront of what we're trying to achieve here. When I left the University of Technology, I moved to the UK where I pursued further studies in mechanical engineering um, at the University of Nottingham, um, where I gained a master's and a PhD. Um, in mechanical engineering. So my actual day job is in aerospace engineering, where I'm a program manager at Rolls-Royce. But, um, but I have worked as a research fellow 
um, doing research. Um, and in, in that time, I, we, we also did some railway projects as well. So um, it, it really is a passion of mine to give back to Jamaica. And I'm glad that I'm able to do so in partnership with uh, my good friend, O'Neill Josephs, who you'll hear from next. He's the head of school for engineering at UTEC. And he also worked briefly at Rolls-Royce as well during his studies. Um, so the development of this project is going to be done through what we're calling the Friends of the Jamaica National Railway, or FJNR. Currently, we're just a loose bunch of people working on the steering committee led by Neil Howard, who I introduced earlier. And um, this steering committee is doing all the planning and onboarding of sponsors and partners over the next 12 months uh, with the ambition of launching a culture line railway um, next year. And I'll tell you more about the culture line in a minute. The objective of the group is to become more formal, become a, a, form, a, a official charity, and to continue to support restoration of railway activities in Jamaica. We also want to support and promote research and educational um, activities, including the development of museums and other educational outlets. As I said before, I sit on the Global Jamaica Diaspora Council. The council um, has representatives of Jamaicans living overseas from across the globe. I represent the north of the United Kingdom. And on the council, we have um, five working groups, and I lead the partnership working group. I just realized my slides. All right. So the partnership working group covers a quite a large remit. I'm, I'm not sure the Ministry of um, Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade realized how large a remit they've given the partnership group, um, but we are somehow trying to tackle it. So we actually have three flagship projects on, um, ongoing at the moment, the railway project being one, but we also have a Birthright Jamaica project which seeks to reconnect young diasporans to the country, and we're also involved in a diaspora engagement platform, a digital online platform. The members of the group are shown on this slide, and they're from all over the world. Um, Bishop Ransford Jones, for example, is from Canada. Um, we have Dr. Nicolene Johnson, who is, lives in China. These are all Jamaicans. So Dr. Nicolene speaks fluent Mandarin, and has been and continues to live in China, and they make up the partnership working group. And we also have strategic partners in the form of Integrated Diaspora Services, and our IT advisor is Mr. Jason Scott, who actually lives here in Jamaica. We have secretariat support from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs through Mr. Lloyd Wilkes, who is the director for Diaspora Affairs. You heard about the history of the, you heard, you heard about the history of the railway, so I won't repeat uh, the history, but just to highlight that we hope to be part of the, the uh, milestones in the future in 2023, hopefully we'll be saying, not hopefully, we will be speaking of the introduction of a, of a community rail in downtown Kingston. Um, the network of the railway is quite vast, but most of it is not functioning at the moment. And you will be hearing from um, experts in the field, um, Mr. Tony Allen and others, they will tell you more about the railway um, today after the opening ceremony. But suffice to say that the current infrastructure is dilapidated and derelict in parts. And um, there is a challenge that minister has set himself to restore <laughs> this network. It's not going to be easy, but it can be done. Of course, the minister spoke of um, activities around the school train. The Bauxite train still runs. And there's a rum line from Montego Bay to Appleton that is also um, on, the, on the agenda of the ministry. So the, what is the this social intervention community rail project that I speak about? Well, it aims to develop or rehabilitate the train infrastructure between the Kingston terminus and Culture Yard in Trenchtown. So less than about two miles of railway we will be rehabilitating the, rail, the, the station itself, repurposing it, and I'll, I'll tell you what we'll be doing in a minute with that. 
we will be restoring the line and also the rolling stock, the trains. And then when you get to Culture Yard, we'll have to build a, tra uh, a train station there so that passengers can come off um, the train and enter that station. Um, so, so there's a lot that's going to be happening regarding the Culture Yard um, line. Um, so just to go into a bit more detail, so this is a schematic of what the line currently looks like. And um, as I said, we will start from the Kingston Terminus, and we will, we will work our way towards um, Culture Yard. Now, some of you would have seen pictures of um, the Duke and Duchess at Culture Yard. So Culture Yard is a well-established um, tourism um, attraction. And what we want to do is to add the train. So the train is going to enhance Culture Yard by being part of uh, the, the tourism ecosystem in that region. And if we can do that, then we, we hope to see a lot of economic and social development within that, that, that locale. So let me just take you through some of the developments. The first thing I want to highlight is that the Kingston um, train terminus is, is a historic and beautiful building on the outside. But inside, it needs a bit of love and tender care. And we will be restoring inside the building. It's quite a long building, as you can see, and we will be breaking it up into sections, working closely with the Jamaica Railway Corporation to introduce, firstly, a brand new museum. So you can go and visit the museum and learn about this rich, rich rail history. We'll also be uh, introducing a section for the Classic Car um, Association to display their cars. We spoke to Minister Shaw about also having a section to display Jamaican artwork and also introduce shops, so craft shops and so on. So when visitors come, they'll be able to purchase food, but also purchase um, uh, paraphernalia as well. Um, so, so there's quite a lot of plans for this, this, this hub. And when it's all finished, it should be a buzz of business activity. You know, that's the whole idea uh, there. Of course, once, once we restored the train station, we then of, you know, restored the trains and the railway so that once you've visited and had your tour of the museum and new attractions in the Kingston Terminus, you then take the train and go and visit Culture Yard. And of, col of course, Culture Yard has ma been made all the more famous because Kate and William <laughs> insisted that they had to visit Culture Yard. So Culture Yard is already established. It's there, and we will partner with them so that the whole thing works quite seamless in terms of visitors taking the train to visit Culture Yard. So what are the time scales? Well, at the moment, we are, as I said, working with several partners, many partners, to plan this uh, undertaking. It's a big job. And of course, you know, we will have to not only um, bring partners on board, but we'll also have to find the finance required. So we're onboarding sponsors and partners and then 2023 you now is going to be a big year for us where we will start to work on having accommodation for the many volunteers that we expect to travel from the UK to support the rebuilding of the line, but also start refurbishment work after uh, around July, September, that time, leading into you know, months and months of activities uh, where we aim to commission the Culture Yard line by November 2023. So these are our current targets, and we are driving towards them. Of course, we are here today because this uh, signing ceremony and symposium is the first leg of the work that we are aiming to achieve with the culture, culture yard line. Because we, we, the, minister cannot, the minister cannot rehabilitate the railway in Jamaica and not have trained engineers, and trained railway operators and you know, all the other resource, human resource that you need to have an efficient and, and effective rail line. So one of the outcomes from this uh, MOU is the opportunity to, to introduce new training courses um, and lean heavily on the University of Birmingham so that we can train the next generation of railway um, human resource 
for this country. So, partners, we have many who have already pledged their support. Um, several of our partners are based overseas in the United Kingdom, and we also have partners here on the ground in Jamaica. So these partners and sponsors are going to help us to bring this project to life. But of course, we welcome more support. And this project will need you know, um, volunteers. The project will need railway engineers. We will need project managers. We will need civil, manage, civil engineers, painters and decorators, masons, uh, mechanics. And all are welcome. So anyone here who feels that they want to be a part of railway history, uh, we are looking for volunteers to, to support this project. And uh, you can certainly, I'll be here for the next two days. Please come and speak to me. And you know, I'll be, we'll, ha we'll be happy to, to take your details in terms of how you can get involved. So please note down my email address or Neil's email address, uh, but I'm around to take questions if anyone wants to learn more. So ladies and gentlemen, I just want to end by once again thanking you for attending today's event and, and I look forward to your participation over the next two days. But today is just the beginning and as I said, the project is open to anyone and everyone, whatever skill sets you want to bring to the project to make this a reality is welcome and, uh, and so please come and get, and get in touch with me. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so I should quickly say that if anyone has any questions, we have two microphones. Um, there's one just there. Um, I think it's the fourth, fifth row up. And it's a walk-up microphone. So if anyone has any questions, uh, they, they can ask after each speaker. So if anyone has any questions for me, they can take the microphone. Um, if not, yes, the, it's just there. Hi, morning. I'm not sure if I missed the slide, but did you actually show a slide showing the route, the proposed route? Um, if, if I can not have back my slides. Run, we're talking. Oh, yes. Yes, the pro okay. so, the, so the proposed route, while I'm waiting for my slides, is going to be from the Kingston train terminus to um, Trenchtown. Um, I'm trying to remember which. Sorry? That's the destination. That's the destination, yes. There it is. Right. So, so we start at Kingston Terminus. We, we go past the, the Maypen Cemetery. Um, and then we end up at Culture Yard. Um, I can't remember what street um, that exactly that is on. Yes, that's what you wanted to see. OK. Yes, no problem. Any more questions? Yes. If, if, you, if you're happy to say your name and organization, that'd be great. All right, good morning, Michael McFarlane. Um, I just have a question. It was mentioned sometime, I believe last week, that the government was trying to use the same section to have a, I think it was from Kingston to Three Mile commuter rail. I want to know if this is going to be tied into that project or is it something completely separate? Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so it's going to be completely separate. Um, so whatever the government is planning, this will complement it and operate separately. So this will be a, a, a sort of standalone um, cultural tourism railway line between Kingston Terminus and Trenchtown. But it, as the government introduces more railway um, in that section of the line, of course, we will have to work with JRC in terms of scheduling but, but it's a, this is a standalone separate project. Any more questions? All right, if there aren't any more questions, I'm around and you know, just walk up to me um, during the break and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Now, um, thank, thank you, I'm finished with my slides. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to now introduce the head of school for engineering Mr. O'Neill Joseph, uh, who will give his remarks on the momentous MOU signing that we witnessed today. 
Um, O'Neill is the is a senior lecturer and former director of the Industrial Engineering Department of the University of Technology, uh, where he has been teaching for over 10 years. Um, he also heads the department's lead enterprise research group and has, been resp has responsibility for providing third party support to industry. Um, O'Neill pursued his master's in manufacturing systems um, at the University of Nottingham and also worked at Rolls Royce as well in their manufacturing facilities there. So it gives me much pleasure to invite O'Neill Josephs to the floor. Thank you, Dr. Kevin Brown, my very good friend. When my, I went to the University of Nottingham in 2006, and I spent about three days without eating because I didn't like the food. And um, it was not until we met Kevin and his Jamaican friends at the University of Nottingham, I was able to identify a Jamaican restaurant close by, and I began to eat. I still maintain that ID card that I had just to look at the amount of weight I lost during my first days of being in the UK. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Brown, for having me here. I had my greeting set out in order for the ministers, but all protocols observed, I just want to acknowledge the presence of our delegation from the University of Birmingham, our guest speakers who are here today, um, Mr. Fitzroy Williams, and the team from Naranda Bauxite. We also have the team from GRC. Uh, we have students, we have staff, we have um, representation from the University of the West Indies, from CMU. Um, we also, do we have any other university or technical institution here today? Right, so those, so univ if you're here from the University of the West Indies, just put your hand up. Good. From CMU, great. Um, anybody else? Great, all right, good. So thank you for being here today. The School of Engineering has been positively impacting the country and the region for over 60 years um, through applied research and the production of highly skilled graduates. Our reach and depth could not be simplified in quantitative measures. Uh, we have churned out engineers, engineering graduates for the military, for the banks, manufacturing companies, construction industry, hospitals, and certainly players in the transportation industry to include now, in fact, the persons that are gonna be speaking here from um, uh, Naranda Bauxite are graduates of the University of Technology and one of the individuals is a real superintendent. So we certainly have also impacted the real industry. A significant number of our graduates remain local but many relocate to countries in the region and others have performed exceptionally well internationally. One such engineer is standing right, well, sitting right beside me, and he is an inspiration um, for why we are here today. It is a story that we should celebrate, and we're happy to have his company. The school currently offers five degree programs, civil, industrial, chemical, electrical, and mechanical engineering, and two technical programs, electrical engineering diploma and, and um, mechanical engineering diploma. All these programs over the years have enjoyed programmatic accreditation in one form or another to include accreditation from the University Council of Jamaica and the Institute of Engineering Technology, IET. Today we enjoy institutional accreditation from the UCJ. We have made significant contribution in research. The School of Engineering was a principal investigator and that principal investigator was the person who did the prior um, today, Dr. Earl Wilson. He, we were a principal investigator in one of the largest European funded projects in the region which sought to promote capacity in energy education development in the Caribbean. We've also been 
significant, made significant contribution in the area of surface engineering and tribology. While these are commendable achievements, it is generally felt that over the years, and this is important, leadership at all levels of our society has largely ignored the need to build technical capacity within institutions, particularly in the area of engineering. This is in the context of um, where the link between engineering and development has seen, has been long proven and documented. In other words, it, is, it has been established that engineering, manufacturing, the value added industry is at the heart of development and economic growth. There's a broad need to provide capacity strengthening in terms of knowledge and technology transfer, but also in the provision of hardware and software needs. One can imagine why in a country that is, treacher that is on a treacherous road to development, one is bedeviled by resource constraints with many social issues competing for scarce resources. Not to mention the fact that engineering in particular is resource intensive. The School of Engineering has not just sat by, even though we are extremely beset by these constraints, but we have been able to tap into other means, such as the, this innovative partnership with government and the partners from the University of, bon, of, of Birmingham. Today's signing of an MOU between the two universities is an example of innovation and while it does not negate the need for leadership and in capacity building for technical engineering resources across the country, it shows that we are not passive when it comes to development in our country. So we are clear that we are, we, we are, you know, we experience severe resource constraints in our country. And it is evident that by virtue of the lack of serious investment in technical engineering capacity that institutions such as UTEC and others who are in this field may have suffered a bit. But we have, over the years, maintained our posture. We have been able to secure funding. We have been able to secure resources. We have been able to secure partnerships. And we continue to churn out engineers to impact Jamaica, the, the region, and the rest of the world. The school would like to recognize the University of Birmingham, primarily the School of Engineering, who have demonstrated the real value of partnership. Today is considered historic as the partnership seeks to push the levers of creativity and innovation in an era of development that can have significant social and economic benefits. And for this, we are grateful. The School of Engineering therefore continues to play its role in support of Jamaica's 2030 vision. And in closing, I just want to say, uh, you know, engineering is one of the passions that I've had for many, many years. And we have, as a country, in, you know, in my estimation, not paid enough attention. But today, we are witnessing a shift, a paradigm shift perhaps, where the technical is now at the, the, the center of this project. And by placing it at the center, we believe that more resource can be channeled in this direction, and we can see further development and, of course, further growth of our country and, and of our people. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown. Thank you very much um, to the team of, 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 of professors and doctors from the University of Birmingham. And thank you for being here today. God bless you. Thank you. Right, so we, so we, that, that, um, thank you, uh, O'Neill. That's on Mr. O'Neill Joseph, um, head of the School of Engineering at the University of Technology. Um, so before I invite um, a response from Birmingham, I would also like to invite a key member of, of this partnership team, Mr. Paulton Gordon. Um, Paulton is uh, the community, is Director for Community Services and Development here at UTEC and has been integral in stitching this partnership together and we've been working quite closely for a number of months now to bring this uh, event to fruition. 
So I'd like to invite him to come and share his remarks as well. Paul Tan is a management professional with over 25 years of leadership experience in both the private and public sector. And he's, a, I guess, the ultimate networker and connector. Um, but he also has a, a keen interest in community development and sports, something that he's very passionate about. So let me welcome Mr. Paul Tan Gordon. Good morning, morning. Um, our friends from University of Birmingham, again, welcome. I, we took a, a nice ride down to GRC, down to the terminus yesterday, and I can see the broad smiles on the faces based on what you saw, <laughs> the, the stock and the potential that is there. So. We want, to, we want to continue to look how best we can position that as part of the, the process. O'Neill and his team, um, certainly Mr. Chairman, a big part of our, our network and team. Um, staff, students, friends of this initiative, welcome all. The Department of Community Service and Development is considered the social responsibility arm um, of the university. The, the university has service as a critical part of its strategic pillar. And as such, the mandate, that mandate is infused in the culture and the veins of the institution. As was mentioned by Kevin, the seed of this initiative was planted about six or seven months ago when I actually responded to a LinkedIn message from Neil Howard. Neil was searching for partnerships, and I saw the message, and he asked if we could have a Zoom chat. I don't think it was Zoom. I think it was Teams. So we chatted and had an informal discussion um, for about half an hour, just looking at the broad uh, potential, looking at what is possible. And subsequent to that, um, he mentioned to us that he has, he's already in touch with um, GRC, and GRC and its members are on board we just need to stitch this together to see how best we can get this activity going. Um, so Neil is based in the UK, as was mentioned, and has already started to expand his circle. His circle of influence, we have had a few broad um, brainstorming sessions to identify partners, to look at who we can include in this um, network. And at some point in time, that included Kevin and the University of Birmingham, which are now key, key partners to this whole process. We also noted the government's thrust to revive the railway network, and we are very supportive of that direction. As we all know, an efficient rail service will positively impact our communities socially, economically, and more certainly, will help to reduce the carbon footprint created by the expansion of other modes of transportation. With the hiatus in rail over the last 30 years, there have been gaps in our knowledge, hence activities such as this symposium, to get us back up to speed. We are therefore grateful to Dr. Roberts and his team from the University of Birmingham for consenting to partner in staging this symposium as we seek to better understand the options and possibilities available to us. Some questions that we need to ask over the next few couple of days. How do we integrate the expansion of the tourism product as part of this um, initiative? What about heritage rail and the museum as part of the portfolio of attractions? How will the support mass transit and reduction of grid, um, gridlock, which leads to greater productivity overall? What are the prospects for social inclusion in those impacted communities? And I see some friends from the SDC here who will be a heavy part of what we do. So we intend to reach out to social agencies such as the SDC, Social Development Commission, Jamaica Social Investment Fund, TPDCO, in terms of that broad partnership. The Department of Community Service and Development stands ready to further integrate the relevant fac faculties 
Um, engineering is already a part of it, and we, and only we need to get built environment in as soon as possible um, to see how best we can pull this one off. So engineering and built environment and create a platform for students to hone their skills as the various partners coalesce around the long overdue efforts to revive the rail industry in Jamaica. I thank you. Thank you. So um, what Paulton um, didn't mention for any students of, of UTEC uh, who are here is that um, as part of your community service, <laughs> you will now have this as an additional activity that you can undertake um, when we seek volunteers to start next year. So, um, so look out for this project as part of your one of your options for community service. I'm sure Paulton will roll that out um, in the coming months. All right, thank, thank you, Paulton. Okay, so you have heard from the government of Jamaica. You have heard from the University of Technology. And so it's time to have a response from our visitors, our partners from the University of Birmingham. And first to speak, um, which will be also a keynote address is Professor Clive Roberts. Professor Clive Roberts has 25 years of experience of working with the rail industry and academia in Britain and also overseas. He leads a broad portfolio of research aimed at improving the performance of rail systems, include, um, and also he leads the UK Railway Research and Innovation Network. Ukraine, Ukraine, which I'm sure he will speak more about as well. This is a 92 million pound academic and industry collaboration. And uh, it's, it, it uh, has multiple tertiary inst institutions involved as well as industrial partners. Over the last decade, he has led a range of projects carried out for organizations such as the European Commission, He's worked with the US Federal Railway Authority, UK Railway Safety and Standards Board, and many more uh, institutions and organizations. He has led the University of Birmingham to win the Queen's Anniversary Prize for Higher Education in 2016 to 2018. Um, so it's a pleasure to have Professor Clive Roberts, someone with vast experience um, to be involved in this partnership, and it gives me much pleasure to invite him to address us, Professor Clive Roberts. Um, thank you, Kevin, for um, such a, a, a welcome, and um, it's, it's lovely um, to hear words from O'Neill and, and Paulton um, echoing the importance of the collaboration today. It's really good to see you in, in person and, and have no risk of being on mute or us losing our connection. Um, I now know you are real people and I know exactly how tall you are and all of those things. So it's just superb to be here um, in, in, in Jamaica. Um, we, as you may have picked up, we, um, the, the delegation from the University of Birmingham, um, we arrived Monday and yesterday and we had the opportunity to see the JRC. And um, as Paulton said, um, we were doubly excited when we got to see the potential of, of what is there. For those of you who may not know so much about railways, you may have seen in some of the pictures um, some derelict old trains. What I see is huge potential um, in terms of um, really changing a key part of, of Kingston, um, um, changing um, how people move around um, and goods move around in, in Jamaica. So um, a, really, a really exciting time, a really exciting opportunity. So um, I've got some slides ready to um, explain a little bit about what we do at the University of Birmingham and why, why we are here. And then I'm going to move on to say a little bit about an introduction to railways, um, really in the first instance to say how they might bring social value 
so moving them from beyond just pure engineering, um, but then um, also talking a little bit about some of the, the technology. And as you'll see in the symposium program, a number of us um, from Birmingham will be talking over the next two days in, in, in more depth. So um, as, as has been said, I, I, I've been working in railways for, for 25 years, and I work um, um, in the UK, um, and, but also internationally, and sit on various boards and, and, and advise various railways around the world. I come from the University of Birmingham, which is where I have worked for the last 25 years. Um, and nowadays, I'm the head of School of Engineering. In the School of Engineering, we have about 2,500 students studying engineering. Um, but there are about 34,000 students um, overall in, in our in, in comprehensive university. Um, we're um, placed in the, in the top 100 in, in, in the world of institutions. I'm always reminded by our vice chancellor, there's about 15,000 institutions in the world. So that's um, something um, we're, we're very proud of. Um, in our railway activity, we are celebrating um, our 50th birthday this year. Um, Marcelo has some 50th birthday badges. He'll be very happy to give out to people. Um, so we've, we've grown um, from when I joined 25 years ago. There was about 12 of us. Um, and um, now there's over 160 um, of us, which makes us the, the largest group of our kind in, 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 in the Western world. Um, in railway alone, we have about 500 students. And, and one of the things that I'm going to be talking about and will be a constant theme of how we talk is that education is incredibly important um, to railway development. Um, the system is, is nothing without the people that can make it happen and then operate and maintain it once it's in, 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 in situ. So um, we are very, very proud of, of not only our research, but also of our education impact. Um, I lead something called the, the UK National College on Advanced Transportation and Infrastructure, um, which is a pre-university, uh, an apprenticeship, a vocational college. You'll hear a bit about that later, um, aimed at um, training people on, um, who work on the railway on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we also have degree level qualifications at the university. And in 2018, I started something called UCRIN, the UK Rail Research and Innovation Network, um, which has a number of international partners who have funded um, between them um, just, just over 64 million pounds of private funds, which is matched with UK government funds to create a, a 92 million pound pot to do research for railways over the next 10 years. Um, we work very much around the world. It's, it's been quiet the last couple of years um, for obvious reasons, um, but you can see um, where we have projects and impacts in many, many places. Um, obviously, in the UK, um, we have significant relationships in Singapore with the Metro there. I'm actually a member of the board of Singapore Metro, but we've now um, educated just over 350 of their engineers. Um, so one in three railway engineers in Singapore owns a University of Birmingham um, railway degree. Um, we do lots of work in China, um, particularly with metros and, and the large manufacturers um, in Japan, Malaysia, and many, many other, other, other countries. And we believe it very important, the work that we do, to work in collaborations with academic institutions like UTEC, but also railways around the world. So, for example, we we're the only university in the world that have a partnership with Indian railways. Um, I've already mentioned Singapore, and also in Dubai, we have a deep partnership um, and do many projects there. So um, that's a little bit about why I'm here as background. What I want to move on to now is a bit more content about, about um, railways and, and really start um, with the question of what, what has the railway ever done for us. And, and to, um, later in the program for the symposium, um, my colleague Robin will talk a bit more about the history of, of, of the railways and, and why they come to being. And perhaps you can think about why um, historically railways have been um, built, and it's coming up to 200 years since the first UK rail service, um, 20 years before yours in, in 1825. I'm part of the National Organising Committee for celebrating the 200th year of rail services. 
in the UK. Um, but they are an interesting form of transport because they have been going now for 200 years. They still provide those benefits um, that they did to, to society um, two centuries ago. In, if we look at Europe at the moment, the largest infrastructure project in, in Europe is the construction of the HS2 line. Um, previous centuries in the, in the, in, in the 20, um, um, uh, in, in between 1900 and 2000, the largest infrastructure project in Europe was a railway project. And the century before that, the largest infrastructure project was a, 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 a railway project as well. So they still are something that is a boom industry. We've been hearing that this morning. It's an area that many countries in the world are building railways and they continue to want to. So why? Why is that? Well, there's a number of reasons. And these are the reasons that perhaps if we'd have been talking to investors in railways 200 years ago, they'd have talked about. They'd been talking about being able for people to travel greater distances for leisure and work. And they'd be able to have city dwellers to receive fresh produce into the city um, for goods to be transported around the, 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 the country um, to generate, regenerate um, cities and towns and allow them to grow, to create skilled jobs and wealth. And um, important, actually, in the UK was to allow people to travel to coastal resorts for holidays. Nowadays, there's perhaps a few more that we would add to the list of things that railways can do. Um, they provide us a low, means, a, a low carbon means of, of travel. Um, they reduce the numbers of cars and trucks on the roads. Um, they regenerate our city areas. Um, and that's exactly what we're talking about um, being a potential here in Jamaica. They provide connections to rural communities. They increase land value and desirability. And they will, despite us moving into a world of autonomous cars and, and whatever, they will continue to provide the backbone of future integrated transport systems. So what I want to do really, just to get you thinking before we start the symposium um, with more technical, deeper presentations, is to perhaps go through each one of those just quickly and talk about some modern examples of where railways are changing the world now, not 200 years ago, but, but now. So um, this first picture is Lausanne in Switzerland. So we're going to go on a whistle-stop tour of the world to look at some railways and how they've changed the railways. So this is Lausanne in Switzerland. Um, it's just a, a really interesting upgraded um, commuter rail program there. Um, you probably know that Switzerland has a particularly um, f focus on public transportation. And over 50% of the people who work in Lausanne arrive to work every morning by, by train um, into the central station. So continuing that move for people um, traveling to work by, by train. This is um, India, um, a modern picture of India and the railways still moving um, fresh goods around in the most timely way that they can. Um, in this case, a train between Bangladesh and India. And actually, one of the interesting projects we're doing at the university is about refrigeration of those goods um, in terms of food security in places like India. Um, nearly a, fifth, uh, ne nearly a, um, a, a, a third of food is actually thrown away because it deteriorates during transportation. Railways can really help with that, both in terms of just moving in a more timely manner, but also the kinds of things we can do with refrigeration on board the trains. Um, industrial goods um, being transported more quickly, and you might recognize this picture. Um, this is here in Jamaica, and actually there's a really good example of the bauxite trains that are moving around the country um, and enabling huge numbers of, of, of trucks to be replaced off, 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 off of the road um, and, and, and move goods in a way that no other um, form of transportation could do so. So this um, is London Docklands. Um, this is, um, you can see in that top picture, um, that, that um, sort of bridge that's across the top of there. This is the east end of London. This is a railway that was built in the 1980s called the Docklands Railway. And that is the same view um, about 35 years later. So this 
was urban development that was planned, a railway was built that would provide places for people to work, and it was understood that that area of London, which had previously been the docks area of London and had stood derelict, would be renovated and rejuvenated by the presence of a railway. And it's quite amazing what has, what has happened um, over that time. And it's very, very well acknowledged. It was very, very, very well established in the plan that the railway was at the heart of that redevelopment. Um, this is around skilled jobs. Um, and actually, um, this picture, I quite like this picture. This is from London Underground. On the right, this is exactly the same engine shed on London Underground 100 years apart with the traditional people conventionally working on railways um, and nowadays it being a computerized instrumentation, data-driven um, activity to look after um, our, our, our metro in, in, in London. And as I said before, the presence of skilled, well-trained jobs both to create the railway but to also look after the railway is incredibly important to do this. And we're back now um, to closer to home here. Um, this is St Kitts, where people are moving around, um, and tourists are moving around um, the island in order to, um, a, 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 as tourists, and creating um, economic development and activity. These are things that drove the railway 200 years ago. They still drive the railway today um, in, in those examples. Now let's have a look at some of the, the newer um, reasons, the, the, the even more reasons that we should be thinking about railways today. So our low carbon means of transportation, you'll perhaps hear a bit about this at some point from me again later, but this is our hydrogen powered train. Um, it probably gives you the first in inkling of the kind of work we do at Birmingham. So this is me and my colleague Stuart Hilmanson at COP26 um, in Glasgow last November. And over the last 10 years, we've been working on retractioning existing rolling stock to be hydrogen powered. And we were incredibly proud that the train that we'd helped create um, was the UK rail sector's um, exhibit at COP26 and actually carried passengers during, during the COP26 um, um, activity in Glasgow. And, and those trains are now becoming um, to um, look as though they're going to start running on mainline railways in the next couple of, couple of years. So hydrogen is not the only solution. Batteries um, are an alternative. There's, there's also other alternatives that provide um, um, decarbonized solutions, but, but there's lots of things that we can do in that, that space. Um, reducing the number of cars and trucks on the road. We talked a little bit about this with the Volkswagen train, but this, this is a railway in Kenya. And actually there's lots of investment in, in um, Africa in general in freight railways. Um, the statistic that I particularly like is that Ethiopia um, has recently redeveloped its railway and managed to remove a third of trucks from its, rail, uh, its roads. And these are um, trucks that were traveling um, very, very long distances across the country, um, significant reduction in the carbon emissions um, in, 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 in that case in Ethiopia. And this is another picture of, of London and an area that only actually opened up around King's Cross Station um, about four or five years ago, where some of the disused buildings around the railway were renovated. Maybe this is what um, Kingston Terminal Station will look like in a, in a few years' time. Um, but um, this is an area that, again, has really changed the city um, and, and is still changing the city. This is not a historical. This is something that's happened in the last few years. And we are doing in the UK the same as you. And um, Robin will talk again about um, how people are reopening railway lines in the UK, either for, for tourist reasons or, in this case, um, which is the Dartmoor line, um, to actually provide people to move um, 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 to, uh, for leisure and for, for work. So the Dartmoor line um, was shut um, around 50 years ago and has been recently reopened. Um, we've got a, a strategy now to do this in the UK on some of our rural lines. And what's really interesting is um, on, on, on the recent projects, all of the reopenings have had um, a projection of numbers of people that we would expect to travel on those trains 
and they've far, far exceeded those numbers, and the, the, the railways are in much more use than, than anyone ever anticipated. And then I've taken the numbers off of this. This is a graph produced by the government in Australia, uh, who are, again, um, they're building railways and spent a lot of time and effort, particularly around uh, Melbourne and Sydney, upgrading railway programmes. But this is um, their graph of, of, of metro um, land value and how it increases with distance from um, a train station. So what it's trying to show is um, at the sort of zero, zero point, of the X and Y crossing is, is the station, and then the distance away in, in miles multiplied by 0 0.8. Um, uh, uh, um, and and, um, and um, that gives you um, the increased value on the Y axis of that land. So you really generate um, um, value um, by putting the rail um, service there. And it's, it's worth saying, it's a, something I say quite often, is if we look at the most profitable railways in the world, I think of Hong Kong Metro, those sorts of places. Um, they are could be considered actually as, as property companies that just happen to run a railway because they make their money out of that property, out of shopping centres, out of the value of the land. And then finally, in, in that sort of new wave of what we're trying to do in railways, um, we want to create integrated transport hubs. Um, this is a really good example, which is Rotterdam in the Netherlands, which has been recently... Um, renovated, but I think I think it's seven different means of transportation you can catch from 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 um, from from this station. But again, um, the railway is at the heart of that. So railways are not a thing of the past, is really what I'm trying to say. They are bringing value, um, both in terms of social value, economic value, um, changing the dynamics of countries still to this day, and many 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 countries around the world are um, continuing to do this. So let me say a little bit about um, what we do at Birmingham. So um, this is our um, new centre, um, our new Ukraine centre on campus at Birmingham. Um, this opened um, in 2020, um, um, November 2020, so during the, the pandemic, um, um, the, the picture here. So I'm just going to, to talk a little bit about some of the work that we do. So you'll see this diagram again um, from me um, later, but I guess it represents here the fact that we work throughout the whole system. So with the design, the build, the operate, maintain of, of railway systems um, and, and everything we do fits in here some, somehow. So what this diagram roughly says is that when we um, are beginning to think about a system and you're beginning to think about an upgrade to the system, we need to work out why we're doing it, what it's for, what benefit it's going to give us. And that starts to give us some requirements, which starts to define the technologies that we might want to use. So I think you're here on the left somewhere, and that's an area that we work in a lot, as you might see in a moment. Then there's down the bottom of the V here, there's lots of people making things, and that's um, companies like Siemens and whoever making components to build the railway. And then what we do on the right-hand side is we integrate all of those things back together um, to make sure they work as a system. And this system point is really important. We can have the best tra trains in the world, but if the tracks are no good, we were talking to uh, the um, minister was earlier talking about a bridge. If the bridge fails, then we don't have a, a service, we don't have a system. So we need to think about how everything works together. So we um, cover all areas of, of railways at Birmingham but particularly provide um, leadership and strat strategic development um, on future railway operations and control, um, on data integration and cybersecurity, smart monitoring and autonomous systems, decarbonisation, how we introduce innovation to railways, and railway education and skills. Now, there's a video here. I'm not sure if I... What happens if I do that? Not a lot. Are you able to start it up the, up the top? Oh, there we go. So this is just an example. In the UK, we're building High Speed 1 um, and 2A, so a high speed line to London, to Birmingham, and then to Manchester. And we're doing this work for the High Speed 1, uh, the High Speed 2 project, where we're modelling, this railway doesn't exist yet, but we're modelling um, the 2033 operation of that railway and refining the design in a virtual simulation 
to show us how we'll get the benefit. And we were talking about um, how we might interleave services um, between um, the, 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 the line, the route, the service to Trenchtown, but with, with broader ambitions, well, you can use these sorts of simulations to do this sort of work. And what we can do is we can refine the design of the technical infrastructure, the trains, the signaling, the control in these simulations, and, and, and show um, how, depending on how we change parts of the system, again, thinking about that systems thinking piece, how we change parts of that will get different outcomes, different benefits. This is something similar. Um, I'm afraid it's another video to start. Um, just to um, um, give you an idea, this is Guangzhou Line 7 um, we've been working on, and this is about the energy consumption. You may know that um, in China, there's constraints on energy in as much as generation capability isn't, is, isn't um, moving as fast as demand. So um, there was a real need to reduce down the energy consumption of this railway, an electric railway. So we've done this modeling and looked to optimize train control on, on the railway um, to reduce down the energy utilization for, for the railway. We also um, develop instrumentation, for example, to look at where tracks need maintaining, low cost instrumentation for this. We're just rolling this out with network rail for in-service trains, but in some countries this is really useful where there's not high um, measurement equipment. And what this is, is it's a set of instrumentation that fits onto the bogey, onto the truck of the train, and is able to measure the track and identify areas where maintenance is needed and re required. And it's a little box, I don't know, not, not, not much bigger than a shoe box um, that is able to, to, to create that sort of um, data and is a, a bit, a bit too, too much data, but I'll talk about this later. But this gives us data as well as our, our multi-million pound measurement train. And there's our Hydroflex train in the decarbonisation area um, working on the main line in, in, in the UK. Again, this is really interesting. As I said, it's the fir UK's first hydrogen train that we've developed in, 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 in partnership with a company called Porterbrook. But the really interesting thing about this, this is the first train in the world that is a, a, a conventional train that has been retractioned. So this train is 20, 25 years old, something like that. And we changed it to be hydrogen, hydrogen powered. So it's a midlife overhaul of the power of the train. Um, we're now doing projects in Africa where we're um, um, trying to do equivalent things with freight trains. And um, this, this mid-life overhaul of trains and retractioning is a really important and interesting area. And then I mentioned the skills part, and I mentioned that um, I look after the National College for Advanced Transportation Infrastructure. These are our two national colleges in the UK that look after training for, for railway and general transport infrastructure. Um, in, one in Birmingham, um, the other side of the city from the university, and one in the northeast in Doncaster. Um, and these are um, developing training courses for our future engineers, but also retraining people who are already in the railway. You, you saw, it's not quite as stark as this, but you saw the picture earlier of the people working 100 years ago on London Underground and how they're working today. Um, that means that during people's careers, we need to upskill them, and we use these colleges to do that. Oh, and then um, just coming really to some final things. Um, in June this year, we are hosting um, the World Congress on Railway Research in Birmingham. Um, we expect over 1,000 people to attend this event. Um, it's the, this conference runs every three years, um, and um, this will be the 13th edition of this major conference. So an important and um, puts us on the map for where um, railways are, both in terms of um, the University of Birmingham and what we do, but also um, in terms of, of the UK's um, um, view of this. Um, there's another video here, and if we've got some sound, that would be really good. It's just a video. We oh, are we BCRRE, 50 years young, and this is us. Here we have 3,000 square metres of working space, laboratories, crazy cool machinery, and these guys. This woman solves problems. That guy drives trains. I do. We teach you all about railway engineering. It can look like this, or something like this. You'll hear technical terms such as... Dr. Yellow. Fish plate. Headway. The four foot. We like a good challenge and thrive being first to all sorts of things. 
The first hydrogen train on the UK mainline tracks? That's us. The first to offer a level 7 degree apprenticeship in rail and rail systems engineering? Us again. Winning the Queen's anniversary prize for higher and further education? Done. The first railway focus group to work in all non-Arctic continents? Well, you get the idea. Oh wait! We're also first with accredited B-Eng and M-Eng rail engineering degrees. Okay, what else? We do all kinds of research. Oh yes, we research stuff. And by that, I mean tons of stuff. We issued our first ever paper way back in the 1970s. Now we issue circa 100 per year. Easy. We're the only Russell Group University with a further education college, and it focuses on rail. We've had three spin-out companies. We've collaborated with big influential companies and companies that aren't so big yet, which led us to win around 30 awards. More like 40. All right, 40 awards. Did we mention that we have a railway station on campus? Well, we're the only university across the whole UK to have one. We're BCRE. We're 50 years young, and we're just getting started. So um, that was a video we had made for our, our 50th birthday for the group, and I thought it probably sums up all we do quite well. Oh, there we go. So thank you very much. It's lovely to see so many of you here. Um, please take the opportunity as we're together over the next couple of days to ask questions, talk to us. Um, we're, we're here because we want to develop really deep um, collaborations. So really looking forward to, to active discussion um, coming forward. So thank you very much. So if, if you have any questions for Professor Roberts, the microphone is there. Uh, it's a walk-up mic. Just uh, There are two of them um, as well. So, uh, so if you could just uh, say your name and organization, that would be fantastic. Thank you. My name is Earl Wilson, lecturer in the School of Engineering. With regard to your hydrogen train, is it onboard generation for the hydrogen? Um, no. Well, so... so we use a, 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 a tank storage for the hydrogen there. We're actually just working on an ammonia cracking train, though, um, with our research where we will produce the, the hydrogen from the ammonia on, on, on the train. But at the, at the moment, this is uh, a hydrogen fuel cell um, with a battery um, storage, um, um, so a, a fairly standard um, design. And so what is a round trip in terms of mileage for your storage? Um, so we can... Um, have a range of about 160 miles um, um, with, with this train. Um, you could um, put, um, so this is a, a first prototype train, but you could increase that capability. Um, but it, um, it, it, at the moment, we've, we, we've got about a 160 mile capability on that train. Um, in terms of the sort of loading gauge of a, of a train, so where there's space to put hydrogen storage, it depends on the train, but you could look up to about three or four hundred miles on a, on a train. It depends on the mass. There's, there's lots of variables, but but fundamentally, you can you can get perhaps a day's worth of of travel out of a train depending on the kind of route it's travelling. And finally, your storage capacity in PSI. Oh, I don't know. Okay, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Some really good, uh, good technical questions there, um, and. Uh, um, I'd just like to say to the person who just asked that question, he's around, so you know, yep. feel free to yep. engage Professor Roberts. Okay, I can see someone else is at the mic. Thank you very much. John Francis, Museum and Heritage Preservation Officer, UTEC, Jamaica. All right. During your presentation, Professor Roberts, you mentioned the displacement of um, trucks, because of the train situation. I was just wondering how you are going, the team is going to factor in the other stakeholders who may be displaced. Because we are a society where when the buses are on track, we have uh, men who are stoning them, you know, because they feel that the taxes are a threat. So we just want to ensure that the, the um, criminal violence element is factored in so persons know that, you know, everybody can have a share of the pie. Thank you. Thank you. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex question, um, but, but, but change um, brings about some of these sorts of issues. 
Um, what, what the railway does will create employment and will create upskilled and, and higher paid value jobs. So, um, you know, that's, that's well, well, well evidenced. Um, it also, I'm going to talk a bit about this later, it actually means that um, potentially jobs are moved out of areas where of traditionally high paid jobs and put into perhaps more rural areas. I've got a map of the UK that shows how, for example, the HS2 project is moving jobs and better paid jobs to the north of Britain rather than to, to the south and, and, and London. However, on an individual case of one individual person that has um, feels a grievance, then that, that's a real challenge. Um, but I, th I think to say that, um, although some of the methods may be, may be different, and is th those sorts of things are felt around the world through these sorts of transportation projects, and there are people that, that can help and, and have knowledge of, of ways to so, sort of so, um, so support those social challenges. Very interesting social question there. I'm sure it's going to be an ongoing challenge. Um, I, just to add to what Professor um, Roberts is saying, as the next person makes his way to the microphone, uh, when I met with Minister Shaw yesterday, um, one of his technical staff um, highlighted that the same challenge was faced when they were rehabilitating Port Royal to introduce cruise ships, and, and how do you integrate the community in Port Royal with the cruise ship activity. So we're hoping to learn lessons from that experience as well so that we can introduce the, the railway without anyone feeling too threatened. As, as Professor Clive said, we, you know, it should create jobs and hopefully people will reskill and, uh, and perhaps become train drivers. Um, <laughs> projects is it's important to bring the community with you. You, you. you don't want to do things to the community. You want to do very much with them and bring them together in partnership. And it, that, is that, that is the dialogue that you're already having here, but that, that's best practice on how to, how to deliver these sorts of changes. Yes, next question. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, my name is Stefan Howard. I'm a final year civil engineering student at the University of the West Indies, aspiring to specialize in transportation. However, I noticed that you guys refer to railway engineering as a separate subdiscipline. I was not aware of this. So I was just wondering, what does this subdiscipline entail? So, um, yes, yeah, so um, it, it's well worth talking to Marcelo because Marcelo's got an MSc in transportation. Um, so um, he, he'll be able to, to talk more broadly. Um, so in, in, in railway engineering in particular, what we're looking at is, is that railway systems piece. And we're looking at combining civil engineering, know-how and capability, but with electrical engineering and mechanical engineering and actually the business side of how we operate the railway as well. Um, and and this, this will come across through later, later presentations, but the systems bit of all of this is really, really important. As I said, if you, you can have the best laid, best designed track, but if you don't have, or if you're not operating the right services on it, if you haven't got well-maintained trains, if you haven't got the right power requirements, if you aren't um, controlling trains in a safe way, you will have a problematic railway that, uh, that so we need all of the parts to work together. So um, railways conventionally are, are quite siloed. You'll come in and you'll be a civil engineer and work on the track and that's, that's fine. But what we need, what we're training is, is making sure that as people rise to that broader aspect of managing railways, that they're thinking about all of those different aspects together so that, that the railway works as a whole system. And um, it's, it's, it's incredibly important. So, I, I, I'm head of School of Engineering, so I have, I have colleagues who work in aerospace and actually space engineering and various other things, and I, I usually win the argument that railways are the most complex of engineering systems because they have this interdisciplinary nature to them, and they have what we call a closely coupled system, i.e. the wheels, the metal wheels are continuously in contact with them, the, 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 the metal track, and there are so many things along the railway that need to be working, so those bridges we were talking about, the signals, parts of the train, they all need to be working in order to get the train from A to B. So um, I find it incredibly interesting, that systems part of this. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, the microphone's just there. You can ask your questions. And I will also be addressing questions um, from our YouTube chat as well. But um, let's take some more from the room. Yes, I, I am uh, 
first of all, Stuart, uh, program director, the civil engineering department here at UTEC, right? Uh, just complementing what Professor Roberts is saying, and we are particularly interested in the community rail. And ironically, not knowing about this conference, our final year students, we have such a group that transportation, and they are now doing a community rail project to present, and it will be presented at our major project conference, and that's to move people from, uh, they might not be familiar, but from crossroads to downtown, that congested corridor. And the students have selected surface rails, right? And they are way advancing it. I don't know what tomorrow might bring, but I'm gonna call them up to come here to, you know, and ask the question that they've been asking me. Absolutely. Uh, excellent, yes. <laughs> and, and maybe, Promise maybe them food. Students usually come for food. It's <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Um, and, and I think, O'Neill, there's a poster competition or presentation. Yes, so maybe you can liaise with um, Mr. Josephs as well, but fantastic. Um, okay, so uh, Robert, there are, let me see if I can find questions relevant to you. So there's one here um, online, um, Lennox Bennett. Uh, his question is, what are the prospects of including reliability analysis as part of systems operations? And I think he was referring a bit of that to the community real presentation. Okay, excellent. So um, I'm actually going to talk about some of this in, in one of my later presentations. But um, in that systems, that systems viewpoint, ensuring that we get the right level of reliability and we, we design that into the system is really important, both in terms of the um, experience um, perceived by the traveling customer, the, the, the public, or, or, or the freight um, companies, but also from the, just the whole life cycle cost of the railway. So we need to think as we're designing the railway how we're going to maintain it and look after it. If we don't do that right, it will become something that is expensive to maintain, um, remembering that these assets that we're, we're putting in place probably will last us 30, 40, 50 years and even beyond that. So thinking very carefully about the reliability, what we would call the RAMs, the reliability, availability, maintainability and safety aspects of the design are really, really important, a key function of, of railway systems engineering, as, as in aerospace. Is a Absolutely, yeah. I was gonna say, yeah, that aerospace, we have very complex systems as well. Um, well, because of time, I think uh, that would probably be the last question. I don't see anyone at the microphones. Um, we also have questions online as well. Um, so just very quickly, there's one here from Leroy Morris, who is basically saying, with currently no railway line pre previously routed to Trenchtown, um, is the timeline a little ambitious um, and knowing the land, the, you know, the land space um, challenges as well. Um, I'm looking at the GRC. Um, for support here, but there is the line does get you close enough to trench down. To, um, it gets you close enough to Culture Yard. It's not it's not on the doorstep of Culture Yard, but it gets you in the vicinity. So um, so so there is there you know there is a line there already that we just have to rehabilitate, and if required, we could shuttle um, visitors from the the the, the, rail, the rail the side of the rail to Culture Yard. So we'd have to have some sort of integrated transport system there. Um, Another comment here from Hasina Swan, where she says that trucks won't be fully displaced because there still has to be transportation to and from train stations. For sure. Very important point, integration, isn't it? Yep, 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 for sure. Um, so um, what you're, as you're doing with Bauxite, I, I, I don't know enough about the Bauxite operation, but um, either you're bringing the railway to, to ports or you're having to, to, to move, um, but only moderately short distances. Um, and in a country that's um, like um, Jamaica, where um, the, um, the, the, the geography is, is quite hilly and various things, then there's lots of benefits to being able to bring it through a, a rail corridor. All right, everyone. Well, um, help me to thank Professor Clive Roberts from the University of Birmingham. <laughs> there is more to come um, in the plenary session. So you'll be hearing from, uh, again, from Professor Roberts, you'll be hearing from members of Jamaica Railway Corporation and also um, Naranda and the Bauxite Railway as well, and, and much more. Um, so we're gonna take a small coffee break. I'm told um, there are refreshments um, through the door on the right, and then we will come back for uh, further presentations and then lunch, and you're all welcome to lunch, and it's free. So make sure you're there, all right? Okay, thank you very much. 
Uh, we'll take about a 10 minute tea and coffee break and have you back in here in about 10 minutes. Thank you. Everyone, as we get ready to restart um, the symposium, and we are going to get into the symposium proper now. Um, we've heard from the University of Birmingham with uh, the keynote presentation there from Professor Clive Roberts outlining the reputation of the university with respect to their research in rail um, and all the wonderful and exciting projects that they're undertaking. And you know, I, I'm sure you, you can recognize the significant opportunity there is for knowledge transfer between the two institutions. So we want to thank Professor uh, Clive Roberts for his presentation. And uh, we look forward to his other presentations during the um, symposium. So now it's time to um, hear from some local voices. Um, the first presentation will be from Mr. Kenrick Lug. Mr. Lug, he's here, ready to go. He is a railroad operations superintendent. And uh, will you be joined by Michael? It's, it's two of you. OK, so he'll be joined by Michael Patterson, um, chief engineer at Noronda Jamaica Bauxite Partners. So we'll be getting their insight into the bauxite industry experiences, challenges, solutions, and developments. So help, help me welcome Mr. Kenrick Lug and Mr. Michael Patterson. Right. Um, Master of Ceremonies, Dr. Brown, distinguished guests, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, good afternoon to all. all right. So I'll be presenting and giving a background on the real network information. And as indicated, we'll be speaking to uh, the developments also for bauxite industry. So I'll be presented, and I'll be joined by Mr. Michael Patterson shortly, who will continue the presentation. Um, the fact that both of us are presenting for the one organization, is no indication that it will be a very long presentation. <laughs> but we'll try to be brief, all right? All right, as indicated, we'll give a, I'll give a brief thing on the background. Um, rail network and locomotive. Um, Mr. Patchen will go into the challenges, solutions, and development for our locomotive, rail network, communications, and some future considerations that we have. Now, that photo looks very familiar. I thought I saw it earlier, and I was wondering. <laughs> but that's um, one of our SD38 locomotives. That's one of the 2,000 horsepower. And that has a consist on it there of 24 wagons each one hauling up to 100 tons, all right? Now, the Noranda presently started out as Kaiser, and the company was originally on the south coast and then moved over to the north coast in 1966-67. The first, the first shipment left, I believe it is February 1967 from the port at Discover Bay. Being an American organization, our track was constructed according to American standards. And there are some minor differences between the American standards, which we use as FRA standards, and the European standards. Um, Professor Roberts' video spoke to, you will learn words such as fish plate. The American standards are FRA, they call it joint bar. So uh, some things are similar, but some minor differences, right? But all for the safety of the operation, right? Um, the age of our rail network, 56 years. Its length, it's a single line track, 15 and a half miles in length. Um, it traverses from the coastline through the Dry Harbor Mountains up to the loadouts. So we have 
gradients averaging 2.2%. Um, curves, we have 73 curves on our main line. And um, the radius of those curves range anywhere from 3 to 15 degrees. As a matter of fact, 31 of them are above 10%. So it is precipitous and winding. Yes, we call that a mountainous grade um, track in the United, for the FRA standards. Um, there's only one 15 degree curve and that's close to the port. And we use 115 pounds head hardened rails for a track and wooden creosote cross ties. All right. Now this is just an imagery showing the track running from the coastline. This white line indicates it, as you can see, all the way up through the Dry Harbor Mountains, coming up towards the loadouts, right? And on this map, it's just to show you on the island from point A to point B, and it travels north to south. Um, our locals travel at speeds of up to 25 miles per hour, maximum speed. And it comes back to, as I mentioned, that they mentioned that we're a class two track according to FRA standards and class two, class two based on speed because FRA has classes from one all the way up to, I believe, nine. One through two freight trains and by our speed, we fit as a class two track. Um, once you go past class four, you're speaking of 40 miles per hour, up to class five, 80 miles per hour, class six, then you move into high speed tracks of 100 miles per hour and upwards. Um, for, as I mentioned before, we have the consists that consists of, they have 25 cars and we use 24 times and each one can carry up to 100 tons of bauxite. Now we mentioned earlier that um, it will replace the need to have a lot of trucks on the road hauling bauxite. So you can imagine it takes 40 consists to load a ship. And that's roughly 3,000 road truck loads. So you could imagine how many trucks that will be running up and down, running up and down, from the mine to the port to load a vessel. So that's how the railroad assists with the movement of bauxite in a more efficient way. Um, we have two, three yards, the port yard. We have the one halfway up to the end, which is the Tobolsky yard. That's one loadout, and there's another one for which we call the Water Valley Yard. It's another loadout, and they have several tracks in these yards. Now, our mode of operations. We have mode of operations. We can operate two trains or three trains, depending on the distance and which loadout we are coming from. And it shows there the cycle time per locomotive per round trip, because we operate on a 24-7 basis. We operate around the clock. Um, from port to the first loadout and back, it's a two and a half hour round trip. Port to Water Valley and back, the second loadout, the furthest one, is a three hour round trip. We average up to eight trips per day and some days we go up to 10 trips, but on average we do eight trips per day. So it's a very, very, very busy line for a single line track and for the distance, all right? Now, based on the terrain, as I mentioned, we go through the Dryber Mountains and the 2.2% gradient. The track was designed with three safety runaway locations. Now each of these runaways are on average half a mile in length. All right, so these are there for the traveling downhill, the amount of braking requirement. If you have a runaway, they're there to prevent damage to Track, locomotive, equipment, and personnel also. Now, this is just a background, basic background on our locomotives. As I mentioned, we have three 2,000 horsepower SD38 dashes, um, and we have two SD-40, 3,000 horsepower turbocharged. And those are the latest addition. The two are the latest addition to our fleet. Um, there are six axles, right? Diesel electric locomotives, uh, we got them from General Motors, 
and the dates there between 1967 and 1971. And um, the other SD40-2, which is a turbocharged engines, 1972 to 1989. And these are 16-cylinder turbocharged engines. As I said, 3,000 horsepower. Now we need that horsepower for pulling and braking efficiency because of the nature of the track with the curves and the precipitous terrain. The choice was made for these units. So I'll hand over now to Mr. Patterson to go into more details with our track and locomotive. Thank you. Thank you, Kendrick. Um, indeed, I'm uh, very happy to be here today um, to contribute to this um, whole effort. Um, it was some years ago that I was on this facility here. I attended CAST, not UTEC. And that was some 42 years I left um, here. So it's good to be back and in this um, setting. Um, when I was at CAS, I uh, did engineering, and I left and went straight to um, Kaiser Bauxite to work. Uh, there was no railway engineering study at, youth, at CAS at the time. I'm expecting that coming out of this effort, there's going to be a program, a degree program to train railway engineers going forward. And um, it was said earlier that the first railroad um, in Jamaica, first operation was in 1845. Is, am I right? Yes. I think if you add 18 and 45, there's a number that comes out of that. Happens to be, I think the, the Minister of Transport earlier gave his age. I'm actually giving away my age, so there's a relevance in that information where <laughs> It coincides with my age, and therefore something big is going to happen this year. Good. All right, so um, the trains that we operate uh, in the bauxite uh, operation in this, uh, Discovery Bay St. Anne, we have extreme gradients, as um, Kenrick mentioned, 2.2, 2.5 average grade, and in some cases we could go to 3%. Now, this is considered to be mountain grade and extreme operating conditions. So we have to ensure that we operate safely by controlling speeds, ensure that you have good braking systems, air brakes, and um, coupled with dynamic brakes so that we can keep that train going safely down the track. The track, you realize, is very winded. 10 degree curves, those are serious curves, cause excessive rear wear on rails and wheels. And but they help in slowing the trains. So that is a, is a plus in a sense. So um, we, have, we have to maintain our dy dynamic braking systems. It's very difficult for air brake alone to control it because in the early days, the brake shoes were not of the type that you can get now. They're, they were not fade resistant and therefore the shoes will get hot. The wheels get extremely hot when they are applying brakes up to probably 600 degrees or more, and you end up with brakes that becomes ineffective after a while, and you could end up with a runaway train. So the dynamic braking is very important to help keep that train under control, so we have to maintain those systems. Um, for a track in Kingston, you may not need dynamic brakes, but considering um, that you could be stopping a train and the energy to stop the train you convert that to electrical energy to charge batteries, you could end up with a more efficient train system. So those are something that the young engineers who will be engaged in the process can see how we can uh, better utilize, or probably even retrofit one of the trains to hydrogen powered and couple that with regenerative braking to be more efficient. So braking efficiency for us is very important to get the trains down to the port safely. Uh, traction is very important for climbing the hills and also to get dynamic braking. Once you lose traction in dynamics, you literally lose your dynamic brakes. 
because you have to save on your traction motor. So you have to stay within. So we use a lot of sand to ensure that we have good traction on the track, for instance. Uh, wayside lubrication to ensure that uh, we reduce the wear of the wheel flanges and the rails. So we started out with, with wayside lubricators, and that was a challenge. Somebody mentioned earlier, how do you deal with um, challenges where the, the communities around may want to interfere with your systems? So we could not maintain the wayside lubricators after a while. And we did our research, and we came up with the onboard wheel flange lubrication system, where we utilize a biodegradable lubricant uh, that proved very successful. We're able to extend the, the wear life of our, of our wheels and the rail heads, so we're changing less wheels, less profiling of wheels, and our rails are lasting longer, and we're getting using less fuel to climb the, the hills. Okay, uh, so we have a in-house, we have our uh, profiling and reprofiling uh, lathes. So we do profile of our wheels to ensure that we have uh, good profile for good traction. Um, the braking system, which is another uh, upgrade, we introduce our end of train device because um, the, the Jamaica Railway, one of the biggest uh, railway disasters um, in history which we had here, where a train ran out of, con um, out of control because we understand that a brake line was, a valve was locked off, and therefore part of the train did ha didn't have any brake and caused a disastrous um, accident. We've introduced the use of the end of train device where a device at the end of the train monitors the air pressure in the brake line so that if there's any interruption of that air service, it would um, uh, create an automatic um, stop of the train so that we have that in the system. And we also introduced um, some locking mechanism on those valves between each car so that nobody can tamper with those valves to lock off the brakes on the train. And I mentioned the fade resistant brake shoes and the dynamic braking, which is very important. Okay. That's okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. All right. So there are other things that we we also do. We um, to save on fuel. So fuel is expensive. It, it is one of the biggest uh, cost in a railroading uh, operation. So we installed a, a ZTR. That's a brand of uh, electronic control system where we can automatically shut down the train at certain designated points. And it has a, a geofencing uh, feature where we decide where it is safe to shut down the train. Because you don't want to shut down the train on a hill, and then you lose air, and then your brake is on its way down the hill. So we limit the activation of that system only in the yard areas where the, the track is level. Uh, we have on board event recorders that record all the activities, the critical activities that happens on the train, and we have periodic review, not only when there's an accident, periodic review to ensure that the operators are operating in accordance with procedures. And then you can actually share that information with uh, operators to ensure that they keep operating at that level that is required for safety. We upgraded our locomotives with our PLC systems. We use the N4 system. Um, that has helped greatly. You realize that the locomotives that we have are not the, the newest locomotives, built some in the 60s, 70s. And uh, we did our upgrades and have them now considered uh, up to par with some of the newer locomotives, but not quite there. We are not um, hydrogen powered and we're not Um, that we think help us to improve on the safety and performance of the units. Um, we try to, we use the FRA and um, standards 
to develop our policies and procedures for operating our train. But what we do, we try to tailor it so that it is easier to understand for our Jamaican users. Because if we just pull sections out of the FRA, it's not easily understood. So we write it in a way with pictures, using pictures so people can see what we're talking about. And tailor it using the same critical information tailored for our environment. And we end up with procedures that we're happy about. Um, fuel. Um, this, this is a global problem. Anywhere there's diesel fuel, somebody might want it. Um, so we have to keep it on board the locomotive where it, we need it. Um, so what we do, we install anti-siphon um, devices in the fuel tank so that um, you can extract the fuel easily. And we have a, a fuel level gauge that in case there is a excessive flow of fuel, it could trigger an alarm through the ZTR system. Uh, we have other safety uh, appliances on the unit that um, helps in that um, also. Monitoring, we have cameras um, on, the, on the trains, forward looking and, and rear looking cameras, so that um, also help with security and, and also to, in the case of uh, an incident, an accident, we can always go back to see exactly what happened so we can do our root cause field analysis, find out exactly what happened and where it requires uh, procedure changes we make the necessary changes to our procedures, which are controlled documents. So those are some of the things that we get from that. All right. Um, you realize that we chose the six axle locomotives uh, because of the traction. Mentioned that before, we started out with the SD38s, which are 2,000 horsepower. Um, they were just about peak in terms of horsepower getting the train up the hill. At maximum power, we were able to do uh, probably eight miles per hour at some sections of the track. We, we have now two of the SD40s, 3,000 horsepower. They are able to increase that speed to probably 15 miles per hour in those difficult areas, and therefore we are getting a, a improved cycle time on those units while still remaining within safe operating speed. Uh, we mentioned the unfo uh, wheel flange lubricators. Uh, which are activated by the three degree curves. We have 73 of those curves, three degrees and above in the track. And what it means is that for a train that is uh, just over a quarter mile long, there are only three sections of the 15 and a half miles where the entire length of train is on a straight. It's always going around some curve. We develop our maintenance programs, checks. Um, uh, the the wheel, wheel gauge, we use that quite a bit so that we can identify thin flange, high flange, thin tire, uh, whatever is critical because, you know, wheels and rail contact, metal to metal, tend to have excessive wear. So we have to follow on that. And for any railroad, it's critical to be on top of your wheel, your wheels. Right? Um, we talk about um, dynamic braking, the criticality of it, end of train device. You can see um, a look of the end of train device, which is on the back of the train. And we, there's a corresponding head of train unit in the cab of the locomotive that, that there's a wireless communication between the end of train and the head of train unit that provides that um, safety. It's also... Additionally, it's a very critical unit if you have to make an emergency stop. Um, if you're coming downhill and uh, the, whether an emergency stop is initiated by the operator or by the, the, the locomotive itself, uh, this allows the stopping of the train to start from the back. And therefore, cars don't run into each other and bump, bump the, the cars ahead of it off track. So this is a very important safety device for safe train operation. Um, they mention our event, event recorders that um, critical when there is an accident so we can go back and do that review to find out what happened. 
and implement um, safety measures so that such occurrence do doesn't happen again. Um, and uh, mention that. Okay. Um, the monitoring of the locomotives. Um, okay. The the, 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 in, the interaction between wheels and rails is absolutely critical. Any deformity on the rail or deformity in the track structure um, directly impacts your wheels, your wheel bearing assemblies, your traction motors. You can get a lot of failures from your, your, by having deficiencies in your interface between wheel and rails. And, um, the, the, um, I don't want to be in trouble here. Professor, no, Professor um, Roberts, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. You mentioned your onboard um, vibration monitoring system, which we really want to get more information on because uh, we've been trying to identify uh, a cost effective good cost-effective system that we can put on board locomotives to, to identify those um, bad spots along the track. And if, should you have a, a defective bearing on a locomotive, it can also identify a defective bearing so you can do early repairs, plan for that, and get that corrected. All right. Um, we've also added, as mentioned here, uh, security personnel is on each locomotive to help take care of um, a problem that was mentioned earlier. How do you navigate through um, areas where you could have interaction, interface with people who should not be on your locomotive or who have access to your locomotive? So we have security personnel on board uh, each, each train. Um, so we have the locomotive operator, a brakeman, and a security personnel on the train to ensure you don't want your operators to be interfacing with security issues. So we have a security personnel for that. Um, right. oh, this, this is actually showing the arrangement of our um, anti-siphon device and our fuel monitoring um, device so we can know if um, fuel is being extracted at a rapid rate and that could um, help us. Okay, we've mentioned um, the fact that we've added um, two upgraded locomotives, the SD40s. And what we also uh, did um, is to look at the safe stopping of the trains on the track. And uh, we came to the conclusion that um, while the track, each locomotive had an overspeed um, setting of 26 miles per hour because 25 was the maximum speed of the train, operating speed by procedure. And that was an uphill travel, but downhill you were supposed to not exceed 20. And therefore, with an overspeed setting of 26, operators could actually go to 26 miles per hour downhill. And that would have exceeded the safe stopping um, speed of the train. So what we did is reduce that, that speed to 20, mi 20 miles per hour maximum on our um, speed limit. And therefore, we have had no issues where um, operators would not want to get the emergency stop by exceeding the speed downhill. And therefore, we have very good compliance with that. And I think we're having much less wheel wear, much less track wear, um, a safer train by reducing the speed. All right, we mentioned the, the, the fade-resistant brake shoes, which is a great plus because um, the, that red shoe, uh, this shoe is the, the fade-resistant shoe. What it does, even at the 600-degree temperature that you could experience on the wheels coming downhill, these brake shoes will, will maintain their friction ability to keep effective brake on that train. 
Uh, okay, so that, that's, a, that's a very big plus also. It's, it also is a longer life breakthrough. So you have less interaction of um, maintenance people trying to change brake shoes because you could get, um, well, I'm not sure. It could be said that 10 times as much life out of a brake shoe. So that's a much less interaction between maintenance personnel and brake shoes, especially when brake shoes, could, you could only get probably three, four trips out of a brake shoe of the older type. So it's getting a, a, a long life breakthrough is a big plus. We also um, implement other measures. Um, we have a dedicated train controller that his job is only to ensure that um, we, don't, we have a single line track and we have three passing points. We can't have two, two equipment on the same track. And therefore, we, we have a controller who ensures that we don't have that happening. So uh, the safety of the operation is very critical. Um, we've had incidents, but we, 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 we try to, whenever there's an incident, and we want to emphasize and stress that, irrespective of the extent of the incident, and as a recommendation we'll talk about, is that you want to make sure you you, you analyze that incident. It might not be a, a, a serious incident now, but sometimes the difference between what is minimal and severe might just be a matter of seconds. And therefore, um, you want to put things in place to prevent it happening. Once it's, it's a free lesson if it happens without any severity. So you want to learn from it. So as technology advances, we try to upgrade our locomotives and our systems so that we can stay up to date uh, in safety and oper operability of our locomotives. Oil sample analysis program, very critical because um, we don't want to necessarily have to be dismantling our engines all the while to find out if our, your bearings are okay. I mean, we go to the doctors to check, we get blood tests, we do things like that to avoid an operation every time you want to find out if something is wrong with you. We do the same thing for our locomotive engines. We take oil sample analysis, and from that analysis, we can know what are the wear metals in the oil, uh, whether we have water dilution or fuel dilution, and then we can take corrective measures so that we can have extend the life of the engines because um, a lot of times when you pull these components without good reason, you actually initiate a failure. So if you can do these uh, analysis, you would have a, a more reliable system. All right, um, Kenrick mentioned our track geometry, rugged terrain, and we, we do periodic um, accelerometer study of the track twice per year so that we get a, an idea of the, the, the bad areas along the track. But a, a, a good improvement would be to have an onboard unit so we can see at any time we have a knowledge of the condition of the track. And we have our track equipment. Um, we have our road crossings. This is a local security station where there's a security personnel at the road crossings and uh, the gates are there so we can stop the vehicular traffic so we can have safe passage. We, and we also have our um, allotment of track maintenance equipment, tight tampers, um, um, well, speed swing, grade all, all that is required for um, normal maintenance of the track. And you have to be on top of that because defects in the track can lead to serious consequences. And uh, for an operation which is going on for over 55 years, I think we're still doing fairly well. All right, so um, we, are, we are going from 328 um, feet above sea level um, to 1640 in that, in that, um, that gives us our two two and a half to three percent grade region average curves. 
severe curves, but with um, good lubrication, we are able to uh, reduce um, wear on our rails. And mentioned that before. Okay, um, some improvements. Um, okay. Oh, the two and a half to three and a half inches super elevation on our curves. That help a lot to, um, to, 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 to safely maintain the, the, the speed of the train and also to reduce real, uh, real wears. So that's very important. Um, the gauge of the track with so much horizontal thrusting forces while the train is coming down, we tend to be pushing the rails apart. So we use a lot of gauge rods that to hold that gauge because that is so critical to, to, for safety. So we have a lot of gauge rods along the track to hold that gauge in place. Um, probably in Kingston where the tracks might be laid in, in the road, you don't have, wouldn't have that problem. But for us, it's extremely critical. Um, the cant is also important to get the right cant on the track. And the use of um, improved anchoring means to hold those rails onto the rail ties is also very important. And we've also started, for some time now, the, the long welded rails where to reduce the amount of joint bars in the system, because wherever there's a joint, you introduce a, a point of uh, excessive vibration and potential failure. So we are welding our rails to reduce the amount of um, joints, and we have a much smoother travel less uh, failures of traction motors and all of that, especially that we're using DC traction motors where vibrations cause um, damage to your, 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 your commutators and your slip rings and all of that. All right. All right. Um, okay. All right, some, we talk about gauge uh, wheel wear. Okay, we pretty much have gone through quite a bit. You can see some more um, pointers there. Yes. Right. Um, like I said, the age of the equipment, they're not the youngest equipment, but we try with good operation and maintenance practices and to add improved technology whenever it, um, it's uh, available and affordable, we can keep our locomotives um, as modern as possible. Um, all right, we mentioned that um, accelerometer check from time to time and uh, our track work. We, um, well, we have a contractor who does our track maintenance. They work through our maintenance planning system so that we can coordinate the activities of track maintenance with operations and other maintenance of the plant. Okay, so um, we mentioned improved rail fasteners using screw spikes instead of uh, just a straight spike, and that will hold our rails in place safer for longer. And again, well, okay. This point, I don't want it to switch that. If you can recognize that, we want um, some more information on that um, onboard accelerometer. And um, okay, so okay, all right. So that's about it for uh, our presentation and. Um, Probably more than in a nutshell. I don't, I don't know if we were longer than expected, but uh, we just wanted to say um, we've been in operation for a number of years, and it means that it can be done, and there's good reason to restore the railroad operations in Jamaica because we show that it can be done. Thank you. OK, well, thank you very much. Um, that was Mr. Kenrick Lug and Michael Patterson. Um, do we have any questions from the floor? Remember, we have two microphones that you can walk up to and ask questions. Um, 
So if you have any questions, please. Yes, the mic's there. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, question to Mr. Patterson. I noticed you mentioned that you removed the links from your rail and you're welding them. Do I get you correct? Yes, the joint bars. We so you, you don't experience warping in your rails? Um, because not, they eat up to 600 degrees. Right, yes. It's not continuous welding. We have uh, interruptions with joint bars okay, so that sorry. we might weld three, four rails. And then we have a joint bar to accommodate okay, that expansion. Okay. So it's just a longer length. Uh, yes. So right. how, how, how does it behave due to the temperature difference? Um, I, um, we have not really had any incidents of buckling, which would be the no case buckling. where you have um, expansion without and room for movement. So we're still uh, within. Um, and your rails doesn't wear. You, you gain in yeah. saving your rails. But exactly. a process like that, you, it should make your rail. You, uh, you wear more rails. A, a smoother travel because you have less bumping at the joint bars. So, so you don't you wear rails. Less traction motor failures, less wheel bearing, um, axle bearing fa uh, failures. Thank and you. you have a smoother ride and a, a more reliable operation. Thanks. And the battered joints. Wherever you have a joint, it, 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 the constant pounding of the wheels, you end up with a battered joint that cause escalate over time anyway. So the welding, welded rails save on that problem. It is a problem. Okay. All right. And there's a question from Professor uh, Roberts. Hi. Thank you. Um, a very, very good and interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, what you said about um, continuously welded track makes makes sense because there isn't. I imagine here not very much temperature range, so um, I wouldn't have thought you'd have rail backing problems. But my, my question is around driver advisory systems and anything you're doing to to train the drivers or provide information to the drivers to have the most efficient trajectory and how they, they drive. Do you have any systems to do that or? Okay, uh, that's a very interesting um, one because we figured that um, for a, from a development standpoint, if you were to have uh, cameras at uh, say road crossings uh, that can wireless link with the locomotive coming up, the, the operator could actually see that the, the, the crossing is, a, is it's safe for him to advance um, instead of coming around a curve to see that um, there's blockage or, or an in interruption in the track. Um, those are some of the things that we're, we're, we're figuring could help us going forward. Um, but then our dedicated train controller relays as much information of any other track activity to the operator. Okay. Um, while he's in so, transit. So I, I think I was thinking mainly around energy saving on just really how your, your tra the drivers drive and any variation between driving, that sort of thing. Okay, along the track, uh, we have signage. You have coasting uh, that, that and actually, yes, yeah, to tell the driver that, look, at this point, you should be, um, your brake should be applied, you should be in dynamics, okay. your speed should be such. Uh, so we have those um, signage along the track. Okay, so there's some work yeah. and simulation we have at, at yeah. Birmingham that we could pass to UTEC. Yes. And they could perhaps do some of this, yes. or, or, or it would be something the students could do. It's quite yeah. a nice nice yes. project for students right. to think about. That might, you might, might find useful in terms of results. Yeah, I think a, a good profile of the track that um, sort of determines safe speed along the track and um, is very good help for the operator yeah. so that he knows that at this point, you should have reduced your speed, you should be at a safe speed. At this point, yep. you should have engaged your dynamics. You should be advancing dynamics to, so, to such a level for a safe operator. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, because of time, um, Michael, we're going to have to pull the stumps there and move on to the next presentation. But, but Michael is around. You're here for the day, aren't you, Michael? Yes. So um, if you want to catch him at lunchtime, you can, if you have any more questions. But, uh, but let us. Um, Give an applause to Michael and to Michael and Kenrick Lug for their presentation. Okay, so let's move swiftly along. It's time to hear from the JRC, um, and we have Mr. Anthony Allen, a civil engineer and consultant from the JRC. He will be talking about the JRC experience, a technical evaluation of the passenger rail network. 
Mr. Allen. Let's welcome Mr. Allen. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, members from the team of, from Birmingham University and um, the UTEC fraternity, greetings from the Railway Corporation. Listening to my colleagues from the Naranda Bauxite Railway, I could say ditto, ditto, and then sit down. <laughs> the only problem though is that we are charged to run a passenger service and we cannot, maybe, won't be able to get away with the slow speeds and so on that um, warrants, I mean, for safety concerns, these, so, these serious three degree curves, because we are restricted naturally by the geometry of those curves, and you can't exceed the balance in speed. So we have basically about three such areas in the railway system um, going from Kingston to Montego Bay. But I, as I go along, I'll point these out. Um, the, what I hope to bring to this presentation is that um, the most of the history of the railway um, corporation can be found in Google, so I hope to probably bring some insight that up to now I don't think Google have knowledge of. Um, as was said previously, 1845 we started. We have a single line railway system, and that remains to this day. Um, except for station yards, the system primarily is controlled by um, this trains controller, normally located in Kingston, where we were fully in operation. And um, as you said previously, within a block, you can't allow two trains to occupy that block, except under exceptional circumstances, which a fallen order will come into place. But these are exceptional areas of concern that we have to deal with when such occasion arises. Um, the Station master, also in the station limits, he has, he has a set of tracks that he manages to cross trains at um, particular stations. So that's the only time you'll have probably two or three stations within a station yard which is controlled by your local station master. This is a very simplistic and rudimentary in, um, synopsis of how train movement is, is uh, managed. Um, in the earlier days, we used to go by um, to what is known as the, the your Morse code um, between um, communication between stations and, and the train drivers. We then moved to radar, a radar system of control, and now we are looking at a GPS system. That is for the future though. We are not fully there yet. As I said, we started with telegraphic transfer um, communication system. We are now at radio, and we are also going to um, more uh, modern systems like, for instance, cell phone communication and so on, and we'll go to the GPS eventually. Um, the motive power employed also has seen changes over the years. Of course, we started back in the day with the steam locomotive, and we made the gradual change to diesel electric, and we are, that's where we are now. We also had some self-powered cars for moving passengers over the system. These were more or less um, used in the 1980s, so the, the rail car system to move passengers. However, due to scarcity of spare parts, they were used to pull other units, which is not, they were not designed for, and therefore they, their demise was met, whereby we had them literally have to move to a situation where they have been all instead of being a self-propelled vehicle. So those are some of the challenges that we had in the early days. The question of locomotive pulling the, the units was a great challenge for us, particularly in the late 70s, early 80s, where the spare parts situation with locomotive became really a challenge for us. The scarcity of foreign exchange, together with our financial situation, did not allow us to fully maintain those locomotives. What happened then was that um, we had to literally cannibalize a unit to ensure the number of units that is required on a daily basis was maintained. As a matter of fact, we went we were at a stage where we had to probably cancel passenger train units because we could not supply the amount of units on a daily basis that was required for the services. Um, we used a strategy whereby we, we, at the time, we had a situation where we had contractual arrangements 
with Windal, which is Windalco now. It was Alcan back in the day, where we said that we require four locomotives. And once these were serviced and ready for that service, then whatever is left would run the passenger service. This was an untenable situation, and it did not last very long, as you can imagine. Um, we found ourselves where passengers pay their fares, lined up to be take the vehicle to their destination, and we had to refund the money. That is a situation that really found itself in, in the late 80s, sorry, middle 80s to late 80s. The strategy I said we, we, um, we employed was to literally service all bauxite clients and then the passenger service. This was untenable, and people lost faith in the system of the passenger train because they could not be guaranteed a service when they turn up at the railway station, particularly in Kingston and Montego Bay. So we lost a good section of our um, passengers during that period of time. And I don't think um, we have probably regained that concept of the person who were around then. As I said, we, as was said before, it's 30 years now that um, the re a passenger service was not, uh, not, uh, not, between Kingston and Montego Bay, was not in service at the time to now. So we have to really try rebrand, regroup, and hope that we can probably capture the confidence of the, of the traveling public, that when the train say, yes, we are ready, we would have done sufficient groundwork to ensure that the people have the confidence to take the service. The, a similar thing with the locomotive happens on the, the track maintenance side of things. We use a hardwood sleeper, and um, there was a time in the country whereby literally the forests were being depleted by the need for these hardwood sleepers. Our sleepers, we do not use a base plate as accustomed in the American system. It was strictly a dog spike, bored right on onto the wooden, hard wooden sleeper. We do not use, as I said, we do not use a base plate, whereby we could probably get, utilize the softwood sleepers that was available in the United States at the time. And therefore, there again lies a problem because we were not able to, again, maintain the track in a safe condition to operate at the speeds that we said that we would operate at. And therefore, this is now a reduced travel time because we have to cut the speed to maintain safety. Uh, this did not go too well with us, but again with the passenger, because again, they, it took at one time five hours to get to Kingston from Antigua Bay, a distance of 112 miles. That is real until no passenger is going to sit down in a train for five hours to reach Montego Bay. And that was a real challenge for us. Um, and it's, as I said, primarily was based on the condition of the track at the time and the speed that we were allowed to travel over the terrain, particularly in the Melrose Hill area, in the Green Hill area, going through the cockpit country. We just be constrained by speed, by the sheer geometry of the track. We started with a 60 pound rail, just to give a, a little bit of background, a 60 pound rail, which is a bullet rail, and chairs and the wooden sleepers. We moved to what is known as the Vignal Rail, and we started to use screw spikes, which was a result of the French being involved in the rail operations early 80s to about middle 80s. So basically, we were coming from a British system, which we adopted up to 1979, where the, the French protocol came into place, I mean, literally switch, if you know what I mean, um, our modus operandi to adopt the French technology. So we saw the introduction of screw spikes, nabla plates, nabla clips, and so on, particularly on the hills. Um, we went to a long welded rail, thermal welding, again, as my colleague mentioned, to reduce wear and tear on the, on the fasting system and also increase the, um, the traveling time because by going through the joints, you have to naturally sometimes drive slow down because of the clanging. The maintenance of the joints became you know, a nightmare for us because we have a lot of joints with 33 feet rails and you have so many joints. It's a nightmare to maintain those joints in a safe condition to carry our passengers. These welded rails also um, enhance the passenger comfort because there's ne not, not necessarily, not um, naturally less banging around, less curvature, so you will have a better and smoother ride for your passengers. This, as I said, um, it also cause the, the decrease in, in the rail instance of the rail that we've been having because of a joint situation. Once the joints get worn, then they, at that point of weakness, sometimes, particularly in the hills, the train will not resist that. The lateral force on those joints will give you a literal turnover on you, and that causes the rail main. 
So, and that also is another problem for our passenger train movement. Because the frequency of derailments we're having, then it lost confidence in the passenger service. We managed to probably um, arrest the situation by, again, I said, by reducing the speeds, particularly on the curves. But again, your travel time goes up, not down. And that passenger wants to get to point A from point A to point B in a specific time. The way forward, we are looking at increased speeds between Kingston and Montego Bay once that line is resuscitated. The challenge we have, and which I guess uh, have to be directed, is that I think there's some agreement between the road people that the railway can't operate at speeds which exceeded at the time the rail stopped running. That was in 1992. We are operating at 30 miles per hour, and therefore that will be a challenge for us because we figure that between Kingston and Maypen, very flat track, we have probably about um, six, seven degree curvature. We can attain 50 miles and upwards between Kingston and Maypen. That will considerably reduce the travel time, and we could compete with your road traffic. Notwithstanding that, we are not really trying to compete with the road traffic, but we want an integrated system. Because one just tries to say comp competition, as you say, that I, I think somebody mentioned earlier on, you're going to have resistance from your taxi people, you have resistance from your bus people, you don't want that. You want to set the integrated method. You get to the railway station on the train and get to the next de destination. You are, we are, don't want to be financed in a competitive mode because, as you said about the sabotage on the train, is we are quite susceptible to sabotage. And we have to be very, very careful, particularly these communities where somebody feels that their life is being threatened. So I was saying the way forward. Um, Windalka currently operates between Bodles and um, Bodles Old Harbor to Spanish Town, up to Bogwalk, up to Limstead, up to York and the plant. Currently, we are operating a school train as a pilot project between leaving Linstead to Spanish Town and from Old Arbor to Spanish Town. So that section of track is being maintained currently by Wendalco. We just have a little issue there because, you know, the passenger train will tend to run at a higher speed than the your, your freight train. And therefore, that compromise speed, we need to correct that. And we're in the process, and we are cooperating with Wendalco to ensure that this compromise speed is attained so that we reduce the rail, the wear on the rail, and at the same time increase the speed at which we can travel with our passengers. Because we are looking to re restart the passenger service shortly. Kingston to Spanish Town. We have a very serious challenge with our bridge. I think the minister mentioned the bridge. It's the Rare Cobra Bridge. It's a, a long span bridge, it's about five spans, total, total distance of about 900 feet. The original design was on caissons, other steel caissons, which started to corrode at the splash zone of the river. It was not attended to in the early 80s and reached a situation where the pier literally collapsed in the river. So what we find now is about six piers is down in the riverbed, which needs to be, well, they, they, not, not, it can't be done, be, be resuscitated because the piles are gone. It's a, it was other steel piles and they are shot. So what we have to do is naturally design a new foundation for that bridge, which I don't need to tell you there's a cost of that. It's quite expensive, but it's, we have to get that bridge up if we want to reach the Spanish Town. There are a six girder bridges also between that section, which has to be um, re replaced, but that is a minor because the spans are between 20 to 25 feet, not a big deal. So we think we can achieve that. Our major challenge is going to be that bridge at the, at, um, at the, at the, sorry, not the Rayco, I said San, it's the Sandy Gully Bridge, not the Rayco Bridge. That will be our major challenge. The Sandy, the Rayco Bridge needs some repairs, but that is minor in comparison to what happens at Sandy Gully. The, the rest of the rail system. As the minister said, we had a project going for the tourist train, which is from Montego Bay to Hapleton. The financial studies, the feasibility studies for the financial, the economic viability of this has already been done, is on the table. Um, we are looking to probably restart that sometime soon, but that is for the, um, the cabinet to make a decision on as the way forward with that project. But this has been done, this has been completed. All the numbers are in, it looks good. So we are hoping that this project will get on stream very shortly. 
the rest of the system between Kingston and Spanish, as I said, we need to get the San Gola Bridge up and running. And then between Spanish, between Gregor Park to Spanish Town is fine, but save and accept that there's a lot of steepers, rotten steepers there. Rails has to be in some instances replaced. But that is a that does in terms of um, in terms of civil works, that is minor as comparison to what has to be done between Kingston and Gregor Park. The rest of the track between Bodles going up to Maypen, again, sleepers need to be changed, ballast need to be replaced. Um, we have a couple embankment failures which has to be rebuilt, but that again is not major civil engineering challenges. The section between Maypen and Williamsfield, again, sleepers, ballast. Williamsfield to Greenvale, same situation there. We, just prior to the close of the railway, that section of track was replaced with some rails and some sleepers. L last visit, those are still to seem to be in relatively good shape. But again, once we start by the service, we'll have to go through and ensure that the sleepers are sound and we can look at the speeds that will attract our passenger service. The Port Antonio line. The Port Antonio line suffered tremendous um, during the last, no, no, last, sorry. The hurricane alley which occurred, I think, in, around 1980, where at least five miles of track was devastated. The section in particular between um, what is called as Red, Rodney Orb is about mile 60 to 62. The entire track was washed out for about two miles. Engineering solution provided was to divert the track inwards in, to, to, towards the land side. This was done on paper, started the process, but apparently the soil data at the time that we, we, we got was not, was not adequate. We realized that, um, we saw that um, based on the soil report at the time, that at about 30 feet, you could have solid materials. We dumped down to about 70 feet. This part of the project had to be aborted because it now becomes out of the, um, the realms of um, our pockets. And therefore, that system up, that section of line is there sitting, waiting. The Port Antonio line has other, other challenges. There is the Buff Bay Seawall. This is uh, the rail track, runs right against within, I would say, probably about 50 to 60 feet from the coastline. And those of us who know that side of the country, during the, the, the Northerlies, which happens between January to February, that wall takes a battery. And therefore, during the, our operations, we have to be constantly repairing that seawall. So that needs some attention. Further down towards the Highgate side, there's a river valley of Esher. That again, the, the, corrosion, the erosion of the bank really, really just runs. It constantly has to be constantly under monitoring and repairs because the river literally undermines where the track sits. So major embankment works and revetment works will have to be performed to restore that section of the track. So although the scenic Beauty of Port Antonio is good, but we have some real serious challenges to get back that line in operation. Between Bogwalk and um, Highgate, again, the, most of the rails were badly corroded, and some of it has been taken off. The sleepers has to be replaced. There's bars to, has to be um, replaced. So those, again, is major works in terms of civil. Not challenging works, but expensive works. Finally, the urban area of Kingston and St. Andrew. We primarily was looking at a system of a monorail to get between Kingston, City Kingston as a hub, going up to Papine and to Constant Spring. That project, we looked at it very early days yet, but um, we are getting some numbers, high numbers, but nevertheless, we believe that is a solution for the, the situation of the local transportation sector. Twinned with, of course, with your road transport system. As I said, it's, it's a matter, the approach has to be one of integration, not displacement. If it goes displacement route, then you have a problem. So that's, ladies and gentlemen, that's the way we see the railway system going forward. And I know at this point in time, I'll probably, any questions you may have, I may try and see if I can answer those. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Allen. Um, some very insightful um, thoughts on the current state of railway in Jamaica. Um, it makes for, I won't say de depressing, but um, 
<laughs> challenging uh, <laughs> listening um, in terms of the degradation that has occurred over the years that we've allowed the railway to, to uh, decline. So when Minister Shaw says he wants to bring back the railway, uh, I think Mr. Allen has outlined all the challenges that he will face um, to, to, to bring that to fruition. But nonetheless, um, these problems aren't insurmountable. I think you just need the right motivation and finance, right? Yes, fin finance with that big F, right? Um, are there any questions for Mr. Mr. Allen? Yes, the microphone is just there. Good day, excellent um, presentation. In spite of the information, I think it's, it's evident that the research, the insight is there, and I think we are on a good start because when you know where the problem is, then you can design the solution, and then you take is the place. <laughs> I just want to say um, one of the things that we need, the question I have is, and, and the background is really having been at Illinois, having used the Amtrak train, there is, you know, I've, I've interacted with train, and train is a very, it's a, it's a wonderful um, experience. But we need to figure out what type of services that we are going to offer that will make traveling different. It must be beyond even air traveling and the air, um, flying from one country to another. The, this is something that we need to use as a means of attracting. So how are we going to offer services that are different from, say, JUTCR, the taxi, or even, you know, th this is something that should be a part of our, some heritage, something that is indigenous, Jamaica, Caribbean, you know, something. So we need to consider that. The other concept, question I want to ask is, what are the plans in terms of uh, a national integrated route so I, I'm hearing you speaking of some route, but the interconnection of that plan in terms of the city, the rural train, the, the logistic, that is what I think is missing. How can we really get around the country or get through the country by, by this means and what services are going to be there to attract? Okay, let, let, let me answer this way. First of all, the, the service of the train service can provide is safe. That's the first criteria. It's very safe. If you gauge it against what is currently happening on our roads now, with your minibus and your taxis, we have far surpassed that in terms of safety. That's the first, that's the first plus. The next one is that the matter of fuel. If you look around at the cost of fuel right now in today, you look at the gas prices, continue rising almost on an hourly basis. We are more fuel efficient than the road and the, and the, and the taxis. That's, that's two. In terms of targeting the areas where we currently run, there's a lot of developments within, I say, 15 minutes of a taxi run to the railway station. Take, for instance, Bodles. Just down the road, probably about, I think, about five or so, six miles, is a whole community that has been developed there. And they, they primarily depend on taxis to get them to, say, Bushy Park, Spanish Town, and so on. The train runs right by those stations. So it's a matter of you can move those persons from those communities to, say, borders, they board the train and get to Spanish Town and into Kingston eventually when the rail goes back to Kingston. So at least we can move those persons from those communities to that, so from a central location to part of where the communities lies to the railway station and from the railway station to their destination. So that is our approach. As I said, our two pluses is the safety and the fuel efficiency that we can provide for the country. Junior Bennett, okay. You tech? Okay, so Junior Bennett from UTEC. Right, yes, go ahead. Um, the, the mic is open. Yes, okay. All right. Good afternoon. Michael McFarlane, um, graduate of School of Architecture. I have two questions. One is um, relating to the actual train stations themselves. You've mentioned a lot of work, um, 
a lot of the plans to revive the rail them, rails themselves, but what about plans directing directly towards the train stations? They're, um, you know, their architecture is significant. Um, a lot of them are 100 years and older, and uh, is it a thing where you're going to be utilizing or plan to revitalize all of the stations, all of the stops, or have new stops, new stations in the proposed plans? Okay. Take, for instance, the school project, which we are moving um, the children from Linstead through to Spanish Town and from Old Arbor to Spanish Town. We have refurbished the Old Arbor Station, we have refurbished the Bogwalk Station, we have refurbished the Linstead Station, and we have first Spanish Town. It is not, at the, what I would say, optimal right now in terms of aesthetics and accommodation, but we are getting there. And we plan to, once we start by the service, these stations will be there, because you have to have your passengers in a comfortable surrounding for them to entice, they take the train. So that is part of our plans as well. Right. Second question now. Um, a, lot of, well, a lot of things have been happening in Portmore recently where um, with new things coming into place, you have persons complaining about traffic. I know that at one point there was a, um, more of an interconnected train plan for Portmore itself. Is anything on, on the cars in the future for that? OK. Um, if I get to do, I get myself in trouble. <laughs> Many years ago, we, were, we had proposed to put a train from Gregor Park down, all the way down to Elisha, and we have a reservation there. However, sadly, part of that reservation, we have maybe about 50 or 60 houses on that reservation. So it means that um, we, we still, as I said, by and large, save for that block of houses, the reservation is still intact. So we can get there. And we have done it way back then, we have done the SMS and so on. And as I said, the reservation is there. It's just a matter of implementation and, of course, funding. Yes, go ahead. Your mic's on. Yes, one question to Mr. Halim. When the JRC closed down, that's what, 19, that, that's 92. what, 92. How many people were moving at that time? Do you have a figure? But no, I don't have. Right, because, and you know, how many you want to move should the real resuscitate it? Well, it's an it's a ongoing study, and I think my, uh, my, my peers from the ministry can probably address that more than I could. But I, I, I know it's a significant number. I could not give you a figure. But I'm sure that the, the, in the ministry, they have those, those, those numbers. Because the study was done when we were starting the school train. But I do not know as often how much people in community A, 500 people, community B, 200 people. No, I don't have that figure now. Because in your presentation, you mentioned, especially going east, eh? Yes. The tremendous damage. Yes. Right? And um, I was wondering, why look at those areas? I know those areas you spoke about. Why not, in other words, resuscitate the system and take it where money can be made? Okay. Right, and not just going for heritage or history. I don't know. If I don't, well, you may, you, I don't know if you're familiar, but the eastern side of the railway would usually just mainly move bananas. Right. Not, no. not, 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 not people, people per se. Right, and right. that's done now. Sure right, you mean the bananas. Now, so we so. have to look, what we have probably looked at, and I, I think the gentleman who is responsible, part responsible for this program here today, was looking at resuscitation of those lines. The, the Port Antonio line as a tourism aspect. That's right. where the money could yeah. be made. Right. Because it, as I said, it's a very Antonio, scenic route. All but, the lines. Excuse me? The, the, the train system was designed because we were colonial Jamaica at that time. Yeah. It was supposed to move the plantation produce yes. with not having any. So if you're going to take taxpayers' money and resuscitate, do it with something that can generate the income and that can maintain the system. So we don't hear like 1992, it's not viable. Because what happened in 1992, I think the train was running, but it's not viable. Don't know who says it's not viable, because we haven't seen the figures to prove that. But you know what was viable after that? All the big trailers and stuff that move in things. And guess what happened? Our bridges suffer, because all the way bridges that we had in Jamaica became obsolete. You know that to go over a certain bridge with these tandem axles. Nobody's paying. We had that Arborview, we had that ferry. The ferry one was obsolete, so people can load any, no regulations whatsoever. And then we talk about our roads get damaged. 
right? So we shut the railway to damage our roads for a sector to gain, make economic gain by their tractor trailers. Thank you. I don't think I need to answer. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, 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 well, well, the minister isn't here, but you, you say you should have waited. You should waited until he left. He ran away. He ran away. <laughs> okay. Next question. Yeah. Good day, everyone. Uh, Stephen Roden, Associate Vice President, Caribbean Maritime University. Um, well, first and foremost, I'd like to thank all of the speakers that I've heard so far. Unfortunately, I have to head out shortly. Um, I'm, a main part of your talk, Mr. Allen, and thank you for your presentation, uh, was on the comfort and speed and, and, and more or less the, 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 um, the, the, what you can offer as a product. Yes? Um, and I'm linking this now to Trans Jamaica National Highway, a company that had an IPO. I'm linking this to um, Nutswood Express, a bus company that had an IPO. You know, it, is this something that we can think about doing? Um, to, to revitalize, rehabilitate, and also, you know, you know, uh, you know, as one of my colleagues mentioned about, you know, the U.S. and Amtrak, but if you, you know, you've been to Japan, you've seen the Shinkansen. Um, if you've been to China, there's high-speed rails as well. You know, is this something that we're thinking about? Yeah, but as I said, um, naturally, we are constrained by our terrain in, in, in certain instances in terms of high-speed train, and the minister mentioned this morning, so we had also looked at that, of using particularly the Senegal course to probably institute a monorail system or something like that, you could really get them some good speeds. So you could probably get somebody from Constant Spring downtown within 10 minutes. Um, but outside of that, for between Kingston and say Montego Bay and the current corridor that we currently operate, is a challenge. As I said, up to Port is about 46 miles from Kingston, you probably will be fine in terms that you could probably look at operating speeds between and between 40 to 60 miles per hour. Once you get past porous, you're constrained by the curvature. We are looking at 3% and probably sometime in isolated areas, more than 3% curvature, which means that you cannot operate at more speed than about 20 miles per hour if you are to look at the balancing speed. And even at 20 miles per hour, we're at our maximum super elevation can at 6 per 6 inches. So you are constrained there. When you leave Poros for another, another 10 miles, you are still constrained. So it means that if you are to look at high-speed train from Kingston, say, Montego Bay, you look at a new alignment. You're probably looking at elevated structures. I don't even want to even fathom to think of the cost of doing that. So because of the geography of our country, unless we're going to go on the coastline, which has really developed, where it's a little bit flat, and even to get there, you're going to have to get some mount. You have to go across the country again. You look, again, you're looking at some serious curvatures and serious gradients. So our geography of the country is a constraint for us, and the current system that we have now, the current alignment that we have, we can't look at more speed than, unless you are going to probably go elevate the structure. Um, Dr. Stevens, thanks for joining us from CMU. Um, Hope we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> All right, well, um, very lively conversation there, uh, Mr. Mr. Allen. Thank you very much for your presentation. So um, we're going to keep going because of time, and we're still waiting for lunch. So we're going to go straight into session two, which looks at the international experience. Um, you, heard, you heard some of the challenges outlined by the, our friends from the bauxite industry and also the national, ex, national experience from um, the JRC. So now we're going to hear about possible solutions and international uh, case studies. So um, it gives me pleasure to welcome back to the stage Professor Clive Roberts. He'll be speaking about building and operating railways international experience. I think you've got 10 minutes or thereabouts? 10 minutes, okay. <laughs> well, when, whenever lunch turns up. Okay, well, tell me, tell me, tell me when lunch is here. So, um, right, um, thank you, everyone. So um, I'm going to put a bit more 
um, meat on the bone of the, um, the things I spoke about, about earlier. Um, there's, there's quite a few slides here, so um, what I suggest is uh, we come up with a way of being able to circulate some of the slides afterwards if we, we don't, don't talk about them all. So um, I started this train of thought earlier by saying it's, it's all about systems. We need all of the um, parts, the components of the railway in order to work together, and, and that's what we've been talking about, actually, over... There was just a, a comment that somebody said, we need to think clearly about the kinds of services we want to operate, because that really helps define um, the kind of infrastructure, the kind of speeds that we need, all of those things come from very clearly the demand that there is for, for, for rail transport. Um, in terms of just that business part of this, um, the freight type services have the real potential to provide a, a baseline utilization um, and putting passenger services and tourist services on top of that is, is quite a, quite a good, good model. Um, I can see some of you looking at this, this, this diagram, uh, this, um, <laughs> This, this, this piece of railway, this is um, south of London, out of, out of Waterloo, um, quite a complex piece of, of railway. Um, right, so um, one of the things to say about uh, railways, and we've talked about some of these um, earlier, is that they generally have many phases. As, as we were talking about um, with the regeneration of the lines in Jamaica, we'll be talking about doing stuff on, on the infrastructure, um, repairing structures. We've been hearing about bridges that have failed at Sandy Gully. Um, we'll be thinking about what we do with the rolling stock, so a number of different phases. Um, railways geographically have a spread, so from um, in, in the context of our discussions today, from Kingston to Montego Bay, and it's likely that there's distributed staff and different people in different places. I note for the, the, the reserve train for the school run, um, the school service, um, that that's having to be moved um, to from, from Kingston um, in the near future, and that makes things very difficult moving things around. Um, even for small projects, um, there's lots of different parts involved, lots of different subsystems are required in order to make the railway work. We need to link to existing systems, so we've been talking about links to, to bus systems and other transport systems. Um, we've been talking about things crossing different communities and jurisdictions, um, whether that's uh, across um, where people may have taken sort of ownership or informal ownership of, of parts of the land or, 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 or where, for example, we were, we were talking about um, curvature and I don't think anyone mentioned the, the actual word, but rail squeal where you get particular noises from the trains of, 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 um, that, that may, may not be particularly pleasant if you haven't heard a train go past your house for 30 years. And then in terms of actually building railways, so, for example, we've just built um, the Crossrail line in, in, in London, um, which is huge development um, across the city. There's actually disturbances as the railway's built. And we have similar things for HS2. If you travel to big Chinese cities as they've been building metros, it's, it looks like a big construction site for about three years while that happens. So how do you engage um, with those urban work sites? So one of the th ways that we do this is we talk about systems engineering. Systems engineering is not just a, um, something for the rail industry. It's something that started in the military and aerospace sectors to help deal with those complexity issues. And, and what we, we're doing here is trying to understand large, complicated, and complex systems. And we try and deal with all of those interdisciplinary interacting components all at the same time and have what we call systems thinking, thinking about the whole, thinking about how we, we make the best of the components to get the, the overall capability, the overall outcome that we require. Now, what's interesting in terms of projects that generally go wrong um, is, is the bit that goes wrong is the first bit, is actually the lack of user input. It's the incomplete requirements of not knowing what we're trying to do. It's starting a project and then changing your mind about what you're trying to do. So what I would say is that we're in the most critical stage, actually, of the Jamaican project as it, in its current formation because this is the bit that needs to go, go well. If we get this wrong, we start off building the wrong thing and having to change our minds. Or if we're not engaging with the users sufficiently well, we don't actually know what, what people would want to use. And, and when we talk about users, think about passengers, but also think about people who may want to move things by freight. Think about 
people that want to develop tourism or people that want to, to get um, social engineering in terms of um, bringing, bringing parts of, 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 of Jamaica back into uh, a, a more economic development. So, so that is a really important stage um, at this stage in a project is getting that user input, then making sure we understand the requirements. And these are not the requirements about what the gauge should be or how the track should look. This is what do people want out of the system and then making sure that we try and stick with that plan rather than keep changing it. So you've seen this diagram before. Um, this high level, we're here, I think, in the, in the things we've been talking about today. We've, we're saying we, we want to do something with, with the Jamaican railways. Um, there is some early work that's gone on in this stakeholder requirement stage, i.e. what is it that needs to happen? And that then should inform the system requirements of do, are, are the speeds sufficient for what we actually need the service for? Um, does the railway actually go to the right place? Um, do, are, are, are stations in the right place? All of those sorts of things. And from that, we move into actually deciding what that physically means. So does that physically mean we need to have some, some rolling stock that goes at faster speeds? Or does that mean we need a different traction system? Does that mean we need to um, change the sleeper type or, or fix the, the rails to the sleepers in a different way? So this is, this is where we decide all of those, all those things we're going to do we firstly need to decide what it is we want to do and why we want it. Um, and that will, that will steer this stuff down here. So I, I, I do a sort of three hour version of this lecture, but fundamentally the takeaway message, <laughs> the takeaway message from this is you need to decide what you want to do before you actually decide what the solution is. That, that, that is really important. If you start trying to design railways without understanding why you're designing them or what you want, you will get, get it wrong, you'll spend a lot of money, and there's a danger you build the wrong thing. Um, and then there's how we integrate this all back together. And actually, there's lots of big projects um, around the world where the integration of projects and things back together hasn't gone very well. I mentioned Crossrail in London um, is a, a good example where there's been developed a very complicated and complex railway, and this system integration phase has gone poorly. Um, these lines across this diagram show that this stuff on the left is all good value because it helps you do the stuff on the right. And it should, if you do this stuff correctly, it should make the right-hand side easier. And, and then we're up in deployment and use and operation and maintenance, which we probably won't get to before lunch, but we will get to in some, some of the slides. <laughs> right, so um, systems engineering helps us cope with that complexity, managing real-world changing issues, Railways take a moderately long time as an infrastructure project, so things just change during that lifetime. So how do we, how do we deal with that? Um, considering the whole problem, we've been talking about that, and the whole system, the whole life cycle, I touched on that earlier, thinking about making sure we design a railway that is good for, to be maintained. It's not a just build it, it's very shiny, and then it's just going to deteriorate very quickly and, and be very expensive to operate. And we need to build that into the design. Um, we need some robust solutions. We need to build the right system and um, uh, building the system right. So that's verification and validation. And generally, people um, I, I identify that systems engineering, these sorts of processes, can save you some money. And um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Kevin will be familiar with some of these from the aerospace sector in terms of systems engineering and the work in this area. And then this system integration issue, as I've already hinted at, is how do things come together, not just on day one when you want the railway to operate for the first time, but for that entire life cycle. And how do we link those components and make them, make them work for, forever? So this is really important um, in terms of actually building, realizing a railway. It's the bit you can get wrong. As I said, this is the, the key part, actually. The next year or so in this project is the key part as people work out what it is actually that's required. If you don't get that right, you'll end up with the wrong system. And none of this is new. Um, this is something from 1928, from the, the guy who was the chief executive of the Great Western Railway um, in, in Britain, the main line between London and, 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 and Bristol, Cardiff. Um, and he said at that time, maximum efficiency in railway operations can only be obtained when the several departments responsible for the various components freely cooperate and try to understand one another's problems. Maximum departmental efficiency may not always coincide with that of the railway, railway as a whole, and no department should gain efficiency at the expense of another. So fundamentally, if you don't maintain your rail wheels, you won't have a very good track, and if you don't look after various parts of the system, 
um, the other parts will fail. So, um, so that's really important as we, build, as we think about a, a railway. Um, now I want to talk a bit about how to, how to, how to build, a, build a railway. Um, and this is really some of those things with a little bit more, more detail around them and to sh try and tell you the tensions. So um, there are different types of railway, and this, this, this sort of model version here is talking about different freight, a higher speed line, a more intercity, a, a sort of commuter service, and, and more of a light rail tram type system. Again, saying we want this type of railway without knowing why we're building it is the wrong answer. We're coming back to that V, we really need to understand what kind of railway we want and what are the problems we're trying to address. So are we trying to have social inclusion, urban mobility, countrywide transportation, removals of car trucks for the road, so freight, decarbonisation of transport. So all of these things need to be really understood. And, and I guess importantly, because we, we started to talk about finance, understanding what some of these things are worth and making sure that the, 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 the gen generally people borrow money for railways. So <laughs> dependent, uh, understanding um, how you might repay that sort of that, that, that borrowing and or who might give you the money to, for example, do very good things about decarbonisation. So um, good things around decarbonisation are likely to generate um, money rather than tourist trade. So, so a, a business case that's under, uh, uh, got an under underwritten by, by freight may well be a really good way of raising the finance. And then the, the tourist type stuff is sort of icing on the cake um, and, and, and revenue fund that can, can, can keep the railway going once that baseline um, load is, is taken care of. Um, just carrying with that theme of different types of trains, um, different types of um, trains will um, um, have different sort of car car uh, people carrying capabilities. So this is off the back the bottom of here, and I can't remember what it is. I think it's people per hour per direction, I think. Uh, um, and um, this is just showing how many people you might carry on a system. It's mainly metro, but you know, depending on the type of railway you'll have will depend on the speed and the type of people you can carry. But this is the bit I wanted to, to try and explain at this stage, perhaps in proceedings. And we've started to talk about this already but perhaps not trying to visualise it, or some of you may not be visualising it quite in the same way. We, we have this tension between um, what we might do in the rail railway between rolling stock, the infrastructure, we've been hearing about curvature of tracks, limiting um, the speed, which limits the timetable, which limits the journey time, all of these things. You can imagine all of these sort of areas, the rolling stock, the timetable, the operation of timetable, all pulling a rope in a different direction and, and, and you get your triangle in a slightly different shape, but somehow these things need to align. And there are things we can change on a railway, but there are only certain periods of time in which we can change them. So for example, in a short term, we can change things like timetables, we can change the number of staff and how long they work, we can perhaps try and um, cancel a train or we can run an extra train if we've got it available. We can make the, um, the opening time of the controllers a bit longer. We can perhaps do something about the maintenance and we can perhaps change the cost. But we can't, we can't build a new railway quickly. We can't get a new train. Um, we can only do certain things on a short term to change our railway. So here in our triangle, fundamentally, we have quite a lot of control over the timetable in a short term. So we can, we can change that timetable, we can establish better connections, we can reduce how long trains take to stop, and we can do various things. And we, we can do that by issuing a new timetable, making sure we've got the crew and the stock um, to, to run this. Now, in the medium term, um, we can rework the whole timetable, so rip it up and start again. We can perhaps bring on more staff, but we're going to have to train them. We can get rid of staff if we don't, or don't need them. Um, we can um, buy or, or lease extra vehicles. Um, in, in, in Britain and in many countries around the world, um, banks own the rolling stock and the train operating companies lease them, they rent them. Um, there are actually international um, capabilities of doing that. Um, so um, new rolling stock does not necessarily have to be bought, it could be leased. So you can arrange that, there's some sat somewhere, you can bring it here and, and start operating it. 
Um, you can perhaps restructure how you sell tickets. You can change how you maintain, so have better maintenance equipment. We we're talking about track geometry type equipment. We we're talking about perhaps tampers that, that maintain the track here. We can lower or raise the line speed. We can change how we um, have bottlenecks. So here, that would be passing loops. And most of the things we can do probably in the medium term are do things about rolling stock. And then longer term issues tend to lie with infrastructure. And they're around putting in new routes or closed routes, creating new junctions. We've just been talking about elevated tracks where there's lots of curvature around particular areas. That would take you a long time, but would add an awful lot of, of benefit. But that's going to be driven by that long-term demand forecasting and rail economics, government strategies, and, and availability of funding, which is, you know, again, exactly the conversation we're having. And so that looks like this. That looks like infrastructure really driving um, that, that triangle. So we're, we're looking um, now at better alignments, lower gradients. There's not about anything about curvature, but less curvature would be something in here, um, and um, various other things. So what we would do if we were designing a railway in that systems approach is we would identify the demand, that's the requirements, the stuff at the top of the V, making sure that we asked all the stakeholders. If we didn't ask the stakeholders, there's a high risk that things aren't going to go well. We'd start to think about the service patterns and the times we want to run. If the service from Kingston to Montego Bay takes eight hours, then um, we're probably going to have a lot less people using it than if it takes an hour and a half. But there is a balancing act here of what we can afford. We'd start to design the infrastructure, the gradients, the curves, the station. And then we'd decide what kind of rolling stock we could operate on there. And obviously here, there's sort of some of these things are, are pseudo given because they exist a bit. But you can fit around this sort of um, this, this, this loop of, of activity. You can start to design your, your railway, making sure, and this is the takeaway message, making sure that you understand why you're doing this. What are you trying to solve? What problems are you trying to solve? What services are you trying to provide? If you just start by saying, I've got some trains and I'd like to start running them, you probably will end up with the wrong solution. Um, the other thing is um, railway capacity um, and how do we get more trains down the track? I mean, I didn't ask um, our, our friends from the Bauxite Company about um, the capacity of the track. I, I think you mentioned eight trains a day and, and I guess it's single track. So is, is your railway full or not? You've got some capacity, I imagine. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so you, you've got you've got some flex there, but it, that that sounds to, to many of you that perhaps aren't experienced in railways, that sounds not very many trains, but it's quite a full railway because of the geography and the layout of the track. Um, so, the first thing is is numbers of tracks and passing loops and those sorts of things, um, because that's going to define capacity either meaning how many trains you get down the railway or how many people you're moving or how many tons of goods you're moving down the railway. Um, things like signalling will help because it enables you to run trains closer together. You can perhaps flight more trains to Clever. What The flexibility of junctions. Um, if you have different types of trains, so on our main lines in the UK, we have higher speed trains and then we have local commuter trains. That really eats capacity, and, and the freight trains are even, even worse. Things about train length, the ability of them to accelerate, all of this has some, um, how much room there is on the trains, whether everyone's going to have loads of space or sit very close together, how long it stops, which stations it stops at, and how long it stops at them, um, and different people use different measures. But fundamentally, railway capacity is a really important part of this, because you quite, if you get the wrong solution, you quite quickly eat all of your capacity. And there's a ways of doing this analysis. I showed you some things from HS2 with trains moving around um, imaginary railways earlier. But fundamentally, this boils down to something called a, 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 a staircase graph, these sorts of capacity graphs, which is showing this one here. I can't remember this. Is, um, so this is showing a train going one, two, three, four, five. So oh no, one, two, three, five. So into this passing loop and the train um, coming in the other direction, leaving 4321. 
and then there's train C going two, three, two, three, four. And this basically shows the maximum weight. It's a bit like Tetris. If you're good at Tetris, you'll be good at railway timetabling. Um, it shows you um, how you can fix the trains together to maximize the utilization of capacity. But the point why I'm mentioning this is the point is if you make slightly longer passing loops or you add a passing loop, that may unlock more capacity on your railway. And that kind of analysis is probably worth thinking about here early on rather than after you've been running services for two years and realize it doesn't quite work. So um, again, coming back to that short, medium term, if you've got an existing railways, there's certain things you can do by just being tightening on performance. So dispatch times in the case of a freight railway, um, making sure the drivers drive in a more consistent approach. There isn't variation in that. Um, perhaps things around how you manage the railway. Um, in, a, in a medium term, it's about better planning. Um, it's about rolling stock changes, various things. But then in the longer term, it's like uh, about mainly making changes to infrastructure and rolling stock. And I, I imagine the guys here who are operating railways could tell you where they've got capacity constraints, where maybe there's a junction that if they, they could go through it quite slightly faster or if the passing loop was slightly longer, they would be able to get more out of their railway. So that's the kind of analysis you want to do here. Um, and there's lots of solutions, and we try and think about which ones are best depending on, on the kind of railway we run. And again, that all depends back to our requirements. Can I keep going? Yes? Yeah, no, no lunch yet, right, okay. <laughs> right, um, so thinking about, a bit about future technology that helps with some of these things, um, there's lots of technologies that can, can help with this, this sort of stuff. So um, in terms of visualizing the build of the railway, um, lots of BIM type modeling, as, uh, so building information management, the types of things that are used to build new construction we do for railways, and you can see where the, the cables are going to be and what, what's going to happen, and, and we, we haven't mentioned it very much, but the drainage, one of the things I noted yesterday, actually, when I saw the, the um, uh, when, when I went to um, Kingston Terminus, was actually the drainage wasn't too bad. It was actually in quite good condition compared with what it might be. Um, drainage is a really big thing for railways. You were hearing earlier that things had been swept away and various things. So key, water management's really key. So anyway, you can do all of that sort of stuff in BIM. Um, there's modern technologies, as we've talked about already, around zero carbon and the kind of things we can do there. There's clever things we can do about mobile ticketing that most people are quite used to now. But yesterday, again, when I went to um, um, the, the Kingston, Terminus, I was lucky enough to be given some, some 1992 tickets. Yeah, I think it might take quite a long time to, to wait for the next train to come, but, but um, maybe you don't want to be using paper tickets. You want to be using something like this going, going forward. Um, what else have we got here? Um, we've been talking, you saw some gauges earlier um, for measuring wheel profiles. Um, maybe a modern way of doing that is using a, a laser type approach. Um, you also um, heard a little bit about using accelerometers to measure track geometry. Um, this is the high speed one line. So the line from, um, I think it is, isn't it? It's the line from, yes, it is. It's the line from London to Paris, um, um, the UK side, the England side, and um, showing the track quality in those areas on a map. Um, there's modern ways of controlling and understanding where the trains are. We were hearing earlier about a station master's role, but there's some, some ways of visualizing that. And then here, there's some things about maintenance and asset management of the track. So these are sort of modern technologies that could probably help day-to-day -day operation, reduce those life cycle costs, would give a step change so that you, you weren't in the stage of reinvigorating a 1980s way, railway, you were building a, a 2020s railway and actually doing a technology jump rather than just resurrecting things. And research is important um, to that. Um, I think I've shown you this picture on the right before um, around um, uh, the hydrogen train at COP26. But what I wanted to show you and, and one of the strengths of the relationship that we're, we're forming with the University of Technology here um, in Jamaica is how we can help feed that research through. And there's a few things that have already come into my head. I was talking about the energy profiles and the driver advisory type systems where we have some of these early papers and work where we've got that and we could actually quite quickly move them into systems that could be developed and, and, and used here in Jamaica. Um, we've always already been talking again about um, 
inertial measurement units to, to measure the track. So, so what this is trying to show is that people in universities like us um, and, and UTEC write papers about stuff. And then what we do is we get students to, to have a go at these things. And then we probably do something that's a, a first in kind test on, the, on a real railway, which is like this. And then we end up with something where we're in the next stage where we're turning that into a product. And one of the things my group at Birmingham's got really good at is going all the way from there. So instead of just writing papers and then them sitting on somebody's shelf and nobody ever reading them again, what we are proactively doing is trying to drive that through to making some impact and difference at the end, it being used on, on, on the real world. So again, one, you know, we're, we're really keen to collaborate here in Jamaica for many reasons, but one also of those reasons is to make sure that our research gets implemented in different places in the world. Um, um, in the UK, one of the things we have is the rail technology strategy. I'm one of the authors of this. You can um, find the rail technology strategy. There's a website somewhere, and it's called railtechnicalstrategy.org, I think, um, which um, has helped the, is helping the UK industry to define what research, what innovation it needs to do over the next five years. So what it does is it brings together the key stakeholders, this one's me, uh, Network Rail, our infrastructure managers, RSSSB, RSSB, who are the safety and standards people, the rail delivery group, are who are the train operating companies, and then the Rail Industry Association, who are the, the suppliers, the supply chain. And together, um, we have written a, a strategy that says, in order to realize the things we want to do on our railway in the next five years, these are the technology things we need to develop. And then the things that we need for our 30 year vision, um, these are the things we need to develop for that. And it's a, it's a fairly straightforward document involved talking to lots of people. But what it means is that we're focusing the efforts and me and the university are able to focus the, my team in the right area to develop the technologies that we need in the, in the UK. Um, this is quite a big job from a UK perspective, but I think there could actually be some benefit in in a Jamaican version of this that may actually be a much light or would be a much lighter thing, but really understand that in the next five years we want to be here or the next three years. In order to get there, these are the things that we don't have that we could develop. And that would really help um, O'Neill and the guys here at the university focus um, the effort. It would also actually help me to do the knowledge transfer into, 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 the, into, into Jamaica to, to help that, that area. And I, I guess it's probably worth just saying an additional point in that story. In the UK um, version, we're also thinking about export. Um, and I think you probably have the same thing here. You might think about what you need in Jamaica, but you might think about what you need in the, in the local Caribbean area, in other, other countries that, you know, we, we saw a picture of the railway in St. Kitts. Are there things that could be developed here that you could then transfer into other railways of a similar kind in your local region? So, so this um, focuses, this technical strategy focuses on, on five areas, which are our key challenges at the moment in the UK, which is ease to use for all. So this is about um, people just being feeling that they can use the railway. Um, so in the railway, we, in the UK, we have a lot of railway, but actually only about 12% of the population use the railway on a regular basis. Um, how do we broaden that pool of people that would want to use the railway? Um, how do we tackle the low emissions problems? How do we optimize train operations? So that's about making sure that we make use best use of the rolling stock. We optimize that capacity. This is the, the strand I'm actually responsible for. How do we have a reliable and easy to ma maintain railway? We've been talking about that. And then how do we make better use of all the data we have and make more informed decisions? And then there's some enablers that we're working on, which is a business-driven innovation. So basically only innovating things that, that have a commercial benefit. That's what makes sense. Making sure we, we, we get innovation quickly enough, and then making sure that we have the right workforce, which is mainly about a digitally um, enabled workforce so that so people can cope with the digital skills. And what we're trying to achieve are happy customers, um, a vibrant supply sector. So what we want is we want the likes of Siemens and people to stay in the UK and want to, want to be there. We want a stronger society and economy, which is about um, um, uh, uh, just our activity, and we want a better environment. So just again, on a, on a sort of page setting out 
why we're doing this stuff. That's that very high level objective stuff. And then having a clearer strategy of why we're doing it is, 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 is important. You can, the website here is www.railtechnicalstrategy.co.uk. And you'll see some um, sort of um, master plans on one side of A4 for each of these areas that says what we're trying to do and what the dependencies are. Right, OK. Um, so um, you've seen something a bit like this earlier. Um, can you start the video for me? Sorry. So I'm just going to show some technologies and some ideas, and this is just a, a different set of stories, really, over some, a couple of things you've seen before. This, this railway is in India. Um, this is a 300-kilometer stretch of railway that is being... Um, the Indian railways want to re-signal, and um, they'd um, looked at uh, 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 going to a supplier to get this and realized they had a third of the amount of money that they needed that, to what the supplier wanted to charge them. And so what we've been doing is doing simulations of this to trade off the cost versus the capability. So if they want a very shiny gold-plated railway, fundamentally they can't afford it. Um, but there's things that we can do around, this is around signaling, but there's things that we can do in terms of the signaling design, perhaps not fitting all of the trains, perhaps changing the timetable, using that systems thinking um, in certain places, actually just extending bits of passing loop rather than, than, than trying to re-signal. And we've managed to come down to a solution that gives most of the benefit they were looking for, but at a third of the cost. So that we can, we can... The wonderful thing about these digital tools is we don't build a railway and then realize that we did it wrong. We can, we can do it. We can have many, many goes at building these railways. And, and one of the things I'm, I'm keen to talk to the UTEC guys about is whether they might be able to build models a bit like this for, for, for the local railway here. Um, they would be really nice tools to be able to use. This is our own software, so this is it's a Birmingham simulation tool. We write most of our simulation tools ourselves, um, which makes it easier to, to let other people use them. Um, and um, it, um, um, th this is now being used for HS2, so it's sort of commercial standard software. There isn't anything else that does this sort of stuff. Um, so this is sort of cutting-edge research, but we really used to use our cutting-edge research on projects that have a, you know, a, a social impact. This is something else we're doing. I'm not sure this is a technology for... for for, for here it might be, I don't know, but this is work we're doing for um, rail breaks or, or rail cracks, so gauge corner cracking. So this is a, a, a robot that goes along on its own. You just saw it move along. And when it finds a crack, there's a robot head here that then um, I, um, is able to visualize and see that crack. So um, the idea of this is to take people off of the track, working on the track, and use some of these... I call it a drone. When I say drone, you think of flying things. But I, this is a rail drone in my head. Um, it's a piece of equipment that will go along on its own and um, assess um, some of the, the issues that we have in, 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 uh, that may lead to rail breaks and things like that. No, um, so this is a, an eddy current solution. It's something called an ACFM um, solution. But So what we have here is an EMAT system. So this is a catch pitch. So, so there's a a signal coming out of here and then being caught here. And if there's a small crack, we're talking about cracks um, five millimeters in the rail, something like that, then it will deflect the electromagnetic Rayleigh wave that's riding in the top of the, 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 the rail, and you will be able to detect that change. Um, the cart then stops, and then we do this detailed scan with the robot arm. So this will work at 30 or 40 kilometers an hour and whiz along. But then when we want, so that will do the detection, and then this does the characterization. It will be the same, again, it will be the same sort of, well, it is the same sort of um, non-destructive testing as people use in other sectors. We just deploy it in a different way here. Um, and then um, a bit about managing assets. I've mentioned this a, a, a few times, um, that it's important that we design into our, and understand when we're designing our railway, how we're actually going to look after the railway. So asset management is really, really important. Um, there's a couple of, well, there's a, a, a standard that many railways around the world are now using for asset management. So this standard ISO 50, uh, 55000, it used to be called PASS 55 in Britain. Um, but what we're trying to do is um, look at the co coordinated activities and practices um, to optimally and sustainably, and sustainably is important here, manage assets and asset systems so that over their entire life cycle and that you have a strategic plan for that. Fundamentally, you know how you're going to look after your assets and, 
and make sure that they're not going to all fall apart at the same time. You can manage your budgets. Um, it's a, a coordinated activity for an organization to make sure you get the value from the assets and you understand how you're going to be looking after them going forward. There's a couple of standards that, that do that. Um, and I guess there's, there's four main pillars um, to the things that we're talking about here. We're talking about getting value from the assets we have, so how we use them. There's a, a part about leadership and culture, making sure the organization's right. Um, there's an, a, a part about aligning the strategy of the business with the asset management. And then there's about assurance or risk, avoid, or risk reduction, if you like, in terms of making sure that through this asset management strategy, you've got a better understanding. And one day, a bridge isn't going to fall down, and, 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 and then you haven't got a railway anymore. It's, 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 it's basically trying to make sure you're on top of those risks. This is just very complicated, but it basically says <laughs> um, there's a load of things up here which are about just um, understanding um, how your railway compares with other railways. There's some stuff here about making sure you're, you're, you're monitoring what you're doing. You, you know, the first step is knowing what assets you have. Um, the next is then um, how you might optimize that. Um, and then um, really just understanding um, that you're uh, managing your, your risk, as we were talking about. But there's, there's a, a unified process for doing this. So we talk about different types of assets. There's, there's obviously the physical assets, and you're, I'm sure you're all sat there thinking about track and trains and various things, but you're probably not thinking about some of these things like data, um, the brand reputation, the goodwill of the customers, those sorts of things that you quite quickly lose. So we, we are thinking about both types of assets here when I'm talking in this space. So um, we've talked about all of this sort of stuff already, but um, there's lots of things. Uh, is there anything we haven't talked about? I'm not sure. Um, we've definitely talked about stations and buildings of importance. Um, we've talked about infrastructure, including bridges. And we haven't talked. About, have you got tunnels on your network here? Are there any? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. They'll, they'll need some looking after. Um, so tunnels, um, signalling, and electrification. We don't need to worry about the electrification. The signalling um, certainly at the moment is is is, is fairly straightforward. Um, how we manage property and, and land, um, the rolling stock, um, that data that tells us about the, the condition, including where the assets are and what they are, um, and all sorts of other different assets as well. And what we're trying to achieve through this from a business point of view is um, how can we reduce the operational cost, defer the cost of renewal, or actually even eliminate the cost altogether. And this is really important because... Um, you could invest in a railway, and in five years' time, you, we've been talking about, uh, people have mentioned today about spares, inventory problems. Um, if you went and bought a load of new rail, I was in um, Thailand a few years ago, three or four years ago, and they'd, had, they'd got some 10-year-old rolling stock from Siemens, and they no longer had any spares for those, that rolling stock, and they were having to, to, to basically get rid of them and looking to replace them very, very early just because of the spares inventory. So how can we, we think about some of this? How can we spend less on assets and achieve our targets? How can we get better returns on the capital we employed? How can we avoid the risk of assets being unavailable when we need them? How can we demonstrate the levels of assets related risk unknown and appropriate? And how can we improve the deployment of maintenance of assets? All of those questions are good questions to be able to answer. They're difficult questions to be able to answer and you need a unified process to do this. So. We've been talking today about you know, the fact that there might be some money or there will be some money needed to open railways. Yes, that's very true. But it's equally, if not more important, that there's money or there's an understanding of the ongoing operational costs and that money isn't wasted, it's optimised. So asset management and the processes that I've been talking about here um, are the way, way to do that. And there's lots of benefits in terms of reliability, safety, um, the reputation, managing our risks, um, making better decisions, um, the social responsibility, um, improved services, making sure that they're safe and compliant, extending the life. This is really important, making sure that your, your assets last you 30 or 40 years. Um, that obviously helps financially um, in all sorts of different ways. And if you don't do this, you've fundamentally got a safety risk, uh, a reputational risk, and a financial risk to your organization. Um, and we, you need to get on top of this as a railway organization. 
So none of this is the sexy stuff about, you know, trains and bridges, and, and it, but it's really important in terms of keeping things going. I can do three minutes, I think. Yep. Um, and then um, just saying a little bit as an example about social sort of um, development. This is a different type of project. This is our high-speed rail project in the UK. So we're investing an awful lot of money, too much money, um, in terms of building a new railway um, line from, from London into Birmingham and up to Manchester. But the point of this, it, we can justify the money because it will serve one in five of the 70 million people that live in, in Britain. Um, it will create 100,000 jobs um, 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 directly. Um, and um, the, the interesting thing I was talking about is earlier, 70% of the jobs created are, 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 are north of London, basically. So they're, they're in the areas of, of Britain that, that needs more social um, benefit and, and, and development. So, yes, it's a railway, but actually lots of those things on the top left of my diagram for about HS2 are not about having infrastructure, they're about these things, about how do we create jobs, how do we um, free up capacity for freight on the other railway lines. They're, they're, all, they're not the things you would obviously think of. Oh, yeah, well, uh, uh, and so you've seen the simulation, we don't need to see that again. But, um, and, and so it's about productivity and between cities. Um, if in the city I live, Birmingham, which is Britain's second city, um, already we're seeing the, the railway isn't open yet. It's not due to open for another 10 years, maybe. Um, but already businesses are moving to Birmingham. Um, HSBC now has its um, um, UK headquarters there. Um, Deutsche Bank, uh, so banking is moving out of London to our city because the railway is coming. It's really quite incredible. I mean, it's one of the things I, I teach about and talk about, but I'm now seeing it in my own city and, and it's true um, in terms of, um, you know, really observing those, those, those and th they're not jobs in, in cafes, they are banking jobs, they're engineering jobs that are being created in a different place to where they were being created before. Um, so we end up with higher living standards, higher money and, and, and exports, um, we're spreading those opportunities um, and we're creating local benefit um, and also education and, and opportunities. So just to give you an idea in terms of workforce, so this is going to come on to workforce now. Um, um, uh, so in terms of where we're spending money, so this is a percentage of the amount of money we're spending on infrastructure. We spend about 37% of our money on infrastructure um, on transport in the UK. The other big sector here is, is energy at the moment. And um, what this says is we have a long bank of, of railway um, projects but this is the map I wanted to show you. This says um, where we're going to create jobs and what, how many jobs, and you can see that they're in these parts of the UK. So we know and understand that although we're building a railway line that goes from London to Manchester, actually the benefit in terms of jobs are in these areas, which are really good areas to be creating jobs. So um, that's, that's, that's a good thing. Oh, oh wrong way. Oh, it stopped. Oh, there we go. Um, and then just say about something about people and skills. Um, so in terms of this, this means over the next five years, we need about 68,000 apprentices across infrastructure. So a lot of young people need training. This is what they need training in. So lots of things about digital construction, stuff about rail, you can, you can read as well as I can read it. And um, we know the sectors that we need to train these in. So one of the things I talked about education at the beginning, one of the things I'm really keen and we're keen to do is make sure we educate the right people for the projects in five years' time so that we have them ready. And so this sort of analysis helps us understand that we need um, um, lots of civil engineers. Um, we also need lots of people that can do scaffolding, um, logistics. Somebody wanted to do logistics, come, come into, there's jobs. Construction trade supervisors, civil engineers, you can see where people are needed. And so at my university, what we're trying to do is we're trying to do two things. We're trying to fill those gaps, and then we're also trying to create system thinkers who can help with that whole project. So we have a whole array of, project, um, of education programs from school level right up to doctorate that we deliver either in our own school, um, in, in CATI, that further education college I spoke about, or at the university. 
And we have students from all over the world, so actually 40 countries now. Um, there are people that have, have, have graduated from our railway programs. Um, and as I said, we have the colleges, the two colleges that are producing those, those vocational skills as well. It's, it's a very small number of degree people you need, really. You need lots of people that have got good, capable skills for working on the track, problem solving, advanced technician type level qualifications are the important qualifications here. And that's the end. Right, okay, it's lunchtime. <laughs> well, um, I, uh, no, I'll do questions over lunch. You'll do questions. Is, are there any ur urgent questions? Um, are you, yes, there is one. Go ahead. Not urgent, but it's a question. <laughs> um, Jamaica has a small economy. The ability of our government to fund such you know, large projects is, is limited. For sure. What I'm asking is, is there any kind of creative contractual arrangement that was used in the UK? We could use it as an, as, an, as an example yes, and I think that gonna, we could employ here? I think we're going to talk about this later. So I think um, fundamentally there's, there's a couple of ways that you could go. You could, and I'm, I'm going to be a, a, a little bit sort of stark, but you, you could borrow a, 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 a lot of money off a, a country that buys, makes railways. China springs to bind in, 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 in my eyes which is what some, of, um, some African countries have done. Um, the trouble with that is there's a, there's a, real, there's a real risk of debt. Um, there's a real risk of, 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 of you having some collateral behind that. I, I would advise against that, um, unless you do your sums very carefully. The, 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 the other stark end of that is um, what, what actually Robin's going to talk a bit about later, which in Britain is where we've um, taken... Um, old disused railways, railways that look like your railway, um, and brought them back to life. Um, primarily in Britain, that's been done for, as a tourist attraction. They are safe operational railways, but they've been developed for, for tourists and what we call heritage railways. But the, our thinking is there's nothing stopping that same process happening, but for something that's, that's commercial as well. And that can be done an awful lot more cheaply it can be done with local skills and develop local capabilities here where you then have an ongoing capability and resource that perhaps might be useful in other countries or keep operating your railway going forward. If you go with the have some overseas country come and build you one, is you, you actually really struggle to actually operate it and maintain it afterwards and those whole life cycle costs. If you go through an approach where you're, you've got a structured plan for doing it, if you like, in-house, but with some um, appropriate support and help, um, then you will generate the skills, you will generate a community, you will generate social inclusion much more easily, and it's a, a trickle budget to do it. Um, I also think, and this is the bit that we, we, I think is the most interesting bit at the moment, is those requirements stage. I also think that if you can get the requirements right, and it being about social inclusion and about decarbonisation, the, the cost here is, is a lot less, but there are people like the World Bank and people that will lend you the money in a much better way to, because it's, it's money to do social good rather than, than, than perhaps some, some other things. So I think there is a, there is a spectrum of things you might do. Um, that, that I've explained the two extremes, and there's obviously some middle ground in the, in, in, in the middle there, but I would steer clear certainly from the, 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 the first um, unless you're really, really confident about what you're doing. And I'm not, I'm not sure, certainly the conversation we're, we've got in the room is, is, is not probably where, where I would be comfortable saying you should go off and do that stuff. Does that answer your question? All right. Um, so, well, Professor Clive is here throughout um, the symposium, and you can catch him at lunch. I hope you found his talk enlightening. I, I certainly did in terms of um, the various examples he showed us and best practices um, not just in the UK, but uh, across the globe as well. So um, I hope it's in inspired our GRC and um, Bauxite uh, Industry Railway men and women. I know I haven't seen much women, but uh, I'm sure they're there <laughs> in the rail industry. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed the lunch that was provided, um, sponsored by the University of Birmingham. So we want to thank them for <laughs> providing a sumptuous meal. 
And um, so you can see we've already started to get tangible ben benefits from our <laughs> partnership. <laughs> so, uh, and that is just the beginning. Um, lunch is just the beginning uh, of greater things to come. Right, so we're going to restart. Thank you for staying with us. For those of you who have been here this morning, um, thank you for staying with us. And uh, we have a few more presentations to go. I hope you've enjoyed the symposium so far. It's been an informative session where we started in the morning um, listening to presentations from the Jamaica Railway Corporation, as well as representatives from the bauxite industry from Noranda, where we had a sort of presentation of the state of the nation of railway in Jamaica. And then we heard from Professor um, Clive Roberts, who gave a more international perspective um, and highlighted case studies both in the UK and abroad. So it's, been a, it's definitely been a, a knowledge exchange experience so far. And the next speaker will take us further into um, the technology and future of railway. So we have Dr. Marcelo Blumenfeld um, from the University of Birmingham. He'll be speaking on techno technological developments and future railway capabilities. Um, he is part of the Birmingham delegation that came um, for the signing of the MOU. He's an assistant professor of transport systems and works closely with the Birmingham Center for Railway Research and Education. His main areas of work is on themes around future mobility and sustainable developments. Um, so he's here to talk on that topic. Help me welcome Dr. Blumenfeld. Thank you very much, um, everyone, for sticking out. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Brown, for the introduction. Can you hear me better now? It's good. All good? All good. So it is a pleasure um, to be here. Um, thank you for staying here. I think before I start, um, thank you for the introduction as well, Kevin. It, I, because I'm sitting right in front of this lovely table, and um, it just occurred to me that it's quite relevant when we look at the mottos of the universities that we've just signed this MOU. I think it's particularly relevant to the challenges that we're um, facing. So the motto, as I understand, motto of UTEC is excellence through knowledge, which clearly shows up what we're doing here. And the motto of the University of Birmingham is per, uh, per alta, ardua ad alta, which is through hardship to great achievements. And um, this is particularly relevant to what we're doing today. Combining these two mottos is exactly what it's today and tomorrow is about. And we have a huge task ahead with the railways as they are, but we see huge opportunities. And it's only through hard work that we will achieve what we want. So my, my talk today is a light-hearted whistle stop tour of some innovations. Um, but I want to focus some on, on capabilities, because I work very much with innovation and future systems. And the key challenge that we have is actually how do we choose those systems? You know, we had discussions when, during our presentation with people saying, but what about high-speed rail? But what about other systems? What about and the, the difficulty is you need to understand that and creating the systems thinking to understand what exactly you need to bring the railways to provide the benefits that they are um, to provide. So just a little bit on that. One graph that I really like is about how our world changes. And the challenges that we have is because things change in different paces. So our view of the world is usually like this little graph, and then we think things change in a normal pace, in a continuous form, but that's not, that's not how it happens. Usually, you have technology being driven in a Gaps are what creates the, the tension between what we have and what we want to achieve. We never know how to deal with those, because technology will always come up with something that's cooler, something that's shinier, something that does more things. But maybe that's what we need. Maybe that's not what we need, but that's what we don't need. Um, but that's why we need to think that change requires 
not only technology, but requires people to know how to operate, people how to know to design those, businesses that can make value out of these things, and of course, policy in a sense of regulation, in a sense of incentives. So this graph is crucial to understand innovation. I believe that's the, the starting point. And because Clive used a triangle, I thought, why not using one as well? <laughs> I need to have my own triangle. Um, um, so when we talk about innovation, um, I use the word capability, and Clive used the word capability many times. And I want to focus on that for a minute, because as we see, we are in a moment of opportunity to redevelop, rehabilitate, and maybe why not recreate Jamaican railways. And in that sense, we need to identify what actually we want to do, what exactly we are to do. And we need to think that there are certain capabilities that we are to achieve with our system before we even discuss what technologies we are um, doing and where we are implementing them. So my triangle is about the key aspects of railway transport or transport in general, which is around three capabilities. One is about speed. You know, someone told us when we went to Kingston Terminus that the trip between Montego Bay and Kingston used to take six hours. If we're offering six hours and the coach company is offering two hours, then it's very difficult to compete, right? The other one is capacity. If we don't have enough people, we don't have enough revenue. If we don't have enough revenue, we cannot run a railway, right? I mean, as much as we can have some subsidies, there is a challenge in always paying for that. And the third one is connectivity. I mean, that's a huge challenge when you have um, larger countries, when you have different areas, and people are displaced around the country, around cities. And if you're not connecting them to where they want to be, rather than just putting them on a train, you have to understand that they need to be from A to B. And if you're not connecting them to those destinations, then there is no point in having a system. And of course, I was reminded by Robin, thank you very much, Robin, that all this has to happen under the circumstance and the understanding that nothing can happen without safety. Right? Safety is crucial. Safety is, is an inevitable thing that we have to, um, to work around. So my um, presentation today, I'm hoping to be as interesting, as interactive as I can be, is a little whistle-stop tour on rail innovation. I could go on for hours if I was to talk about every single innovation that happened in the last 200 years of railways. I mean, I wouldn't even know how to start. I chose a few, not because they are my favorite ones or because they're big or because they were, as they call, disruptive. I chose some because of the changes that they created in society and economy. And the same way that how they were driven by social economic um, changes. And that's the way at which I see um, the, the fact that we have railways. And railways are a social technical system so we're not just running trains because we like seeing trains run. We run trains because it's a service to the population, it's a service to the economy. That way, the first one, um, you see that I put the colors, we're gonna go on a stop tour, and the colors are how I connected them to the three key aspects of capacity, speed, and connectivity. So the first one is what we call early guided transport. We all think and we all say railway started in 1825, but actually, guided transport started much, much earlier. You know, um, and the key thing is, it's key to, uh, it's easy to understand because you see in ancient Greece, ancient Rome, that putting things in, on tracks, in a sense, is an easy way to increase your capacity because you lower the amount of effort that you need to push things, and therefore you can move more things with the same amount of effort. Um, so that what we call the 16th century mine. And just putting things on guide, um, guided tracks is a way of just getting things to be moved um, easier. All those things um, move our goods and move people in the future. The other one, starting closer to what we're talking uh, today, is what we call the birth of rail. I think many people um, have discussed that today. But the birth of rail, um, we have to remember that innovation happens because you have some technology developing somewhere, and this is application of technology, that's what we do in engineering, to have a purpose and a common um, um, outcome. So the birth of rail is a result of the Industrial Revolution. You know, rail could have happened before the Industrial Revolution, but it was a result of that, a result of having engines, 
that you could have actually self-propelling wheels. And 1800, 1825, as you say, in the UK, 1845 um, in, in Jamaica. But that's driven, as Fabio mentioned, driven by this need for speed. So this is why I put into speed, because moving things faster is what brings us to great economies of scale. You know, just move things faster, you get closer, you can move more things because you're just creating um, and bridging the gap. And that's a way that we, we, since then, we've been doing that with different modes of transport, created competition to rail, so rail was wheeling freely until all the modes of transport started competing with it. But that need for speed has never subsided. It started during the Industrial Revolution, but we still have that, and that's why we keep pursuing higher speed, that's why we have aeroplanes, and that's why we have those. And we need to understand what we actually want to achieve with those. And in the early 1800s, is because you had all these people who were local, and they were constrained in the area that they could explore economically. And then you create this opportunity of moving with an engine much faster. That means that within a day, they could reach much, much longer uh, distances. So this is a lovely drawing that I see. And for us to understand that things, technologies change quite rapidly. You know, this was 200 years ago, and you probably laugh that, you know, the rocket, the famous steam team rocket, achieved 48 kilometers an hour in 1829. You know, for now, achieving 48 kilometers an hour is not a massive thing. I think people would potentially not be very impressed. But then, it was a game changer. Because you can imagine the amount of distance that you can cover in one hour, traveling at 48 kilometers an hour, that means that your products, if you're producing anything, could reach much wider networks and much wider markets. And that's what we need to think when we think about, think about the value of railways in rehabilitating or re redeveloping the railways in Jamaica, is that you can explore those markets and you can connect those markets in a much faster way. And then it leads to a specific thing, which is another technological development. But for me, this, what I call the rail mania, is a key aspect of how technology changes how society behaves. And that's one of the key things I want to discuss today. So rail mania is what we call in the UK a period of time after the railway started where people realized, oh, sorry, am I not in the mic? I just move a bit too much. I'm a fidgety, I'm Brazilian. It's hard to stand still. <laughs> um, but so that's, that's a period of time. So there was not necessarily a technological point but there's a period of time that people realized that railways can be profitable. Railways are a business. They're not necessarily just moving some things um, along a track. And that period, if you see the map of, of, of Britain, not UK because there is a lot, that's in 1910. That's how many lines were crossing the country. It is surreal to think that almost every single village was connected to the, to the network. And that way, imagine the change in people's lives, that if someone was somewhere in the middle of the country, they could literally go anywhere else around the country to either access you know, leisure, access goods, access other opportunities. So that literally changes the way a country operates when you crisscrosses, when you're crisscrossing the country with a network. So our discussions of how much railways would Jamaica need, I don't think it's... It's, it's, it's a question in itself, because there is a benefit of expanding your market and expanding your population rather than densifying just one or two main cities in the country. That's how you develop your markets. So that's, that's one thing in terms of connectivity. There is no necessarily technological aspect there, but it literally changed the way that a country behaved. And you can see how, I'm going to go through that, but I always use that in some of my lectures because, so if you have a Manchester to London, so Manchester in the north of England, um, for those who haven't been, um, and London, it's about 350 kilometers. So it's actually further than the, the length of Jamaica. Um, it used to take four days by horse cart. So it, if you were by yourself, that's what I'm thinking, if you were by yourself and it took four days, the number of times you would do this trip, right? You would do it once in a lifetime because you didn't have enough time to do it. By the 19th century, it's 12 hours, so it took you half a day. Then you start thinking, well, maybe I could go and visit some family. You know, not that they, they want me to go, but I'll go and visit them. Um, 
So that changes your behavior with space. But the 20th century took two and a half hours. That's a business trip. And that's why I keep banging on the six hours between Montego Bay and Kingston. Because these things are key. Because once you start reducing that time, people say, well, I can go in the morning, have my meetings, sell my goods, and come back. And that's the change you have in the country. So people could live everywhere else and still commercially or being, being marked, being active so, um, in other cities. So that, that was a massive, massive thing of, of having that type of connectivity. And the same with villages, that you would have to travel to a station. And the more network that you have, the easier it is for people to do type of shorter trips. And that's the kind of thing that you need to think in Jamaica. And then comes my passion, which is cities, um, and how railways literally shaped cities. And I'm saying literally because it literally did shape cities. Railways and every mode of transport, they were responsible for cities expanding. And so most early stage, early, very early on villages, people were only walking. Right? And by only walking, then you have very, very small areas that you can cover. Because it's, you cannot walk all day. But once you see here, oh, actually I have a thing. Where do I press for that? Yeah. Railways created this space because railways traveling at 30 kilometers an hour average, it just led people to be able to travel to and from work in a much further distance. And so people didn't have to live that close to the city. Conditions were better outside the city. And if you think, I'm going to go back to the other slide. London was built in that way. That was the, be the beginning of the suburbs. So if you think about Kingston, and someone was mentioning a more monorail, someone was mentioning about a light rail, these things would shape the city because people can live in other parts of town and still go to work in a much, much easier way. We've been stuck in traffic here. I'm from Sao Paulo. I know what traffic looks like, and it's horrible. So that's the kind of thing. First underground line um, in opening London in 1863. Then curiosity for you all. Um, before that, most people, 75% of the people, will live less than three miles from work. There's some research on that. After that, more than 50% of the people will live more than seven miles from work, just because then you are able to do that kind of thing. So cities would grow, house larger populations. By having larger populations, you all live in Kingston, you know, you bring economic growth. Then you require great, greater speeds. That's what we're, sh we're being um, challenged today. So these are the kind of te um, technological developments. They create a cycle of what we call, it could be a virtual cycle or a vicious cycle. It depends on how you cater for it. Then you have some more technical things, and that's a, um, a very specific one. But we were talking to our friends in the bulk site operation. And when we, went, when we went to Kingston Terminus, by implementing multiple units. So far, we've been discussing a lot about having locomotives, everything with locomotives. But with locomotives, there is one challenge if you're carrying passengers. If you're carrying freight, it depends, on, of course, on the capacity. But there is a huge difference in capacity when you have a locomotive system, because once you, have to the, once you arrive at the terminus, you have to have another locomotive coming in. You have to attach the locomotive. You have to release the locomotive, and that takes time. When you start having new technologies in rolling stock, that's mainly for passengers, where are multiple units, where the motor car are in the units themselves, you don't need that. That time is eaten capacity. It's actually, or when you add the capacity there, it's revenue that you're adding. Because as Clavo was mentioning, the measure of efficiency of, of, a, of, a, of a truck or a, a line is how many So the faster you can do this turnaround, the faster you can do, the more trains you can bring about, the more people you can carry, the more money you make, and all those things. So there is a really, really big moment um, when you start having multiple units. Then we jump into electrification. Some people mentioned, I think there was a discussion during lunch about electrification, the potential for electrifying um, lines in Jamaica. Electrification is becoming well, it's not new, as I, I would say. Um, first left by metro lines, late 1800s. So the first in the continental Europe was in Hungary, 1896. So it's not a new technology, but it's been brought back in discussion 
because of it doesn't produce any CO2 emissions. It's a zero um, carbon mode of, of operating lines. But also, hugely expensive. That is the key thing. So it's hugely effective and efficient, but hugely expensive. So you need to make sure that you have enough capacity and you have to enough passengers, enough demand for it. Otherwise, there is no way you're going to recover those costs. But it's still in vogue. Many countries are investing in that. I think the key thing is understanding if you are able to do that or not. This is one um, that fascinates me, um, and I'm not sure um, how applicable that is for Jamaica in the moment, but it could be in the future. So this is um, a double stack container freight train that is electrified. So by doubling stack, you can actually move twice as much, but also um, that only works for slightly um, lower weight goods. So I think for bauxite, that would be a bit challenging. Um, <laughs> you know, we don't know what the future um, lays ahead, but also there's a way of electrifying, moving more goods, you could bring more justification in the costs and ingest investments because of the return on investment. So there's always a way. As you can see, we're almost all done in our loop and our whistle stop tour. But what I wanted to emphasize is that there's always a way of making things happen. That's the key thing, and I'm going to bring into discussion in a second. And more recently, I think digitalization and automation, um, we're, getting more, we're getting closer to our time now, um, which is the key part. Digitalization and automation. Um, Clive brought this up, and I think um, our, um, Michael brought it from, a, from a, an operating uh, perspective of how those differences make um, how implementing digitalization, implementing digital technologies, dig digital solutions can, can bring, um, how much difference it can bring in the efficiency of operations. So the key thing, um, I didn't have a, a slide on the, on the signaling. So if you don't have a digital signal um, system, then your trains have to be very far from each other. The more digital that you become, the more automated you become, you can run your trains closer. Of course, there are challenges in automation itself. But that only, not only works for signaling, that not only works for control, that works for every single aspect of management of assets, that works for every aspect of management of traffic and making decisions. And automation, in a sense, which is a key thing nowadays, is making sure that you are operating as, at the most efficient way that you can. You know, we, we always deal with human behavior. And the challenge with human behavior is that it's unpredictable, you know, and the dealing with unpredictability is hard for a system that should be performing at its highest level. So there is a, a, a discussion that there is always that objective and there's always that attractiveness into making everything automated, but there is always a challenge because once you automate your assets, once you automate your system, it can backfire when you find yourself in complex situations. So I think, um, if you don't mind, Michael, I'll use your example. When you have two trains in a single line coming, if they are not timed perfectly, machines cannot make that judgment. And if it's, everything is automated, we need to be careful with that level of automation because making those decisions become um, quite complicated. So that's a way of, of dealing it. Uh, but it all brings back to what digitalization and automation can do. Digitalization and automation can improve your capacity. And by improving your capacity, that means the justification of cost and the return on investment is actually a bit easier to achieve. So we always need to look back, you know, bringing on the V that Clive was, was, um, was mentioning, bring back to the main outcomes of your railway. We cannot be lost, get lost in the detail of our machinery if we don't know exactly what we're using the machinery for. That's the key aspect. Then we go into high-speed rail. Someone had a question about high-speed rail uh, earlier today, why we were not thinking about putting high-speed rail in, um, in Jamaica. And I thought, OK, that, that, that thought occurred to me until I went on the map and I had some research. Just before that, I forgot the, the, the key thing here is how high-speed rail could, I talked about how you changed running into two and a half hours before it was four days. Now, with HS2 that Clive mentioned, London to Manchester will be done in one hour. 
And remember, technology is all about how it changes social economic dynamics. Two and a half hours is a journey for a meeting. Right? You go in the morning, you have your meetings, you go back in the afternoon, and you have your daily trip. In one hour, that's a commute trip. Right? That's a commute trip. So someone could potentially live in Manchester and work in London or vice versa. And that's the, the aspect that I want to bring to you, is just to contemplate how it changes the dynamics of the country. If you can travel between Montego Bay or somewhere near Montego Bay or Appleton or St. Andrew, or Santa Isabel, don't, don't, Port Antonio, it doesn't matter, and achieve and reach your central, your work hub, your economic hub in one hour, that means that people don't necessarily need to all live in Kingston and make this city difficult to manage. That's the key thing. You want to spread economic activity. So that is a key challenge. That is a key thing, and it's like a key benefit as well. But then I remember someone, oh, sorry, someone saying, why don't we have high-speed trains in Jamaica? So I went on, on Google Maps, um, and I started making some calculations. I chose three countries which are close to my heart, um, UK, Jamaica, and Brazil. <laughs> Political. <laughs> but then I realized that, you know, let's have a look. So in the UK, you have catchment areas of one hour journey time. So 100 kilometers blue, orange is 200 kilometers, 300 kilometers is green. So you see, with one hour travel from London, which is the south of London, uh, south of England, you could reach the north quite, well, quite rapidly. And that's how much you could travel across the country with 300 kilometers an hour. Then you look at Brazil, where I come from. You don't get much far. I mean, you don't get that far in, in, in traveling at 300 kilometers an hour because the country is massive. But then I went to Jamaica. If I were to draw 200 and 300 kilometers, it would not even cater for the country. So we need to be careful with that kind of shiny thing that we just want a shiny high-speed rail. Sometimes you cannot even implement that because by the time you accelerate your high-speed train, you, you, you're, you're kind of covered half of the country. And that, that is the kind of thing. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, you should see. Yeah, yeah, you get to Cuba. Um, so well, that's what I want to say. Where we see challenge, we see opportunities. And the fact that the country is small in geography, not small in its pride, not small in all that, it's small in geography. That means that the potential for changing the country is much easier than trying to implement something in a country the size of Brazil. So when someone said that Jamaica has a small economy, I would disagree. I'll say Jamaica has perfect size economy for its size of the country. That's the key thing. Because it doesn't matter. We could go and you know, go to Japan, and they achieved 600 kilometers an hour. It doesn't matter. Because that, that is key for a country the size of Japan, the size of UK, Germany. But for a country the size of Jamaica, maybe looking at that is just because we're tempted by the shiny new thing. And we are sold systems that we don't necessarily use. When, when we had discussions, and Clive mentioned, so I've, I've been heavily involved in our research projects in the African continent. And I came across, because we were doing some projects in, in East Africa, but then someone um, was mentioning Zambia. So Zambia is doing a lot of work, and Zambia decided to buy the latest communication and control system that you could even find in the market. Not even implemented in Switzerland, not even implemented in the UK, not even implemented anywhere. But they decided to go and buy that system. But then they are not running even half the speeds of other countries. So why do you need to go for the shiny new thing because someone go there and it sells you that when you don't really need that? So innovation is not about buying the latest technology. Innovation is about finding the real solution that you need for your problem. That's an example I use very much for my students. Um, it's not a personal thing against any country. But the example is you have a maglev line, magnetic levitation train, reaching 430 kilometers an hour to go to the airport. It's a 30 kilometer journey. That costs you $44 million per kilometer to build. Or you could have a normal train that costs you a third of the cost and gives you basically the same capability. I'm very sure that my passengers going to the airport don't mind the four extra minutes. If it was 40 extra minutes, maybe, but four extra minutes they wouldn't. 
And that's what I'm saying. Do not be tempted. It's, hard. it's easy to be tempted by the latest technology when we don't necessarily need that. I think what we need to find is to find the real requirements for that. And the solutions and the technologies will follow from that. Right? Solution here is the problem. That brings me to my last stop. And that last stop is actually the stop forward. Not from today, but from tomorrow. Decarbonization and sustainability, you know, these are the big words that we need to address. Um, we have to do something. I think everyone follows on the news how bad things are in terms of climate change, how much we need to reduce our CO2 emissions. Railways are great for that, in a sense of they emit less than road transport, but they still emit CO2 because we run things mostly with diesel. And the key thing here is to understand, of course, we have the safety one, but anything that we do in a triangle has to work inside a framework of sustainability. So from now on, maybe in the past it wasn't the case, but from now on, our choices need to also contemplate how much carbon it will release in the atmosphere for implementing and for running, how much social value it will bring. Is it gonna, in, are you going to increase inequality or is it going to reduce inequality? Is it going to bring sustainable economic development or not? These are the key sustainability questions that any time we go and we find our technologies, we need to think of the capabilities that address those. So I brought four examples. There are many more. But mobility as a service, I've touched a little bit upon. But what I'm trying to say is that railways are a key way that they can address the door-to-door -door journeys. And if we're not integrated, if our technologies are not easy to integrate with other modes of transport, with the other plans of where we are going and we're moving our goods, then it's very difficult for us to compete with road transport. Right? Alternative traction, I think we've mentioned that quite a lot, that's, but that's a photo you haven't seen of Hydroflex, so at least I'll take that. Um, but alternative traction in terms of hydrogen, in terms of battery, in terms of even other solutions using ammonia, but we need to start looking at that. You know, I think there is a potential the size of the, the, the island to look at those because there might be the exact distance that we're thinking of that. And when we had the discussions about the conditions of the track and the speeds that it can achieve, well, maybe we don't need to put that much money or put much effort. If we have better technologies to make railway uh, vehicles lighter, they would create less wear, they would be a bit more sustainable in terms of the energy they require. There are lots of research on that, and they tend to be cheaper. So why not try and look at those? They might be the right way of doing. Also, additive manufacturing is only for goods for supply chain. Still very early um, stage in terms of how you can implement that. But what I'm trying to bring in this slide is, as Clive mentioned, I think the key aspect is that we're not trying to rehabilitate a 1980s and 1960s railways. It's time for us using excellence through knowledge I'm going to bring that, and I'm going to pin on that, that we can do a 21st century solution. We can work on a 21st century solution rather than trying to revive 19th and 20th century solutions. And the key aspect of that is always to keep your mind open and not to be tempted by the shiny new thing that you see in the market. So my concluding remarks, and I appreciate that you've lasted that long, um, <laughs> Um, is that innovation is this natural process that's driven by social, economic, and environmental needs that we have. And whenever existing systems cannot deliver appropriate um, capacity or, or, or performance, we go and we innovate. That's the key thing. In exchange, the greater performance that our innovations bring, they unlock new dynamics um, in social and economics um, of, of populations and, and countries. Railways have a remarkable history in doing that, and that was only a nine-stop um, history on that. And they have growing challenges of future ahead because now we have constraints in economic um, aspects, we have constraints in um, social aspects, and we have constraints in environmental aspects. However, and that's the key message that I wanted to bring today, is that successful implementation of new technologies, it's context-dependent. Remember that graph. I hope you go back with one, one slide in your head which is a graph of the distances. Remember that it's context dependent. You cannot bring solutions that are being applied for Brazil or being applied um, for the US 
and think that this would be perfect for Jamaica. Jamaica has its own geography. We've seen how mountainous it is, you know. So with its own context, we need to look at not being by the shiny new thing around, but by the technologies and the solutions which are perfect for the capabilities we want to deliver. So I thank you for your time, and I'll be around today and tomorrow, but I think there are more presentations with really, really good information, and it's a pleasure to be here. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Marcelo. Uh, are there any questions for Marcelo? Um, took us on a, a history um, of, of real technology. No? All good? OK, so all right, we, we're, we're nearly there. For those of you who are showing a lot of stamina and staying the course, we have one other main presentation from uh, Birmingham. Um, we have Dr. Robin Coombs. Um, his topic is the particulars of non-mainline railway lines operation and management. Uh, Robin is a postdoctoral research fellow, um, and he works on developing heritage rail knowledge networks. He's an advisor to private and community railways, a chartered architect by profession, and Robin started his career with British Rails and has stayed in the industry for quite some time. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Robin Coombs. Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for staying as long. Um, I hope I can still keep you awake. And um, I've got lots of pretty pictures. So if nothing else, you can watch the pretty pictures. I'll, right, no, I'm not going to move around. I'll, I'll, stay, I'll stay put as long as the, uh, the clicker works. I can just about see it. Okay, my title is, Is the Non-Mainline Model Relevant to Jamaica? Well, my presentation explains what non-mainline non railways are, their value and importance to the community, and are there lessons to be applied in Jamaica? With three million people, the market is huge here. Everyone wants easier travel, which railways can provide. But railways can be expensive, and it's better to avoid the big foreign loans and debt, as Clive has said earlier. Therefore, you need a solution that is appropriate for Jamaica. Okay, you can come in. <laughs> I am here to give you one such solution. Heritage railways provide prove you can build a working railway with minimal resources and goodwill. I explain how faith, belief, a clear vision, some knowledge and experience can overcome the challenges of rebuilding a railway. But first, let me set the scene. I would like to tell you a story, a reflection, lessons learned, and a way forward. A story of the land of my birth. And no, it's not England. It is taking a very long view how railways are part of a nation and helps to build and become part of its identity, its culture, its economic and technical development, why and how we have got to where we are today. And I will look at the experience of just one country. It's a beautiful and ancient land, a land of dragons and wizards, and I will come back to the place and power of dragons and wizards later. A place where there are long traditions of great music, of voice and heavenly harp, of lush valleys, cascading waterfalls, high mountains, and a stunning coastline. The name of this country is Cymru. To give it some perspective, it is roughly twice the land area of Jamaica, 8,000 square miles compared to 4,000 square miles of Jamaica, and with three times the length of coastline. Like Jamaica, it is home to around 3 million people. This means it's about half as densely populated. Today, it is a multicultural nation with most nationalities represented in its population. And like Jamaica, underneath its soils lie rich deposits of minerals that man both needs and craves. In case of Wales, gold, silver, ores, ores, slates, and what is known as black gold or coal. But that's now become the villain of the story. 
The Romans were the first modern invading army and exploited the minerals, particularly its gold and its silver. The Romans named it Cambria, the Latin version of Cumbria. Between 1277 and 1283, the land was conquered by a brutal, wicked foreign king and the people subjugated and ruled from a foreign capital. In 1843, The year that Jamaica's first railway was planned, there was another uprising, the Rebecca riots, to protest against the harsh conditions endured by the rural poor of the country. There have been many attempts over the centuries to expunge the national language and the culture, but it lies deep in the, in the soul and in the valleys, and once again it is thriving with national festivals of poetry, song, and music, the Ice Edfords. If you have not guessed, the country I'm talking about is also more, more widely known as Wales. We are not an island, but linked to England, and together with Scotland and Northern Ireland, we now form the United Kingdom. Welsh, Welsh minerals were there to be exploited, so an early iron industry was developed. There was just one problem. To move heavy products in carts and pack horses along muddy, rutted roads or the new canals was slow and expensive. To solve this problem, an ingenious solution was found. Tramways were already in use underground in the mines to move the coal along the deep, dark passageways to the surface. The solution was to use the smooth rails to guide the wheels of wagons and reduce friction, and then combine this with the marvel of the age, the steam engine, into the moving steam locomotive. You'll probably have heard of the locomotive rocket and its inventor, George Stevenson, winning the trials at Rainhill in 1829 to find the best steam locomotive. And then in 1930, the opening of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. Many mistake George Stevenson as the inventor of the steam locomotive and the father of the railways. This is not correct. It was 25 years earlier in Wales, in 1804, that a steam locomotive pulled wagons on the world's first railway journey at Penadaran in the South Wales coal fields. It was entirely appropriate in a land famous for wizards and dragons that a mechanical fire-breathing monster was born and came to life. Why is this event not so well known as the rocket? George Stevenson, as well as being a good engineer, though his son was more inventive, was better, it seems, at PR, public relations. And it's those that are good at public relations who are usually those that write history. Just three years later, Also in Wales, not far away in Mumbles, the world's first passenger railway started to operate, the Ostermouth Railway to Mumbles. They used horse-drawn carriages, as steam locomotives were still in their infancy, though it was later converted to steam, and then electric trams. The line closed in 1960, replaced by motor buses, and today there is no trace of the railway, as it was thought not important enough to preserve yet it was the very first passenger railway. The next 150 years of the Welsh story is of hardship and exploitation, of digging out coal and other minerals to power the worldwide industrial revolution. And of course, to make many foreign mine owners very rich, this is the interior of Cardiff Castle, built on the profits of the mining and exporting of coal. In Wales, conditions for those that worked underground mining coal was appalling. As documented in an 1840 report to Parliament, children as young as five years old would spend 12 hours a day underground in stifling, hot, pitch black, filthy conditions, simply opening and shutting doors that control the flow of air and the movement of wagons conditions similar to the worst solitary confinement. This was a testament from a woman who worked underground as a drawer, a person that dragged wagons from the coalface to the lift shaft, 
often a distance of a mile or more. I have a belt around my waist and a chain between my legs, and I go on my hands and feet. The road is very steep, and we have to hold a rope. There are over six women and about six boys and girls in the pit I work. The work is very hard. The pit is very wet, and the water comes over the wooden shoes, and I've seen it up to my thighs. My clothes are wet through most of the day. I've drawn the wagons, and the skin is off me. The belt and the chain are worse than when we're in the family way, when she's been pregnant. My man has beaten me many times for being slow pulling the wagons. I've known many men beat the drawers and take liberties so they end up with bastards. I think it would be better to be paid once a week instead of once a month. Remember, this is still a railway. The motive power is the woman hauling wagons on rail. This was the life spent invisible in the world above. There was no fresh air, sunshine, or blue skies. And in winter, they would descend underground before the sun rose and not return until after it was set. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because some of the coal that was hacked out by the miners and carted by these women, who brought to the surface, put it in railway wagons, taken to the coast, loaded into sailing ships, and then exported around the world, including Jamaica. The reason, well, Jamaica has no coal mines. So in 1845, when the first locomotive in Jamaica opened, the locomotive needed power to fuel it. Sorry, power, fuel to power it. So when the steam locomotive projector pulled the first train out of Kingston, the coal in its tender that burnt in its firebox that produced the heat to boil the water that made the steam locomotive move came from Wales. And that is the important connection between us. Have you indeed considered these connections of how until diesels came along that burnt oil, the railways of Jamaica were powered, where the coal came from, and what were the working conditions of those that mined coal and transported it halfway around the world. There are other connections too, like Jamaica and its two terrible rail accidents, particularly at Kendall in 1957 when 175 passengers were killed. Wales has also suffered terrible rail accidents. In 1868, like at Kendall, there was a runaway a brake van and six wagons loaded with paraffin were left uncoupled on a gradient leading down to Abergelly, and a collision with other carriages caused it to run downhill into the path of the mail train, exploding on impact. Flames and smokes made rescue impossible, and 33 people died in the crash, some of them burnt beyond recognition. The inquest blamed the two brakesmen on the goods train, who had failed to secure the wagons individually, as well as the station master at Clandellis, who was supervising the operation. The Board of Trade also strongly criticized the London and North Western Railway for poor practices. In 1921, at Abergelly, two trains collided head on with many killed because of poor practice. In August 2019, a similar event almost occurred on a heritage railway. Fortunately, both trains stopped in time before any collision occurred, which only demonstrates the importance to learn lessons of the past to operate safely. Running trains is a serious business. If we get it wrong, we can kill or seriously injure people. Now, let's move forward to 1951, to a remote valley in the northwest of Wales. Along the valley lies a narrow gauge railway, opened in 1865 to bring slate down from the quarries at Abergonolwyn to the seacoast of Tawyn, an onward transshipment. The railway also served the local community. Eventually, the quarry was exhausted, and there was no economic purpose for the railway. Paved roads, cars, lorries, and buses had arrived as an alternative form of community to get its goods and to travel. But an Englishman named Mr. L. T. C. Rolt and some business friends from the faraway city of Birmingham said, but it's a beautiful little railway and it would be a shame to close it. Can we have it, please? And, and we will run it ourselves. 
because it would just be a nice thing to do, and, and we will invite tourists to come and see it and ride on it and keep the memories of the community and the industry alive for future generations. And so the owner's widow gave them the railway. And on the 14th of May, 1951, the first train ran on the world's first preserved railway, the Talat Lynn in Wales. Enthusiasts volunteered and traveled from far and wide, even from other countries in Europe, the US and Australia to help run the little railway and helping it back on its feet because it was very run down in a poor state of repair. And I would recommend watching an American film that was made in the 1950s about the line, and it's called The Railway with the Heart of Gold. Tourists also came to see and ride on the railway and enjoyed themselves. And it was not long before other small railways also faced closure, and more people said they were such a shame if they closed. Please, can we have them? And we will restore them and run them. So the Festiniog, the Welsh Pool at Lanvire, and latterly the Corris and the Vale of Rydal all reopened as preserved railways and collectively known as the Great Little Trains of Wales. The Talatlin and the Festiniog railways are now UNESCO World Heritage Sites. It's important to tell you that for those early railways, there was no help or grants from any public body. In fact, the general opinion was that the people involved were amateurs probably mad, and the venture was doomed to failure. But this was really about being self-reliant and having to do everything yourself. It was only much, much later when the railways had become successful tourist attractions that public bodies woke up and wanted to join the party. Many Welsh towns now rely heavily on the tourist trade they generate. And people got bold and said, oh, if you can have fun and run an narrow gauge railway, why can't we run the standard gauge railway too? And so they did. In Wales, it was the Gwilly, the Tlangothlin, and the Pontypool and Blenavon railways, the latter now also UNESCO World Heritage Site. But preserved railways have not only operated in the UK, but all over the world. We saw earlier St. Kitts, Australia, France, San Marino, Slovakia, Spain, Sweden, Canada, United States, Mexico, Barbados, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Ecuador, Indonesia, Taiwan, China, and so on and so on. But perhaps the greatest achievement in Wales has been the rebuilding of the 25-mile Welsh Highland Railway, which had closed in 1933, abandoned with its tracks ripped up, and then there was a project, projected, project, projected legal battle and public acquire, inquiry in the 1990s. The line was finally and fully reopened between Carnarvon and Port Maddock in 2011, and this time with joint effort from the public and volunteers. Now, to bring you quickly up to date with the Railways of Wales, initially there were about 40 separate railway companies. Some were very profitable, as well as being in fierce competition with each other. Others were a lost cause before they even started. After the First World War, they were amalgamated into two main line companies, the GWR and LMS, with a few small private narrow gauge lines such as the Talatlin and the Festiniog. After the Second World War, Britain's railways were nationalized. And then in 1963, a man called Dr. Beeching wrote a report that showed that many railways in Wales were losing money and he recommended closing many of them, which the government followed his recommendations and carried out. And then in 1992, the year that Jamaica's railways closed, the remaining railways were privatized in a manner equivalent to smashing a Ming vase into a thousand pieces, a destructive act by politicians with the intention of never being able to put it together as a single entity. But of course, since then, railwaymen and women and now politicians have been trying to stick the pieces back together. And coming soon, a reinvented British Rail as Great British Railways. But in Wales, the railways have effectively been renationalized under its own devolved parliament, the Senedd, under the branding Transport for Wales. And this is a map of rail services in, rail, in Wales. Remember, it is a country of only three million people. The capital, Cardiff, which is my home, is smaller than Kingston, 
but it still justifies an extensive rail network. For years, Welsh local railways have operated with cascaded stock. Everybody else is cast stock. The picture on the top is an old London transport underground train, repainted, re-engined, and rebranded. The lower is the former Thameslink trains, which I helped introduce for London commuter services in the 1980s, and one of which is used as the um, prototype for Birmingham's hydro train. But now there are grand plans and some serious investment in new rolling stock. There are some Transport for Wales plans for a new metro to serve Cardiff in its hinterland. Now I believe there's some important lessons for the future of railways in Jamaica. The potential for the reopening of community, heritage and tourist based railways. The importance of self-help, sustainability, governance and building reliance, and the availability to transfer knowledge and technology from modern urban and inter-urban railways. But let me to return to, to non-mainline railways. And here I perhaps need to explain what I mean by the term. In 2006, there was a new Act of Parliament for railway safety. Under the Act, a railway was named either mainline which is all of the national network, or non-mainline, which is everything else. Non-mainline includes heritage railways, tramways and light rail, London Underground, and private sidings. They're still regulated railways under the jurisdiction of the Office of Rail and Road, but with a slightly lighter touch, because risk is mitigated by limiting speed. For heritage railways, this is normally 25 miles an hour, except where specially exempt. Heritage traction can also run on the main line, but of course it must meet higher standards. So steam locomotives are able to run at 75 miles an hour. This is the famous Flying Scotsman hauling a charter a few weeks ago. And this is how rail safety is managed in the UK. The lead is taken by the individual train companies. The ORR is the rail regulator, and sitting alongside is the RAIB, which is the Rail Accident Investigation Branch, and a Rail Safety and Standards Board. Now, what have heritage railways achieved? There are now over 400 heritage railways, steam centers, and museums spread throughout the UK, of which 200 are classified as non-main line and regulated by the ORR. The others are much smaller. Whatever the trials and tribulations starting with the saving of the Talathlin Railway in 1951, the obstacles that were overcome and was what was collectively achieved over 70 years is nothing short of amazing. The early pioneers took a fear of loss, a love of steam locomotive, mixed with some tenacity and commitment, and have turned them into an industry which today is worth over a billion UK pounds, this is UK's GDP. They've created valuable assets out of abandoned railways, locomotives and carriages that were life expired, and out of date systems and technology. If you had to replace all these assets, it would cost at today's value around five billion pounds perhaps the greatest example of recycling I can think of, and who says we do not have a positive environmental story to tell. And they give untold pleasure and joy to around 16 million visitors each year. They are places that can provide powerful and personal stories, overcoming the impossible, beating the odds, which all helps to build up their folklore. And I am proud to be one of an army of over 22,000 volunteers who are committed and freely give our time, our labor, expertise, our knowledge, skills, and money to overcome any commercial shortfall. They have done better than 90% of small and medium enterprises by having a average lifespan well over 40 years compared to 10 years for a typical company. They contribute massively to the cultural heritage of Britain with social fabric and well-being of all those that participate. 
There are national icons such as Flying Scotsman, being part of the landscape like village cricket. And we can all get to recreate our own brief encounter, a famous film of the 1940s. They make doing the impossible an everyday occurrence, the rebuilding of the Welsh Highland and the Linton and Barnstable Railway. And this was how they looked before work started. Now, if these can be rebuilt, anything is possible. They built the A1 class Pacific Tornado from scratch, and then they've run it at 100 miles an hour. They took rusting wrecks that had been consigned to the scrap heap, in this case, a castle class locomotive. They not just restored it, but put it back on the main line where it broke new records with its run up from Plymouth. They have steamed, run steam with wooden body carriages on the world's busiest underground system. Heritage railways now have a longer history than was known as the big four railway companies when the companies of, of Britain were regrouped after the First World War and the nationalized BR steam era combined. They create living history experience for many. Any period is possible, from 1803 with Trevithick's Colebrook locomotive, through Victorian, Edwardian, 1930s, 40s, 50s, the BR diesel period, up until 2019 with the recently withdrawn pace of diesel multiple units. And this is one Welsh heritage railway, the Llanelli and Minmar Railway. And this, I believe, is a model that could easily be applied to Jamaica. But it's still possible in the UK to experience the drama of Express at night. Or the thrill of the Thames Clyde Express in the snow crossing over the roof of England on the famous Settled Carlisle Line, one of the great railway journeys of the world. We can experience and create one particular company, the Great Western Railway, the GWR, or as some would say, God's Wonderful Railway the auto train, the secondary passenger train, the mixed goods train, and even a castle-class locomotive storming up Sapperton Bank with an express, its coaches all in chocolate and cream. Now, how good is that to be, you know, how that's romance for the rail? And they're certainly not all the same. The click has gone. They're certainly not all the same. They vary in length, the type of operation, the gauge, the period, and they include tramways and cable work cliff railways. And then there are the Santa Specials and the Polar Express. And line sides are also havens for flora and fauna, another positive environmental story. But how are heritage railways governed? And what is the importance of social capital? In the time available for this presentation, I've got to be selective. And you will have heard of all these terms. I have the very simple version of these eight pillars. Property, assets, operational systems and safety, governance, staff, volunteers, and members, the environment, visitors, and money. And with the underpinning of social capital. And these are all necessary to create an operational railway and then later in developing a resilient, safe, and sustainable heritage railway. And by social capital, I mean all the goodwill, the volunteer time and effort, the donations given, all the social relationships and connections that are built up over time. All these pillars and their background connections must be managed equally well. And this is one of my key points. You can't focus on one to the exclusion of the others. And to me, this is the image that really conjures up social capital. Hence, the structure is only as strong as its weakest pillar. It is why there's never a single solution or a silver bullet, and why leading and managing a heritage railway is so challenging. And if one part fails, then the whole structure can collapse. And the reason that it's only rarely happened with heritage railways is so far the foundation of social capital has been strong enough to keep the structure in place. Despite a few bits falling off and past challenges, 
I suppose, what must be regarded as the earthquake with COVID. But Heritage Railways are still around and still operating. And very quickly in more detail, the property and the infrastructure means all the land the railway sits on, the buildings, the infrastructure, tunnels, bridges, and making sure that there is security of the right of way and tenure. Then you get to the assets, all the physical things, the locomotives, the rolling stock, the archives, the machinery, the track work, the signaling system. And then we get to the operations, which is all the licenses, the acts, the rules, the policies, basically all the paperwork for which everything that the railway operates. And then I believe the most important of all these governance. It's the way an organization is led and governed at the highest level, board or committee. This influences everything. And then we have the environment, everything from fuel, which provides the energy, the controlling of its emissions, to waste management and water supply. And then the people who really make it happen, all those engaged in ownership, the funding and the operation of the railways. Those who come to visit it, and finally, the most important part, money, because money makes the world go round. And without money, you can't really do very much. We also need to understand how each of these pillars interact and relate to each other, how heritage railways really work in the real world. And above all else, how even complex and complicated they are. It was once described to me that managing a heritage railway is like trying to play three-dimensional chess on a dozen or more boards, all at the same time, blindfolded. Even a small heritage railway is a mini version of the once larger railway companies. It has the same structures and functions from the board, general manager, operating department, local department, carriage and wagon, commercial engineering, down to catering and retail. And even my own profession, architecture, Heritage railways have a vast array of different building types, many historic and listed. Then, of course, there's the technology. The steam locomotive is considered simple, having been around for 200 years, until you realize how many components there are. Heritage diesels are another level of sophistication because they require a greater range of technical parts to keep them going. And then you get to legislation and regulation. In the UK, there's an ever-growing paper, or now digital mountain of legislation, regulation and guidance with which directors we need to be familiar and which to comply with. People, and now it gets really complicated. So when we apply that to a heritage railway, typical st structure, we realize all the connections, which are instructions, emotions, opinions, and ideas flowing around them that need to be understood and managed if sense is to be made of the whole enterprise. And this diagram shows a typical governance framework for a heritage railway. It looks complex. But really, that should not put you off. It has been ordinary people who felt it was important enough to save and celebrate our past history and identity and build a social enterprise. Now, Heritage Railways weave together themes of overcoming adversity, mastering a struggle, building an identity, having inspiration, escape to a place of sanctuary, enjoyment, pleasure, thrill, being with friends, taking part in a joint enterprise, pride in doing something worthwhile, learning about the past, putting yourself in someone else's shoes, gaining new knowledge, skills, and experiences, and for me, recreating childhood memories, and having your efforts valued, immersing in familiar sights and sounds, and doing something you want to do, not because you have to do. Okay, so what are the lessons for Jamaica? Well, think perhaps of a modern-day Mr. Rowe the pioneer with his friends who saved the Talafin Railway. Decide what you want, why you want it. Imagine what the system would be like in operation. Describe it and then work backwards. Leadership and governance is critical. 
having trusted independence guides, look, listen, and learn from them. And beware and seek out the real motives of those who want to sell you their promises and their easy solutions. Be prepared to modify the vision based on practical constraints and realism. Talk to the people who understand railways. And I mean really understand all the things you never thought of. And it's clear here in Jamaica you have people who already run railways. They run them very well and they're very knowledgeable. Listen to what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And be prepared for the long, bumpy journey mostly convincing others how important it is to stay on board. And take everyone with you on the journey. Social capital is just as important, if no, more important than financial capital. Build self-reliance, capacity and capability on the ways you're going to build up long-term resilience and sustainability. Physically building or rebuilding the railway is the straightforward bit. And once you operate, safety trumps everything. And don't let the systems drift. Take care of the customer, and confidence is everything. And perhaps it's a very stark lesson to learn. But unless society wants you to exist, you will quickly go out of business. It is the responsibility of all those that lead organizations to always look ahead and consider what new generations will want and need to deliver it. And railways have survived for 200 years of change, and they still have a promising future. So conclusions. Well, heritage railways work best bottom up. Ownership must be with those that will make it happen on a practical day-to-day -day way. Benefits which can be significant for social, cultural, environmental and economic. They're not financial. To create and sustain them, they need inputs of un upfront money, goodwill, labor, expertise, and the background supporters, the people of influence, who will ideally smooth the path and not create obstacles. Their value is vital and visible with a proven track record that sometimes is hard to measure on paper. They are still real railways and they are safety critical and need to be regulated. I and the University of Birmingham would be happy to help you on your own journey. There is a worldwide community that wants you to succeed. And finally, on this whistle-top tour from the early fire-breathing dragons and steam locomotives to the modern railway and the preserving of historic railways and locomotives, I would like to finish with just four slides that I hope set the tone for making our heritage railway sustainable to attract and inspire the next generation to pass on an amazing and precious legacy. And perhaps there needs to be a T-shirt which would say, the future is Jamaican. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Coombs. Any questions for? For Dr. Coombs, yes. Not a question. Just want to say, such a wonderful monologue. Oh. And <laughs> the poetry was great also. Yes, it was. And the history, informative. And I have to also mention the parallels between situation here in Jamaica and those overseas also. That was interesting. I, and I have something to add, not necessarily for you, Dr. Coombs, but whoever wants to answer this question. I have a Kia, an old Kia, model 2013. And, <laughs> and it so happened that it needs repairs in the last two years, just that we need, I need to maintain the vehicle. And each time I take it to the dealer, I have to wait for six weeks to eight weeks or so before it can be attended to because a part that is harder to source locally. I also um, was working with another company and they had a 
you know, the universal testing machine that was able to do compressive strength testing and um, tensile strength testing. Very robust, big, probably, you know, take up a quarter of an ordinary, you know, lab. And it's so all, it, it also needed maintenance. And uh, sadly, it had to be disposed of because it could not be maintained easily. So the question that I would like to ask, and so sorry that Mr. Beachy, he broke the proverbial vase. Sometimes when it's broken, it's hard to maintain or reconstruct. And so I'm wondering if we do not think of technology in the design of uh, the, our raid, what could happen to us here is that we have a railroad system in our hands and we can't source the parts easily. And therefore, we may have to think of the current technology and the direction in which you know, the design of such train is going. So that's what I want. It, it, it's a very, very good point. And it's, and it's one of the great strengths of Heritage Railways because they are using tried and tested technology. And we were very fortunate. Yesterday, we went on a visit to the workshops. And my first question was, is, is the foundry still here, which it is? because it's having the self-reliance. I mean, to get all these heritage railways going, there was, no, there was no supplier to the get parts. They very often had to be forged, bent, um, created, machined to create them. But it was, it was totally done on a do-it-yourself basis by local people because they wanted to do it. And they learned, they had to, in many cases, had to relearn skills to be able to do it. But once you relearn those skills, you can then transfer them to the next generation. So it's incredibly important that those skills in some way are kept alive. Good afternoon. John Francis, Museum and Heritage Preservation Officer, UTEC. One of the main reasons for coming to this um, symposium was to listen to your presentation simply because you had heritage in the presentation. And in the 20 years that I've been at the university, I mean, I am so overwhelmed now, you would not understand. Primarily because from morning, I've been hearing of 1845. But in fact, there is a heritage railway that leads to 1758. And it is not a physical railway. It is a symbolic one. And that goes to the 1758 aqueduct that we have on the old plantation, which the University of Technology Jamaica is, the old plantation. And for all of those years, water still flows from that aqueduct. And it's a pity I would not, may not have the opportunity to actually take you on this tour. And what I'm saying is that those represent the history of technology at the University of Technology, Jamaica. And so this is a challenge to the Faculty of Engineering. Thank you very much for this opportunity. But you need to retell that heritage railway story because it's about people who made decisions using li whatever little resources they had. On this land, you will also find the history of modern cattle breeding, T.P. Lecky. All of that is intertwined. The story of water from plantation water supply. So these are some stories that need to be retold 
because they are very, very important. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, <laughs> that was a statement, right? Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Roy, from introduce yourself, please. My name is Roy Howell from Jamaica Railway. Um, thanks, Dr. Coombs. You have really reignited my passion with your presentation. Um, as one who is trying to keep the relic that we have going, you know, it shows that it's possible to, with what we have, do. And the, the dream is that we can, we will get what we have going without, with, with the resources that are available, and it's here. I just want to say to the lady here that everything that's needed, we have already. It's just the will to get it done. Yes, go ahead, yes. The mic is open, any questions? Well, we're getting statements, but we'll take them. Okay, the gentleman from Railway just said everything, you know, he mentioned they have. When Dr. Coombs, it, while I sit and listen to Dr. Coombs' presentation, uh, and he, you know, it's, it's a people, it's a community that deals with your, with the locomotives, et cetera. I remember Jamaica in the early years, when I was a boy, in technical school, you were yearning to do what we call machine shop, where millwrights, the profession of millwright, it was the railway in Jamaica at the time that makes these technical schools and create these, what you call careers, uh, millwrights, machine shop, all come from technical school. You know why we were doing it? To work with the Jamaica Railway Corporation. It was a big disincentive to everybody when that went down. We have the famous Spanish Town Road. Spanish Town Road was noticed as an industrial district. It's not anymore. The industries are gone. So trade school is no longer. So the profession, so you know, when you spoke about bringing back the railway, we have to bring back the profession because there won't be anybody to maintain it. And I can assure you that. So and in and you'll have to do it because a modern railway system needs the trades to maintain it. Jamaica doesn't have the trades. So it's a oh, brand new re-education. Because all these years we drove it out. We shut the plants, would have br brought in technology, retrain, etc. That's all. That's my contribution. So, so if I could frame that no question then. Um, from, from your experience, from your experience um, Dr. Coombs, when these community rails are taken over by the community, where do they find the technical expertise to keep the locomotives going? Traditionally, I mean, there was, there was help from the midway. Okay. Um, and that help was given, let's just say, um, there's an expression under the counter. Microphone, please. There's an expression under the counter. Um, things from British Rail, X, you know, sleepers and parts would some okay. magically sort of find their way to a heritage railway. Um, but in many cases, it was simply that local people wanted to learn the skills because they wanted to keep heritage alive and they realized that the only way they would do it, it, it it's self-help. Mm. Um, and you know, now there's that wonderful thing called YouTube. There's a, you know, there's a video on, on doing anything. But I mean, setting the valve gear on, on a castle class locomotive is a true art. Mm. No one's written a book about it. Um, so you have to rediscover those skills. The good news is you're doing it with a technology that is 200 years old and has survived in every part of the world, from deserts to snow-capped mountains. Mm. Um, and you can do most things with a hammer and a spanner. Okay. Um, but yes, you have to relearn those skills. And you, you will find people in Jamaica um, that will go back to the old railway and they will come out of retirement and they will be very happy to just sit there and get new people involved. Yeah. And, and just remember, I mean, everything about Heritage Railways, it's, it's a totally immersive experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, now all we do is we move mouse around. You know, coupling up a loco, firing it, cleaning it, it's tactile, it's big. 
you can understand it. Um, and that's an experience that is not available anywhere else, certainly not in the UK, or not easily available. Yeah. No. Thank you. Uh, any more questions for Dr. Coombs before we go into our very last session? Yes, um, Dr. Campbell. Name and, name and department. Yes. Thank you, sir. Excellent presentation. Quick question. Um, what space have you seen for cases where the lo locomotive itself may no longer be be able to be repaired or returned to service, but the trail itself has a role. I've heard of um, a trend called tra trains to trails or something like that. What role is there for the tracks to be used as heritage and environmental um, attractions. I mean, in, in simple terms, every, every opportunity exists. I mean, I showed a slide with all the different sorts of heritage railways. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a horse-drawn heritage railway. Uh, in terms of locomotives, if you haven't got one that's serviceable, there are, there are rich enthusiasts around the world that would only be too happy to bring their locomotive and run it on Jamaica's railway. Um, you're only limited by your own imagination. I mean, I, that's what I hope I tried to demonstrate. Um, you know, this, this wasn't started because somebody in a local authority thought it was a good idea and wrote a feasibility study. This really, truly was a ground level up. People wanted to do it, and that's why it has proved so resilient. And the moment people don't want it, it will die. If people want it, and it, it's really up to everyone in this room, you know, if this turns you on, you can go and do it. All right, well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Coombs. Let's give another round of applause. Ah, wow, what a day. Um, a day of um, history making. Uh, a day of uh, knowledge transfer, a day of uh, sharing um, the challenges that we face as we uh, move forward with our railway sector in, the, in, in Jamaica. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of uh, day one of our symposium. We were going to do a quick session looking at a, more like a workshop on exchanging ideas for future collaboration, but... I think actually if we reflect on, on the day, we've actually done that over the last few hours where we've, sh we've shared the challenges and we've seen some solutions being proposed by our colleagues from Birmingham. So um, I think it's going to be left to myself and O'Neill to try and write it up <laughs> in, a, in a way that allows us to define a way forward and to, to identify areas where we can immediately draw on the experiences of Birmingham. I think when we reflect on um, Dr. Coombs' presentation, um, clearly um, what he has shown is that the idea of having a community rail in Jamaica as proposed um, in terms of the culture line rail is very much possible and there are many examples in Wales and beyond that we can lean on. So we'll definitely be, be using the skills and experience from Dr. Coombs. And in terms of vocational training, well, Birmingham has, um, you know, they have, they have a, their own center that focuses on vocational training, and we will certainly be leaning on their experience to see how we can build up, once again, the skill sets we need in Jamaica to support our real sector. So um, I would say that day one certainly has been quite uh, a, a knowledge-based experience. I hope you've all enjoyed it. I hope you've all uh, come here um, with expectations that have been met. And the good news is that we do it again tomorrow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you didn't have enough uh, today, then you know, please make sure you're here tomorrow, because tomorrow uh, we have uh, further presentations. Um, another one, I believe, from JRC, Mr. Fitzwilliams. Um, he'll again be looking at um, the state of the nation 
with respect to railway in the country. But we also have um, more presentations from our Birmingham delegates. Um, Dr. Coombs will be back, and this time his topic will be around railway economics. And I know, I know a lot of you may be asking, well, if the minister is promising a new railway, how is he going to pay for it? So, um, Dr. Coombs, are you going to touch on, on the cost model in the cost of the... You'll see. <laughs> okay, and... <laughs> Absolutely. And, okay, and then we have uh, further presentations as well from Professor Clive um, Roberts on light rail. Dr. Marcelo will be back as well, looking at sustainability and decarbonization. Um, can we have a railway sector in Jamaica that uh, is green? Um, you know, with the bauxite, um, or bauxite railways run on, on diesel. Um, I'm not sure how the, the climate change activists will look on that in the years to come. So maybe we need to start looking at how we decarbonize our railways. And in the evening, in the afternoon, we will, it will, we will be having the participation of students from the University of Technology as they will be presenting posters related to rail. Um, O'Neill O'Neil, um, O'Neil Joseph from engineering has gotten the students to prepare posters looking at rail in Jamaica. So that will be, that will be presented tomorrow. And I, I think our friends from the built environs also have students who will be here as well. Um, Yes? So, uh, you know, come and support the students and hear what they, they, their view is on rail. Um, myself and O'Neill will also be talking about future research activities uh, at the university. So, in summary, there is a lot for you to look forward to tomorrow, and I hope that you will come and make the effort to be here. Um, the last thing to say is that on Saturday, so after you've had um, bun and cheese, I think, for Good Friday, um, on Saturday, will, there will be the baton, um, baton exchange or baton re relay on the university campus. Um, this is a Commonwealth Games baton relay. So there will be a, a one-hour window, I believe, from 12 um, p.m. So you're all welcome to, to be part of that. Um, I think it will be at UTEC and UWE. Well, I'll ask Paulton to speak to that tomorrow, give you more details. So thank you very much for coming, and have a... Very good evening. Thank you.